So welcome along, everybody, to Brands Hatch for the final weekend of racing organised by MSVR on the indie circuit here at Brands Hatch. Uh, if you're already here at the track, uh, you've already been listening to us. If you're just joining us on the live stream, welcome along to what will be the championship deciding weekend for some of those categories that are out on the circuit. Uh, we've already had plenty of qualifying this morning, but what we've got coming up for you now is going to be the Super Pole session for Turismo X over what is going to be a busy weekend of racing. Lots to get through over the course of this afternoon. And of course, we've got some, the highlight of the weekend, the Enduro KA, the IndyCar 500 as its badge taking place tomorrow, called the IndyCar 500 because it's Ford KAs on the Indy circuit. And it's a 500 minute race, eight hours and 20 minutes. So it's going to be a busy one. Chris Dawes joins me in the commentary box and uh, it's great to, uh, to, to draw the season to a close. You know, it's a shame we're getting to the end of the season, but I like this part time of year because we crown our champions. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. As uh, we were discussing earlier is the fact that I love that we get this mix of some championships that are just about to reach their crescendo. They're going to be crowned during the racing today, but we've got a couple of series and then of course we've got the absolutely incredible IndyCar 500 tomorrow, both uh, for the spectators that are going to be here and those that we're watching on the stream. And you're quite surprised. It's the first time that I'll have actually covered that one because I'm normally off doing uh, an awards due on this weekend. And I'm delighted to be here because we get that long endurance race, lots of drivers, fun cars. You know that because you've been in one. Uh, and, and into the dark as well. I mean, it's such an exciting race. There's, there's something about racing at night. Yeah. So I do like it. And thankfully, the you know, weather forecast today, broken clouds. There might be a little bit of rain later on here at Brands Hatch. But on the whole, fingers crossed, doesn't look too bad for this time of year. So, um, so yeah, a, a busy, busy uh, weekend that we've got coming up. Uh, you're talking about these, uh, these, these Ford KAs racing into the dark. Well, yeah, when we see them out on qualifying later on, their qualifying is going to start in the daylight and it's going to go through into the darkness as well. So um, it, that's going to be a busy session as well because um, some of the teams, some of the cars have got, what, five drivers, I think, in some of the cars to try and cycle through and get them all qualified. It's going to be tight. We have one that's got six. That's it, right. Yeah, yeah and, uh, whether that's still the case, because obviously we get uh, plenty of amendments and things like that. But uh, yeah, one with uh, with six of them. I must be honest and say I'm not surprised. What did we hear? One that might be racing with two to cover eight hours, 20 minutes. I was just tired at the idea of that one. So, <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, these cars sub subject to, uh, when, when we will talk about the Ks a bit more later on, but, you know, subject to how many laps you get behind a safety car, you'll easily get a couple of hours out of a tank around here. So, you know, a two-hour stint. It's not too bad, not too I'll bad. I'll be honest and say I was talking about me rather than the tank of fuel. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Turismo X uh, coming up shortly. They'll be heading out for their Super Pole session. They've already had a qualifying session earlier on, Chris, mm. and uh, smaller entry for this weekend. And usually what happens is that if you're not inside the top 10, you don't get through to Super Pole. And so, you know, when we were at Silverstone earlier on in the year, and we had 15 to the 20 cars entered. There were 10 that missed out there or thereabouts. This weekend, smaller entry list, only 11 cars qualified. One had a mechanical issue, which means that all of those that are still circulating at the end, they all go through to Super Pole. But it's all well and good getting a quick lap in and qualifying. Come Super Pole, you only get one lap. You've got to set a good lap on the flying lap because that dictates whether you start on pole or you might be 10th. Exactly. We may have lost that, you know, fight to get through to it, but we have gained that shootout element is that they'll go out, they'll do a warm-up lap, and as soon as they start their flying lap, the next car will start their warm-up lap, and we'll just have this constant flow of there being, this is the car that's on the flying lap now. No interruptions to it. They're able to just go for it. Absolutely banzai. They're not going to get impeded whatsoever. Off they go. As soon as they finish, uh, a, a few moments behind, we'll then get the next one starting. Presumably, they're under strict instructions as well to make sure that when they're on their quote unquote slow down lap they're not really supposed to slow down they've got to get themselves out of the, off the circuit as quickly as they can uh, yeah the one thing they do need to do is um, is just make sure they don't compromise the next yeah. car that's out on a, on a flying lap and to be fair, despite temptation, despite temptation <laughs> and, and wanting to do so. No, they've all been really, really good at it. As I say, I've seen a, a couple of rounds uh, of this so far. I, I covered the round at Silverstone on the 24th of April where they opened things up. Uh, and uh, from there, they went to Anglesey. I was also at the Snetterton round, but didn't cover it. And then they've been to Alton Park, Donington. And here they are at Brands Hatch. And you can see there, uh, ready to head out into qualifying. 
at the end of the pit lane is the number one car. So that is the car in the hands of Adam Blair, who leads the championship. So um, it's one of a few, say, at Leon Super Copas that we've got in this field. Beautiful uh, cars, beautiful. Uh, they were always one of those cars. It's a bit like for me. It's a bit like the Renault Clio Cup car. You know, it was built specifically for mm. racing and was and was done properly by the manufacturer. And you know, the, the Seat Leon Super Copas for me, um, great, great cars. Love them to bits. Yeah, they. Uh, although you do hear stories of them about, about them being uh, rather temperamental as well. Highly strung. That's the word. They're yes, highly, highly strung. strung yeah. yeah, I mean the way these cars should be going out. So the the order should be that the man who was fastest in qualifying, I think, has gone to the front of the queue as he Darren goes. Yep. So that's the way that it looks as though they're heading out. So Darren goes is at the front of the queue at the wheel of the Audi. Second in the queue will be Adam Blair. Third in the queue is the Honda. So that's going to be Richard Clark's Finsport Honda that's third in the queue. Oh couldn't recall earlier on whether they would send them out in reverse order and sort of build to the crescendo almost with the slowest car out first but it looks as though it's the quickest one that's going out first yeah and i mean i guess there's a point that you've earned the right to get out there as soon as possible before anybody potentially dumped anything on the circuit so uh, whilst from uh, from yeah from our entertainment perspective it would be build to that crescendo but for here i think it's just get them out the, cl the first one you set the fastest time in the qualifying session you, you've earned the right to get out there and get your job done. Yeah, the, Darren goes at the wheel of that black and green Audi that's at the front of the queue at pit lane exit. It was the quickest in the qualifying session. He stopped the clock at 51.910 seconds in the qualifying session. But, of course, he'd have done two or three or four or five laps to build the tyre temperature to then mm. set that time. We are likely, Chris, to see slower times in Super Bowl than we did in qualifying, largely because they only get one lap to get some warmth into the tyres and the brakes and here at Brands Hatch on the Indy circuit that's a short one but has everybody played their cards in that qualifying session I agree with you from a, from a, the car and the tyres perspective but have they got something in reserve that they can just go that little bit quicker have they fooled their competitor to go oh that's alright I only need to do this and I'll be able to beat them and suddenly one of them goes out there and goes have it there's a little bit more there and and, and they can't, they can't reply to it they, anymore. They just want to go fast there all the time. They're racing yeah. drivers. They just want but to go fast. But he came in early, didn't he? The he top did. two he came did. into the yep. pits early and just sat there. So how much more could they have got out of the car? But you notice what Darren Goes did do was he came back out of the pit lane, mm. did one out lap, and then, and, and then did an in lap again, yeah. which makes me wonder, was that because he'd spent so long in the pit lane, the tyres had gone all the way back down to cold, and then he did the out lap, and then what became an in-lap instantly, didn't do a flying lap, just to see how much tyre temperature he could build in that lap and to see what grip levels he'd got. Yeah, good point. Clever thinking, if that's the case. Yeah, because we, we weren't expecting him to, were I didn't we? think he'd come back out because he'd done all of the hard work earlier on. He was ultimately uh, 0.3 of a second quicker than Adam Blair in terms of qualifying. Uh, now, we do have different classes also in Turismo X as well. So the most powerful cars are in Class X. So that is based on those cars that have between 241 and 300 brake horsepower per ton so it's based on power to weight ratio in reality cars in class s have between 206 and 240 uh, brake horsepower per ton anything that's in class a will have between 176 and 205 brake horsepower per ton and if you are entered in class b and we do have one car in class b which is going to be the volkswagen golf down towards the tail end of the field not the number 46 golf but the number 127 golf which i don't think has made its way into the queue of cars as yet uh, that car is class b and class b is for up to 175 brake horsepower per ton so they're all waiting patiently i think we are very shortly about to get the green flag underway so chief pit marshal there stood rather bravely in the front of Darren Goh's car. But he will await confirmation from race control that the circuit is clear, and then we'll be ready to go with what is the final qualifying session for Turismo X. And as ever, smaller field of cars, but a good field of cars. Nice to see the Seat Leons pitched in with the, the more contemporary cars like this um, Audi TCR machine. Yeah, I mean, it's a beautiful car, isn't it? The Audi uh, RS3 TCR, and uh, Darren Goes has always done a fabulous job with the livery on it. That uh, metallic green complementing the uh, the jet black. And, yeah, you see the reflection of the cars coming by. It. Fabulous work there from the Alpha Live team to, to really sort of give you a feel of what's going on down in the pit lane there. Yeah, great to see the reflection, the highly reflective wrap on Darren Goes' <laughs> car. Uh, thumb up from the pit marshal. So Darren Goes now heads out onto his outlap ahead of Super Pole. Key for him here, Chris Dawes, is to build brake temperature 
build tyre temperature. You can see he's on and off the throttle. He's on and off the brakes to try and do what he can to get the car as warm as he can with as much tyre temp as he can prior to his flying lap that will be coming up next. Yeah, more to the point, as quickly as he can, because as you said, is they would probably take a couple of laps to get it into that sweet spot. He knows he's got no time. He's getting the, the brakes up to temperature. The warm brakes will also help to get temperature into those tyres. Although this is not what I was expecting. We're, we're sort of going uh, one after the other, so that's different to what I thought that we were going to be doing. Yeah, but. we're already getting a few more working their way out of the pit lane. I thought it'd be probably one on a slow down lap, one on a flying lap, one on an out lap at any one time, but it looks like we're just gapping them. So it'd be interesting to see how many they put out on a track at any one time, largely because as it is Super Pole and as it is a single flying lap, you can't afford to be compromised by any cars that are on their out lap. So Darren goes, is about to flash his way over the start finish line and is about to see what he might be able to do. So Darren goes, heads up towards Paddock Hill Bend. Gary Hufford is just about coming out of the pit lane, so he'll want to make sure he stays well and truly out of harm's way so he doesn't compromise the lap of Darren goes. And he does exactly the right thing, hooks the right-hand side of the circuit. Darren goes on his flying lap, heads up towards Druids. Yeah, the good news is it does appear that uh, on that straight heading back up towards the Druids hairpin is where they're able to get past the car just emerging from the pit lane. So Darren goes is on to the Cooper Street at the back there and he's going to try and uh, get a quick lap in as quickly as he can and, and he needs to because it's this one hit and then he's back into the pits again. Yeah absolutely so uh, Darren goes just threading his way up towards the conclusion of the lap so through Clearways corner now comes the Audi TCR car jumps on the throttle as quickly as he possibly can be careful that the car just doesn't wash out wide he seems to have enough grip and as he comes over the start finish line we're going to get the time coming up to see what he might be able to do Darren, Darren goes heads over the start finish line 51.767 from Darren goes that is slightly quicker than he managed in qualifying. Two tenths of a second quicker. Yeah, of course, he's now trying to make sure he stays out of the way of the Hufford BMW. Uh, but uh, what have we got of Blair? Where is he? He's into the pits. Yeah, it looks like Adam Blair has aborted his lap, the car that was second quickest in qualifying, and is headed in towards the pit lane. So not quite sure why he would have done that. So here comes Richard Clark over the start-finish line at the wheel of his Honda. What can he do? He goes 52.569, so second quickest for Richard Clark. And already we've got the next car coming over the start-finish line. Yeah, the number 14 car, uh, the Hazen Reed car, that jumps up into third place, 53.768. And across there, the car that they were having a great uh, uh, fun in the qualifying session earlier, Brichter jumps up into second place in the number two car. Big slide from George uh, George Wright at the wheel of the team I supply Volkswagen Golf. That was a bit of a scary moment there as he came through that part of the circuit. But for George Wright, he's only on his out lap at the moment, I think. I don't think he started the flying lap. He's about to do that now as he comes over the start finish line. So he'll try and crack on. So it's a new car to the team and the family. So up towards the braking area for Paddock Hill Ben goes George Wright and he will see as to what he might be able to do. But Darren goes at the moment it's looking as though he's done enough to secure pole position yeah it does because the the car that really would have put the pressure on him is, is in the pits wasn't able to do that uh, super pole lap and uh, it's a huge shame there just coming towards us is that the last one to put in a flying lap it's going to be isn't it the 144 car of Gak through he comes and, uh, and in fact, we, we missed somebody altogether, look, because we've only got nine of them out there. You did spot the one that was missing, actually, didn't you? Uh, the number 20, number 127 Volkswagen Golf. It That's wasn't in the right. queue at pit yeah. lane, was it? No. Now, that has been busy because it's been in another couple of qualifying sessions as well, hasn't it? The Track Day uh, Trophy and Championship as well. It is, yep. So uh, already uh, Super Pole done and dusted to say I thought they would send them out individually but they've uh, they put them all out together so there is uh, Al Ball at the wheel of the TSC Racing Lotus Elise Series 1 he qualified 7th quickest in the end with a 56.677 second lap but Darren Goes is the man who is going to start the first of two Turismo X races from pole position later on with a 51.767. Dylan Brichter, that second quickest. was a good quickest. time from him. It Brilliant was. time to only to be less than a quarter of a second behind Darren Goes, who's dominated so far today. Well, those are the two that are uh, lying second and third in the championship that are first and second mm. in this qualification session. So Dylan Brichter, 51.984. Richard Clark, third quickest with a 52.569. Gary Hufford, fourth quickest number 45 with the BMW with a 53.033 then it's the uh, uh, Hayes and Reed Sayat Leon Copa that's Jamie and Alex uh, at the time was a 
seven six eight. George Wright was sixth quickest with the Volkswagen Golf with a fifty four point six zero seven. Then it was the Lotus number thirty eight, as I mentioned, Al Bull with his time of a fifty six point six seven seven. Uh, eighth quickest was one four four. Lewis Gap with the Renault Clio fifty eight point five one zero. No time for Adam Blair. Quite why he came into the pit lane at the end of the outlap, I'm not entirely sure. So he will start ninth and tenth. Another car that didn't appear in that session and that'll be the Beaufort Racing, uh, Sean Andrews and Clive, Goldthorpe, Volkswagen, Golf. So that is it. I've got a compliment, your, Go on. your German accent when you say Volkswagen, Golf, by the way. Volkswagen, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Hey, you just... You don't hold back. Do no, 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 no. I pronounce it. I pronounce <laughs> it properly. Um, <laughs> so, See, so I, whereas I would say I'd pronounce it proper. <laughs> that, that's it. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Says the man from the southwest <laughs> with his strong Bristolian accent. Um, so, uh, so racing coming up very, very shortly. Uh, we've got uh, Darren Goes just trundling his way down the pit lane, much to the delight of the team. No doubt, always a well-turned-out car, isn't it, Darren Goes? So. He Whatever he's in, isn't it? It's always yeah. beautifully. And, and he's been a long-time supporter as well of, uh, of MSVR and MSVT, hasn't he? He's one of the one of the inaugural divers, I would have thought, that, that have been since the, the very beginning. Yeah, because I remember him in the uh, Seat Super Copa, uh, white with, with green flashes on his. Yeah, the, the, ori green, the original Mark One. Yeah. Yeah, uh, he is absolutely a, a, a key driver in this uh, in the different variants because he's out in another car in the I'm trying to remember now is it the uh, track day championship or the track day trophy he's out in championship is in the Clio yeah yeah so yeah. as you say a real real stalwart of the uh, MSVT track day championship trophy and of course this the Turismo X so that uh, takes care of the uh, Super Bowl for the Turismo X, and they will be out twice later, of course. It's two sprint races, even when they have two drivers in the car. It's one of those great situations where it's not pit stops, they're not driver changes, they are... One will do one race, one will do the other. We've only got one that's sharing, that's the uh, 14 car of Hayes and Reed. Uh, but they'll be out last race before the lunch break here. I should call it lunch break, 20 minutes, flash in the pan. But... Uh, They'll be out before that, and then about three races after that, uh, just before, well, the last race of today, before the enduro cars go out for their qualifying session, with that qualifying session designed to be half in daylight, half in uh, nighttime, or certainly through the dusk and into the night, and uh, give them a bit of practice in that one. But we're now ready to uh, to move on, Mark, to our first race of the weekend. Yeah, just waiting for the cars to uh, come out and join us on the grid. So the grid marshals are there and waiting the arrival of what is, in reality, two races for the price of one because it is two championships that are mixed together for this weekend. It's the, uh, to give it its full title, the AMC Vehicle Solutions United Formula Ford Championship in association with LMC Technologies. Well done. So that is, thank you, uh, <laughs> that is the, uh, uh, the, the national championship that's already visited the likes of Donington and Silverstone and Cadwell Park in Lincolnshire, Snetterton, and is having its final three race meetings here at Brands Hatch. Uh, but uh, those three Brands Hatch meetings are also a separate championship within the championship because they will decide who becomes the Ormento Coaching Champion of Brands for this year. And uh, so Mark Manley of Ormento Coaching, who is a member of the Brands Hatch Orange Army, has been a hugely supportive of, uh, of uh, the Champion of Brands since uh, 2020. And uh, he will be uh, uh, no doubt uh, hoping that uh, it builds to a, to a crescendo, the Champion of Brands and the United Formula 4 Championship. So the car's now heading onto the grid and they had a separate qualifying session earlier on this morning and the driver that i suggested all oh right okay we've had one that's already had a spin coming out of the which was the one that brought out the area, which brought out the red flag earlier because it was in the gravel right okay yep so that is james hadfield who uh, car is orange driver's cheeks might be slightly red uh, with the embarrassment having spun coming out but again <laughs> I totally understand how he did that. You know, trying to build some temperature into yeah. these, trying to get some tyre temperature in on, on, on a cold day like this, it's key. It can make the difference. We've seen that, haven't we? It's it's completely dry here today, but we have seen uh, that the temperature is clearly playing a part in everybody's adhesion levels. We've had a couple just go off into the gravel during the qualifying sessions, only just skitting off enough 
into the gravel that they can't get back out again, but not far enough to uh, allow us to carry on under green flag conditions. So uh, it is definitely challenging out there. And, and of course, they come out of there and he's just tried to boot it as they're still turning around a corner and it's just pirouetted that car around. The good news is Mark's got out of the system now. Absolutely, yeah. Get, get, get it done before you even get <laughs> onto the circuit. So uh, Marshall's just leaving the grid and then when they're on the formation lap will run you through the way that they will line up ahead of this first of two 20-minute races that we'll have today for the AMC Vehicle Solutions United Formula 4 Championship in association with LMC Technologies and, of course, the combined Ormento coaching champion of brands. There's the mouthfuls for you. Uh, so off they go on their formation lap and therefore let's guide you then through the grid and the way that they line up for this first Champion of Brands and United Formula Ford Championship race. It's Lucas Romanek who sits there on pole position with Alex Walker sitting alongside. And row two of the grid is Morgan Quinn and Jordan Kelly. Row three sees James Hadfield line up alongside Neil Tofts. And then onto row four and the fourth row of the grid. That's where we'll see Adam Fathers and Bob Hawkins. It's Nathan Down and John Barnes that sit there on row number five. Row number six is Sean Macklin, who was a late addition to the entry list alongside Chris Sharples in the oldest car in the field, the Palliser. And at the back of the grid on his own, it's going to be Simon Proust at the tail end of the field. So that's the way that they line up for our first Formula Ford Championship race. I call qualifying correctly, Chris, with Lucas Romanek heading towards the pole position. Who's your man for the win? Uh, I'm going to still stick with the man that I said originally, and that was uh, Mr. Quinn. I think that the 88 car, Morgan Quinn, he was up there sort of near, he had pole position for moments in that qualifying session, and it was snatched away from him rather well in the end. And uh, I still think that he's going to come good. He is desperate to tie up the United Formula 4 Championship, and I think this is the race where he's just going to go for it and get it done. You know what, I was nearly going to jump ship and go to Alex Walker, but I, I'm going to stick with that man there. I'm going to stick with the number, 30, uh, number 73 car of Lucas Romanek because uh, the final two rounds of the 2021 Champion of Brands, he was the winner. So he's already been a winner in this series in the past. So let's wait to see whether he can convert it. The thing is, it's not ideal pole position here at Brands Hatch because of the slant of the circuit. Very true. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And the key thing is, is that what are we talking about? Those top four in particular were incredibly close in yep. qualifying. And I think we're going to have an outstanding race. One thing to keep an eye out, number 99, Jordan Kelly, lost oof, four, three or four laps in qualifying for track limits. Now, that was okay. He just lost those laps where he exceeded track limits can't do it in the race because the punishment as you said earlier becomes more draconian it, it gets bigger and bigger for him so he, he's going to need to make sure that he keeps it uh, between the white lines this time so lucas romanet the black car with a subtle white flash down the nose on pole position the all black car of alex walker alongside row two of the grid is morgan quinn he's got sort of a white and a red flash down his side whereas alongside him jordan kelly has the larger whiter flash down the side now alex walker just slightly forward of the starting point from where he ought to have been but we're about to get our racing underway the green flag's just been waved at the tail end of the field. The red lights will come on on the gantry and 20 minutes of racing are about to have get go here at Brands Hatch. And it's not a bad start from pole position from Lucas Romanek, who just about manages to hang on to the lead. Alex Walker already under pressure from the car that's weaving around behind him, the fast starting Jordan Kelly. But it's Lucas Romanek that leads as they head through Paddock Hill Bend for the first time, descending down the hill before they start to climb up towards a breaking area for Druids. So two black cards out front. Alex uh, Walker sitting behind the pole sitter, Lucas Romanek, who's converted pole to the early race lead. Yeah, not only that, as he's got himself Formula Ford standards, a little bit of a gap there as well. He's trying desperately to make hay while, well, there's no sunshine in here, but you know what I mean. He's trying desperately to pull away from Walker. That 41 car was incredibly quick, came into the pitch quite early from memory in the uh, qualifying session, and he's actually managing to reel back in. But James Hadfield in that fifth place in the orange car, he's staying with them as well, isn't he? Uh, yeah, he is. He's sticking with them at this stage. So over the start, finish line, they'll come. Lap number one about to be completed. We're side by side further down through the order by the look of things as Adam Fathers draws himself, uh, tries to draw himself alongside 
the car of Neil Tofts, I think that is. But uh, it is Lucas Romanek that leads the way by four tenths of a second and is locking the brakes this time, heading in towards the braking area for Druids. Needs to be careful that he doesn't run wide on the exit, otherwise that might cost him. But it's still Lucas Romanek from Alex Walker, first and second at this stage. Ronan Quinn there in, sorry, Morgan Quinn sitting there in third position. And fourth place, he's dropped a long, long way back now, Jordan Kelly. And the reason he's dropped back, Chris, is because he ran wide coming out of Paddock Hill Bend. Oh, OK, which is, uh, as we were saying earlier, what he desperately doesn't want to do. And it has allowed that front three to pull away at the front of the field now. And I say three because we thought that Romanek and Walker, 73 and 41, the pair of black cars at the front, were the ones that were gapping everyone else. But Morgan Quinn, now he no longer needs to look in his mirrors, as useful as Formula Ford mirrors are, of course. Uh, he's been able to just look forward and he's got himself glued onto the pair, not in striking distance. There's more of a gap than he'd like, but his focus on those front two, and now those front two are going to start to have a fight, and that's going to slow him up even more. Yeah, Lucas Romanek was a little bit slower through Paddock Hill, Ben. There was a very slight amount of turning over steer on his car that you could just see had to correct mid-corner, and that was all it took to just allow Alex Walter to close up by another, what, quarter of a car length. So they're all slipstreaming off each other at the moment. Jordan Kelly in fourth place is looking slightly more secure now because he's pulled away from the orange car of James Hadfield that he had dropped into the clutches off. But the leading trio about to head over the start-finish line now. Alex Walker will pick up the toe from the race leader. He's going to sit on the gearbox of Lucas Romanek. Is he going to be close enough this time, though, to try anything on the run towards Paddock Hill Ben? They are pretty much together. He looks for the inside line. Lucas Romanek leaves the door open. Up the inside goes Alex Walker, but then he runs wide coming out of the corner, and that allows Rupus, R Lucas Romanek back up the inside as they head in towards a braking area for Druids. Wow, it's just uh, you could see that one coming, couldn't you? But he just couldn't get it slowed up enough. To use the phrase that I love to use, is he looked like a dog trying to change direction on a wet kitchen floor as he got to Paddock Hill Bend and he just kept it on the tarmac but he couldn't stop the old switcheroo from Romanek diving back up the inside and look at the fact that those two fighting like a pair of prize fighters means that you've now got well and truly Quinn number 88 the championship leader in the United Formula Ford chomping at the bit and close enough now Mark I would say to start showing his own nose yeah he's going to get the toe from Alex Walker in second place you could argue he'll get the double toe because he might get a bit of a toe off Lucas Romanek they're not quite Quite as close though this time, so the order will remain the same as they head up in towards the braking area for Paddock Hill Bend. So it's still Lucas Romanek from Alex Walker from Morgan Quinn, one, two, and three. If they start to squabble, don't rule out the fact that the car that's there in fourth place could begin to close in, which is Jordan Kelly, who still hasn't really managed to get the orange machine of James Hadfield that sits behind. But the leading trio down in towards Graham Hill Bend, they're on lap number five. Oh, it's just literally three of them equidistant from each other as they go along the Cooper Strait behind our commentary box here at Brands Hatch. Left at Surtees, then suddenly changed direction for the right-hander of McLaren's, and then it just keeps sweeping right and right and right all the way till they get to the start finish straight nobody is at the moment looking to make a move the problem is the filling in the sandwich Alex Walker he needs to defend as much as he wants to make a challenge on Lucas Romanek so I think that uh, at the moment Romanek's probably the one that's in the grandstand position because he knows that the person challenging him he's going to have one eye on his mirrors. Uh, and for Lucas Romanek, he's not worried about what's going on behind him at the moment because he's just set the fastest lap of the race, the race leader, 50.693 seconds, 50.693. That's a tenth of a second quicker than he managed when he set the pole position time earlier on over the course of the day. Good fight further down through the order going on. That's for Nathan Down, car number 96 under pressure from Jonathan Barnes at the wheel of the Van Diemen RF90. Van Diemen RF90 was a, was a big old departure, really, from what the previous Van Diemen's uh, had looked like. So the number 24 car, a total redesign it was for the 1990 championship season. It was a very successful car in period. Across the line they come to complete their sixth lap, and it's still the same order. Romanek from Walker from Quinn, the 73, 41, 88 in that order, and literally as quick as that as they flash across the line. Big gap, and then it's a great fight as well for uh, fourth and fifth. 99 Kelly keeping the bright orange 129 car of Hadfield. The tyres screeching as they go through the uh, hairpin up there at Druid. Same order at the moment, and you've got to still say it's looking more like the fight's coming from the third place more than Quinn at the moment. Lucas Romanek missed the apex at Graham Hill Bend there and was nowhere near the apex really, so that's dropped him back into the clutches of 
Alex Walker, Lucas Romanek said another new fastest lap of the race last time through with a 50.584 second lap, but there was a slight chink in the armour there. Alex Walker will have picked up on it. He'll have seen that the car did not get anywhere near the apex at the left hander at Graham Hill Bend, but Alex Walker has had a poorer end to the lap, and if anything, he's further away from Lucas Romanek, and if anything, coming under pressure for that second position, but uh, Morgan Quinn just opts to sit behind him at the moment. He's got a championship to think about. There are 13 and a half minutes remaining. They're on lap number eight. It's that proverbial piece of elastic between them, isn't it, at the moment, is that one minute we're talking about the fight between the lead pair, and then it's the second and third that are duking it out, so really tight. And, and I pick up your point, Mark, actually, is that it, it really is for Morgan Quinn. Does he want to show his nose unnecessarily yeah. when he wants to keep the clock ticking over in terms of championship points, doesn't he? Absolutely. When there's only sort of five points if you win your class, four if you're second, three if you're third, two and one if you're fourth and fifth. Uh, however, if you're the overall race winner, you also pick up an extra two points because you're the overall winner. Well, at the moment, really doesn't worry, I wouldn't have thought, Morgan Quinn, that he's sitting there in third place because Lucas Romanek, you could argue, is his next nearest title charger and he is... Uh, going to potentially pick up the win and the extra two points but he is sitting eight points behind him in the championship so it's not going to do him too much harm car that's just dropped down through the order james hadfield the 129 orange car just went very wide uh, between uh, clearways and clark curve dragged it out of the gravel so he's still going but he drops down to eighth position as the 129 and yet he had been sat there putting huge pressure on the 99 car of kelly leading three so there up towards druids goes that orange car that you were talking about james hadfield so having dropped his way himself way, way down through the order, back to the lead trio, just coming out of Clearways and Clark Curve. Order still remains the same. Lucas Romanek uh, still set the fastest lap of the race last time through, 50.495. And that was on the lap where he didn't really get the apex at Graham Hill Bend. So he's clearly very comfortable with the car that sits underneath him. Uh, however, that time through, it's the man that's at the tail end of the trio that now sets the fastest lap. Morgan Quinn with a 50.460. There's no separating these top three drivers. There wasn't in qualifying either, Chris. All three of them were separated by about a quarter of a second in qualifying. The bad news, though, 10-second time penalty for the 41 car of Alex Walker. Out of position start. We saw it, didn't we? And I think he may have just tried to go into gear and the car jumped forward because I watch it do it and his front wheels are in front of the white line. So that's now a 10 second penalty. That puts that second place car well down this order in Formula Ford racing. That's a big penalty. And now he's going for the lead of the race as he sneaks up the inside of Lucas Romanek heading in towards Clearways and Clark Curve. The door is open as Lucas Romanek then runs a little bit wide coming out of the corner. Morgan Quinn is trying to sneak his nose up the inside but I think Lucas Romanek is just about going to defend from him on the running towards Paddock Hill Bend. Morgan Quinn switches back the other way to try and sneak up the inside but Lucas Romanek is wise so that sweeps across the nose of Morgan Quinn. So it's Alex Walker, Lucas Romanek and Morgan Quinn first, second and third as they head up towards Druids on lap number 11. Yeah, I mean, I wonder. That almost looked like uh, that was a given pass, and I wonder whether Romanek knows that, well, if Alex Walker's got that penalty, I don't need to keep defending and fighting with him, and he's kind of let him go. What he doesn't want, of course, is that Walker car to disappear down the scenery too much and make up that 10 seconds, which I think would be asking some in Formula Fords, to be fair. They're, they're just used to racing close together, and he is coming back at him, but Morgan Quinn was certainly tempted to show his nose, contrary to what we suspected, but he's not taking undue risks, is he? No, no, I think once, once he started to get squeezed very slightly by Lucas Romanek, then Morgan Quinn back down to it. Here comes Lucas Romanek looking to try and retake the lead again from Alex Walker, taking the high, wide and handsome line in towards Paddock Hill Bend, but no, can't quite do it there. He's also then needing to try and close the door again on Morgan Quinn, who was thinking about trying to sneak his way through into second place. But the order remains the same. They still are together, but however, they are now coming up against some traffic for the first time, the back markers. Yeah, Simon Proust, the number 13 car on the Cooper straight in front of them, which means they're not going to get him on the start-finish straight. It's going to be through this complex, starting with Surtees. No, no, actually, they might be lucky in it not being until the start-finish straight, and all three of them be able to scoot past without too much of an issue as they make their way through clearways towards Clark Curve. And again, Lucas Romanek, he definitely wasn't a let pass because he's trying his best to get himself back onto the outright race lead, despite the fact that he is the pseudo-leader anyway. 
So over the start finish line, Simon Proust doesn't want to get involved in this squabble. A man who has been hugely supportive of uh, Champion of Brands since its reintroduction by James Beckett Motorsport some years ago stays well and truly out of the way at the way of his uh, wheel of his Reynard. So the top three go through. Van Diemen first, second, and third at the moment. Alex Walker clinging on to the race lead despite the best efforts and attentions of Lucas Romanek. And into the pit lane, I'm afraid to say, comes James Hadfield, the car that had qualified fifth quickest. So that's our first retiree. The man that had the spin is out of the race. Yeah, I mean, we got the impression from qualifying that car is not performing quite how we would want it to be. Something's not quite right on the handling there. So he brings it in. He was, he was fifth and then he was down in eighth after that moment, but uh, sadly out of the race. As the leaders come towards us to complete what will be their 13th lap with just under nine minutes still left on the clock. Oh, and very defensive from Walker there, trying to make sure that there was no inside line for Lucas Romanek to dive up the inside of. Uh, almost a double move there to some extent, but Walker, even though he knows he's got that 10 second penalty, I guess, Mark, he's just gone, well, fine. Do you know what? I'm still going to enjoy my race out here, even if after the penalty, I end up further back. Uh, yes, uh, you would like to think to be aware of the penalty because it was displayed both over the um, start finish line and by the digital board that's uh, hanging on a gantry over the start finish line as well. So you'd like to think that he would know and he's just going to keep pressing on and see what he might be able to do in this one but Lucas Romanek will be keen just to sit with him and hang on to that second place which on corrected times would of course become the race win as for Morgan Quinn of course he's got the AMC Vehicle Solutions United Formula Ford Championship in association with LMC Technologies to think about and he's just sitting there I think biding his time in third place he's dropped away from the leading pair he just doesn't want to get involved in too much of a squabble, does he? I mean, he's got a grandstand seat of a fabulous fight in front of him, but also he's seen that that's getting close there. I mean, again, look at the defence there from Alex Walker. He's very, very good, very, very strong. And he's there sort of going, do you know what? There could be some pieces to pick up here if we're not careful. The problem is, if he's too close to them and they tangle, he could get involved. There's more traffic as well just up the road that they'll need to deal with. And that will include the Christopher Sharples Palliser that they'll need to try and work their way through and pass. They'll ca catch up with that car. I would imagine just at the end of this lap or maybe the start of the next. They are currently on lap number 15 as they work their way through the right-hander. So from clearways on towards Clark Curve, Morgan Quinn doing all of the hard work to try and hang on to the lead of the race. Lucas Romanek gets a really good run on him this time as they come over the start-finish line. Is he going to jink out to try and work his way on the outside line? No. He's going to stick right in the wheel tracks of Alex Walker. And for the moment, then, the top three remain exactly the same. And just up the road, as I say, is the traffic now that they need to deal with. Incredible, isn't it? And let's not remember, Chris Sharples in that uh, red 77 car. Beautiful classic car, that one. And that one is uh, edging itself towards securing the Augmento coaching champion of brands, isn't it, of course? Uh, looking very good at the top there. Of course, he's in historic class, so he's going great guns in that particular class. The leaders get past one of the two. Sharples just backed out and let them go. Another one, Mark, you said it, uh, you used the phrase earlier about not getting involved. There's no need. Let these three get through and carry on their fight. Yeah, absolutely. And what a fight it is as well. So, again, good work by the marshals to show the back markers the blue flags. Equally, good work by the back markers to get out of harm's way and not erode what has been a brilliant battle for the lead of the race, which, again, is side by side heading up towards Paddock Hill Bend. Alex Walker again with the inside line, high, wide uh, and handsome for Lucas Romanek as he turns his way through Paddock Hill Bend, hanging on to second place, but all of the time still under pressure from Morgan Quinn, who sits there in third position. Almost side by side coming out of Druids this time. Alex Walker's got the inside line for Graham Hill Bend. They could have interlocked wheels there, but again, Lucas Romanek just realising he was being squeezed, got out of the move. The order still remains the same. It really does. So, so close. And you normally find with Formula Fords as well, they're kind of almost posturing to get themselves into a position for the, uh, the closing stages, but they're not. They're having a, an absolute ding-dong battle between certainly the front two with uh, Morgan Quinn. We're saying he's not prepared to take undue risk, but he's not backing out completely. I still wonder whether he's going to feel there is an opportunity, but Lucas Romanek down towards Paddock Hill Bend. He did have a sniff of the inside there, didn't he, at last? He, normally that door has been closed, but Alex Walker just teased him a little bit there, didn't he? Left it open enough. Romanik looked towards it. It disappeared, and he's tried to carry that speed down the hill back up towards Druids. And again, that just wasn't on for him, is it? What great defensive driving by Alex Walker. There's some great combinations in life, and whether it be fish and chips or roast beef and Yorkshire puddings, but Formula Fords and Brands Hatch oh, are absolutely... absolutely a, 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 a 
a combination made in heaven, aren't they? I've never seen a bad Formula Ford race around this uh, Indy circuit in particular. Slight mistake there from Alex Walker was into the braking area for Clearway's corner, but I think he gathered it up and it didn't really cost him a great deal of time in the end, but he still finds himself under this pressure from Lucas Romanek with four and a half minutes to go and 18 laps about to be completed. Over the start finish line now come. Lucas Romanek takes the wide line again going in towards Paddock Hill Bend. He'll try and cut back on the exit and try and get a better run coming off the corner, but Alex Walker is wise to that. There'll be more traffic just up the road that they'll need to deal with before too much longer. And the next traffic that they're going to meet is going to be the Van Diemen RF90, the number 24 car of John Barnes. Yeah, which the good news is, is uh, it's, if they're not closing in on that excessively quick, are they? What are we left at? Just under four and a quarter minutes left to go in this fantastic fight. The good news is, Mark, we'll get another one later because we're, we're certainly enjoying this. Uh, Adam Father's having a great fight across the line there. Sorry, I just saw it out the back of my eyes that he's there with Toff's uh, Hawkins uh, across the line a bit further down the field. But our leaders are now going to come on to start, finish straight to complete their 19th lap. And they're still not quite going to get past the back mark of the 24 of uh, Jonathan Barnes by the time they get to the end of the straight. But that the black car with the white flashes tells us that that's Lucas Romanek, 73, still sat there in second place, constantly showing his nose. Sometimes, Mark, I think that it's as much to see if he can force a mistake out of Alex Walker as it is to try and actually make a move. Uh, the good thing is I, I like the way he's driving because he's trying different things all of the time. Mm. He's not trying the same move every single time. And that's important. Oh, all of a sudden, just loses the rear wheel, does Adam Fathers, heading in towards Clearway's corner. For no obvious reason, there was just a pop, and all of a sudden, off came the rear wheel. So um, not sure whether there was any contact earlier on in the race, but certainly from what we were looking at there, there was no obvious sign as to why left rear wheel should part company with car. Uh, so yellow flags at that part of the circuit, often into the gravel has gone Adam Fathers. Uh, I think the car might have made contact with the barriers lightly as well at the front end, so front and rear damage to sort out on that for race two a little bit later on, but with less than three minutes to go through Paddock Hill Bend for the 21st time goes Alex Walker still continuing to lead the way, still under pressure from Lucas Romanek who weaves around continually in his mirrors to try and put him off and still with some more traffic to deal with they'll be coming up to lap Simon Pruce's Reynard for the second time shortly. They are and I have to compliment the uh, the back markers that behaved so well today, uh, keeping this fight going it is very much a three car fight, they're about to get towards the yellow flag zone, the good news Mark is that it was, as you said, it's only a light touch of the barrier but it stayed by the barrier therefore so it's far enough away that I can't see that we're going to need to interrupt this one uh, and uh, they're just about to get past this black marker now are they they're all trying to do it on the bend so we've suddenly got uh, Alex Walker is going to go around the outside of the back marker job done but he's got Romanek right in his wheel tracks and suddenly Quinn is getting involved he's alongside Romanek he turned from the uh, the aggressor to the defender then, and somehow they come out of that in the same order, Mark. Yeah, still in the same <laughs> order. Amazing stuff between them all. Quite how, uh, I'm not entirely sure at this stage. So uh, the trio work their way through Druids and head back downhill towards Graham Hill Bend. Still Alex Walker from Lucas Romanek and Morgan Quinn. And of course, they're now heading down the Cooper Strait and into that localised yellow flag zone as a result of the off that Adam Fathers had when he had the left rear wheel parked company with him a lap or so ago. So through that part of the circuit and then they'll start to build the speed again as they head over the start finish line. Now they'll be heading on to their penultimate lap of the race this time through. So. There's not much more opportunity for Lucas Romanek to try and take the opportunity to take the lead of the race. Now, he's having another go this time as they head up towards Paddock Hill Bend, but again, it's that wide line on the way in to try and cut back on the exit of the corner. And Alex Walker, I think, is wise to that. He just makes sure that he gets a good run coming off the corner, and it makes it almost impossible for Lucas Romanek to squeeze his way through. Yeah, I mean, Mark uh, Tucker said on the chat for this video that he didn't think that... Uh, uh, that Romanek knew that there was a penalty for Alex Walker and I have to say I agree because he is fighting so hard that it's as though he has no idea that uh, the car in front of him actually isn't in front of him after the penalty is going to be applied. Yep, so they'll be heading on to their final lap of the race this time through. So Lucas Romanek is running out of time. He's running out of opportunities to try and steal the lead of the race away from Alex Walker. But he may be content to sit there because, remember, Alex Walker has got a 10-second penalty to be applied post-race because he was out of position at the start. So over the start-finish line, there will go. Lucas Romanek tries to sneak up the inside. The car gets unsettled by the bump at the exit of pit lane. And now that's left the door open for Morgan Quinn to try and sneak his way through. And Morgan Quinn is not quite going to make it as they head up towards Druid. So Lucas Romanek still hangs on to second place, which on corrected times would give him the win at this stage. So down towards Graham Hill Bend 
for the final time. Alex Walker has driven beautifully well. The only mistake he made was not quite lining up on the grid slots before the lights went out. But other than that, he has driven faultlessly to apply the pressure, to pick up the lead, and then to hang on to the lead for a good period of time. So out of clearways for the final time. They will then start to work their way towards the chequered flag, which is being readied. And in this first of two races for the AMC Vehicle Solutions race, it is just going to be on the run to the line. Um, Morgan Quinn uh, that uh, is, sorry, Lucas Romanek that just misses out on the win uh, on normal time, but on corrected times, of course, when you add that 10 second penalty to Alex Walker, Lucas Romanek will pick up the win. So number 73, Lucas Romanek, the winner. Second was uh, Morgan Quinn and third will be Alex Walker. So he dropped to third because he was more than 10 seconds ahead of the fourth place car in the end, which was going to be the car of Jordan Kelly that comes through to finish in fourth place. Neil Toffs was there in fifth, then it's going to be the car of Nathan Down in sixth place. Seventh is going to be Bob Hawkins through to take the chequered flag. Jonathan Barnes wins his class in eighth position, so he'll pick up five points for the class win. And ahead of what will be in ninth place, the number 27 car of Sean Macklin. Uh, and also, we will see that there's another class win for Christopher Sharples at the wheel of the Palliser. So that keeps up his efforts to try and be crowned the Ormento Coaching Champion of Brands for 2022. So the cars make their way in towards the pit lane and should be able to confirm the results with you very shortly for the first of our two races for the United Formula Ford Championship featuring the champion of brands. So then just to confirm the results for you on corrected times, Lucas Romanek takes the win by four tenths of a second from Morgan Quinn with Alex Walker dropping to third despite winning on the road. Uh, fourth place goes the way of Jordan Kelly. Fifth place was Neil Thompson. In sixth place, it was Bob Hawkins. Seventh place went the way of Nathan Down. In eighth place, it was a class win in the heritage class for Jonathan Barnes, head of Sean Macklin and completing the top 10, winning the historic class was Christopher Sharple. Simon Pruce was there in seventh position as the last of the finishers. Adam Father's off and into the gravel, I'm afraid. He was a retiree. And James Hadfield into the pit lane with problems. So that wraps things up for the first of our races. The cars and the drivers are making their way down in towards the pit lane, which is where Chris Dawes has now positioned himself. So we should very shortly be able to hear from some of the drivers down there in the pit lane. And of course, they will be counting up in their head and totting up the championship points as we head to what will be their final championship round taking place a little bit later on today. So let's go down to the pit lane and Chris Dawes. Yeah, welcome down to the pit lane and uh, hopefully, Mr. Walker knows that the penalty was there and we're just letting them congratulate each other. He's still at the front there, but uh, we'll go first of all to the 73 car, Lucas Romanek with that victory. Lucas, give a turn us around here. Congratulations, what a fantastic win. I know it was a penalty, the car in front of you, but what a race. Yeah, it was a good race to be fair. Um, uh, Alex got by uh, through the last corner, but we knew we had to, the pace to sort of hold on to him. And when I saw the penalty come up, I just knew that there was no point massively fighting it. Um, obviously, yeah, his first time back for a long time, so it's good to race him again. I'm interested that you say that uh, you, you saw the penalty and you thought it wasn't worth massively fighting him because we were saying, I don't think he's seen because you were massively fighting. It was brilliant entertainment. Yeah, you had to get like, I had to try and go for the win on the track, but it is such a short short track and it's quite not easy to defend but um, definitely can be in your favor if you're in front of the guy who's trying to attack and you really were trying a bit of everything we were watching you trying different lines showing your nose at different parts sometimes just showing your nose to try and psych him out I think all by the kitchen sink got thrown at him didn't it yeah definitely um, so, like, especially into some of the harder corners to overtake um, but yeah he was just a bit a bit too good on defending this this time <laughs> Well, you still got the win, though. Well done. Thank you very much. So that's Lucas with the win. Where we go? Where's Morgan Quinn? Oh. No, sorry. Where's he gone? We got uh, Mr. Quinn. There he is. I mean, we were trying to work out there is that you were so tempted to get involved, but it felt like there was a championship on your mind. Yeah, that's exactly it. I was holding station just to see if anything would happen, just to keep pace with them, see if there was a gap there. There was a little gap on the last lap going to the drills, but just not big enough. But no, just holding station most of it. And the interesting one, holding station most of it, but the racer in you couldn't resist getting involved from time to time. No, no I, had to, I had to give it a go. There's a gap there I had to go for. 
Did you know that there was a penalty for Alex? I, I gathered there was because I seen him jump the start. So I just said, he's going to get a penalty some sort. I'll just the whole, the whole station to see what happens. You just can't stop enjoying yourself though. <laughs> well done, a great performance. Uh, based on that, where's Alex gone? Let me just jump through here. Alex? Uh, yeah, don't worry, you're all right. A, a bittersweet there. I mean, what a, an incredible performance. I know that sadly you got the penalty. We'll come to that in a minute. But y you still got massively involved in that and had a wonderful time. Yeah, no, it was a really fun race, especially, obviously, my clutch went at the start. Ah. So it was, a, I mean, I was out of position, so it was a deserved penalty. Um, but no, I'm happy to get it on the road. And I haven't raced in a few months, so it was really fun to get back into a proper scrap. And yeah, it was fun. <laughs> he threw everything at you and you threw everything back. I mean, it was wonderful to watch. Are you going to be uh, able to get that sorted for race two? Hopefully, yeah, hopefully it's going to go back now and I don't know what's wrong with it, but hopefully it gets sorted. Uh, I don't know where I'll start for a race two if it's based off quality or this race, but wherever it is, I'm hoping to have a similar race and have some good fun again. Well, well done, congratulations. So that's it from down here. Throwing back to Mark now because the next race is ready to go. It's the MSVT Track Day Championship. So yeah, already the cars are on the grid for the MSVT Track Day Championship. Their final championship round with the championship mathematically still up for grabs as well. The man that leads the championship is going to start from the second row of the grid, the blue BMW with the Dayglow uh, Tyler Motorsport livery down the side of it, uh, which is John Line. He comes into this weekend 194 championship points, but you drop your worst round in this championship. So uh, he will be dropping uh, 26 points when he finished in third place at Donington Park in the previous round. So uh, the net score would be 168 points for John Line, but that still gives him uh, quite a handy 25 point margin over his nearest rivals. His nearest rivals being the number 53 Renault Clio of Kevin Sterling, who had a, a rather off qualifying and only qualified 11th quickest Kevin, who's been in the top six in all bar one race so far this season. Uh, Kevin is on 161 points gross, but he'll drop 18 from his uh, race at Anglesey, so he drops a 143 on a net scoring. And third in the championship, uh, on gross scores at least, but moves up to second once you drop off the worst score, would be Jordan Honeybone at the wheel of number 44 Apple Car Centre Renault Clio. And the reason that he moves up to second when you take net scores into account is because the uh, Honeybone pairing Ray and Jordan, who've both driven the car throughout the course of this weekend, uh, non-scored at Anglesu, so they drop a zero in reality. So their car, which starts on the what first, second, third, fourth row of the grid, will be one to watch out for as well. So the cars are going to be heading onto their formation lap very, very shortly. Uh, we have the grid. What we don't have is which driver is starting, unfortunately. We've not been notified as to whom the starting drivers are for this one. So they'll head off on their formation lap and we'll quickly try and guide you through the grid because there's a lot to get through uh, this time through. So off they go on their final formation lap, the way that the grid lines up then for the final round of the 2022 MSVT Track Day Championship is that the Tony Gilliam and Alex Jones Volkswagen Gold sits on pole position with Adrian Pottinger alongside. Row two is Justin Roberts and Stefan March sharing the Honda Civic alongside the championship leader John Line. And row three is Freddie Hewitt who lines up alongside the Ford Puma of Harry Hardy. Onto row number four and the fourth row of the grid, Charlie Polk has got Jordan Honeybone for company and it's Mark Russell that has got uh, Jack Wheeler and Nick Watling's Ford Fiesta alongside. Kevin Sterling and Ronan Quinn sit there on row number six. Onto the seventh row of the grid, it's Chris Dumpster and Jack Kemp followed by Will Arif. Darren Goes and Ollie Owen and then it's Rob Burnham and Mick Presland. As we move on to row number 10, apologies for a few little errors in the graphics. Dean Kirby is there alongside the Barney Lower and Mike D'Arcy car. Then it's uh, Reese Warwick and George Jackson, Alistair Eason and Darren Robinson. And then as we work our way down through the rest of the order, it's the Horny Golds, Rob and Ashley, Ian Bonser, Les Conway, James Owen, and then it's Mike Sullivan and Will Toger's car that sit there at the tail end of the field. So that's the order that they are in for this final race of the championship season. It's John Lyne's championship really to lose. The way the maths work is that it's 30 points if you win, 27 for second, 24 for third, 22, 20, 18, and so it diminishes. That's regardless of class. Extra point awarded for every competitor you beat in your class up to a maximum of five points. There's an extra point for pole position in each class and there's also an extra point for fastest lap as well so there's lots of maths to try and work our way through but 
It would need all of the stars alike to align, really, for John Lyne not to win this championship. We'll have to wait and see. So it's Volkswagen Golf, the Tony Gilliam and Alex Jones car that sits there on pole position. Adrian Pottinger sitting alongside. These two cars were separated by nine tenths of a second in terms of qualifying pace. So the last formation lap of the season has been done. They've built as much temperature as they can into their tyres, the control proxis tyres that all of these cars have to run in this championship. So it's uh, Volkswagen and a Renault on row number one. It's a Honda and a BMW on row number two. And just to give you the kind of variety we get in the track day championship, it's a Mini and a Ford Puma that sit there on row number three. It's an all Renault row number four, a Renault and a Ford on row number five, a Renault and a Ford on row number six, an all Renault number seven and number eight, I think, as well. So it seems as though Clio is by far the most populous choice, but we've still got a brilliant selection of cars with the BMWs and Mazdas and MGs and even Ginettas down towards the tail end of what was a 30-car field in qualifying this morning. So the last row of the grid is just coming into position now. Green flag waves. This is a 45-minute race with a pit stop window. Slap bang in the middle where everybody has to come in and change drivers for a minimum of two minutes in the pits. Red lights come on. Red lights start to go out now. And it is a slow getaway from Adrian Pottinger from the outside of the front row of the grid. The rear-wheel drive BMW, not unsurprisingly, has a brilliant start. But there's contact further back. Kevin Sterling gets turned around, I'm afraid, on the run up towards Paddock Hill Bend. And he's not the only one that's got involved as well because Mark Russell is sideways in the circuit. Looks as though Ollie Owen has also got tangled up but it was really Mark Russell that got tangled up and got pushed into the side of Kevin Serling and both of those cars are stricken I'm afraid in the middle of the track at this stage the race is continuing but I suspect we're going to have to go safety car almost immediately just to try and bring this race to a controlled status. Yes, we are. So safety car is already out. I think a few of the drivers may be a little bit later at reacting to the safety car boards than others because largely they were unsighted. But it was a brilliant start from John Line. When the lights went out, you were always going to expect that rear-wheel drive BMW to get a brilliant start. And absolutely, he did. Nailed the start and has leapt himself to the front of the queue at this stage. So we've got a little bit of clearing up to do on the start-finish line as a result of Mark Russell's car being sideways in the circuit and Kevin Sterling's car also having been clattered into as well. And it was all sort of... It wasn't a chain reaction, but it was some cars that got a better start than others. And as a result of that, we ended up going four wide at some point. And when you get to three wide and a fourth car tries to join in, it's always going to be a little bit tight, and particularly as the barriers get closer to the circuit at the point of the impact. So drivers are conscious. They don't want to hit the barrier. You move a bit towards your, your left. And I think as they did that, the no that subsequently meant that more than one car was after the same piece of tarmac. And that was what caused the incident. So with the incident being where it is, sensible decision taken by the race officials so as to not to bring the cars around on the safety car on the track. They are bringing them through the pit lane. So safety car... Uh, bringing all of the competitors through the pit lane. The clearing up of the two stricken Renault Clio is still continuing. Of course, while all of this goes on, the clock will still continue to count as well. So it gives me a bit more of a chance to tell you a little bit about the way the class structure works in the MSVT Track Day Championship and how the pit stops will work as well. So again, in the class structure is based on power to weight ratio so the most powerful cars are in class b we don't have a class a nowadays so class b is anything that's between 151 and 175 brake horsepower per ton and all of this is checked by total track limited who run the mini championship and measure the power on their rolling road it's measured at the hubs it's not measured at the flywheel it's measured at the hub uh, so that's class b class c is for those with between 126 and 150 brake horsepower per ton class d is up to 125 horsepower per ton and we do have some cars that run in Class G, which includes the pole-sitting Volkswagen Golf of Tony Gillam and Alex Jones, and also includes the Stefan March and Justin Roberts Honda Civic that's in Class G. Class G is the guest class in reality, and what that means is that uh, that is um, permission given by the organisers to drop into Class G. Uh, because they probably, more than anything, haven't put the car on the rolling road, so you don't know what the power figures are, and therefore you can't pop them in one of the classes. They have to go into Class G. So I'm afraid, um, from being safety car, we've now gone to red flag, which is uh, an enormous shame, but uh, the officials clearly decided it's going to take just a while longer to clear up the incident than was expected. It's also an enormous shame, potentially Chris Dawes, who rejoins me in the commentary box, for John Line, because if we have a full restart, if we go back a lap... Oh, yeah. 
does John Lyne have to do it all again? I hadn't known, because obviously I've just come up and see that he was at the front because yeah. qualifying didn't go to plan for him, did it? But no. the start of the race did, but it's no good. Yeah. I just happened to be down uh, beneath our commentary box, which of course is uh, certainly within earshot of that, uh, that incident. And it was uh, a sort of a crunch crunch. And I have a feeling that uh, basically the issue here is that they've realized they're not going to be able to just simply move that car out of the way. And, it's, uh, it's in the firing line, so uh, hence we had the cars even behind the safety car coming through the pit lane. And uh, it's, it's just unnecessary risks, I guess, they've decided there, Mark. And uh, brought it to a stop. We'll get a, a, a restart, presumably a complete restart, because we've done uh, virtually none of that race. So they'll get them uh, gridded up. And like you say, sadly, poor old Mr. Lyne's going to have to start back where, uh, where he originally was, which... Uh, uh, well, actually, it's well, not well, as bad well, as it was. It was only on the second row, wasn't it? Was it was only on the second row, yeah. yeah. He, he it was must have come good late on in the qualifying. He did. He came He came good later on in the qualifying session and uh, popped the quick lap in, which hoisted him up through the order because he'd been rather languishing yeah. further down through the order than we expected. Uh, so, uh, so, yeah, that good lap. But then, uh, as is always the case, rear-wheel drive car just got off the line well, read the lights well, and you know, took his foot off the clutch at the right time and counteracted any wheel spin that he got. So that was what allowed him to to pick up the lead of the race so so yeah be interesting to see which order they grid them up in uh, i genuinely have no idea as to whether it will be original grid order it or is, whether they've already put 34 on pole now have they right yeah. okay so john line yeah he's got it all to do again well he's also got to take the confidence that he was able to do it and like you say is that uh, has the strengths there of course uh, lining up also on that front row is uh, adrian pottinger uh, another one of the uh, unique racing cars and uh, his teammate was one of the cars involved in that incident and he can see further along in front of him here's the uh, the blue teammate of his the uh, unique racing car that uh, is no longer going to be taking part mr russell sadly is, uh, is out of this race, but he's just got to clear his mind, hasn't he, and just focus on, on his own race. Interestingly, of course, does he get excessively involved in uh, too much of a battle with the 34 car of Gillam and Jones? Because that is, as you were saying, is a guest class, the G class, which means it scores no points. And, uh, you know, Pottinger just wants to keep the, uh, the, the, the maximum points, even if he finishes second. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Drivers don't work like that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, <laughs> it, it, it's, it's made the math slightly easier as well because of poor old Kevin Sterling. You know, he was he was second in the championship on gross score. He's uh, dropped a third when you take uh, his worst score of the season away, the dropped score that would be taken into consideration. So that that's one of the championship protagonists, I'm afraid, now is out. So uh, it does make our, our mathematics slightly easier when it comes to trying to work out as to who's going to be the, the, the champion subject to official confirmation at the end of this one because we always have to caveat it anyway because you, know, you might take the jacket flag first it might look like you're the champion but of course all of the cars have to go through post-race scrutineering and technical checks just to confirm that they do comply with the regulation so you never know until the official results are issued about half an hour after the race so you talk about easier maths and you were relying on me to to keep the maths accurate for you as well uh, you your job today is, is the only job I've given you today. <laughs> yeah, because you, you know it's one I won't do enough, well enough for you there. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it, it does make it a little bit easier, sadly. Um, and, of course, it is, unlike, for example, the Turismo X, where we've got two races, and the Formula Fords, where it's two races, for the Track Day Championship, it is just this one race. A lot of them will actually have a second race, because they'll be out in the Track Day Trophy, with the nature of this weekend with the uh, enduro car taking place tomorrow uh, all day tomorrow because obviously it's eight hours 20 minute race is that uh, they've had to put both championship and trophy on the same day so they're going to be busy get this 45 minute race completed for them and then what time are they due off so the first race after lunch actually 20 to 2 in theory the start time they'll have uh, another 45 minute but up trophies up for grab in each of the classes rather than worrying too much about it being for uh, championship points. Uh, the other thing that I was in the process of mentioning as well is how the pit stops work. So it is uh, a 45 minute race or is scheduled to, when the lights went out for the first time to be a 45 minute race. And the pit window opens between the 15th and the 30th minute of the race. So in other words, it's the middle 15 minutes of the pit window is open for. And during that 15 minutes, every single car has to come into the pit lane now it, the pit stop is time from when the car enters the pit lane to when it exits the pit lane it's not how long it's stationary for it's from the beam at pit in to when it breaks the beam at pit out so the car has to be in that pit lane area for two minutes 
in that middle 15 minutes of the race. Uh, and now in the case of some of them, um, they just stay behind the wheel of the car, take a drink of water, and they might get the tyre pressure adjusted by the team and out they'll go. For others, of course, that two minutes has to include the driver change. So you can only undo your seatbelts once the car is stationary. The engine has to be turned off. I think the regulation state. Then the other driver gets in, seatbelts on, start the engine and away you go. But you cannot be any quicker than two minutes from breaking the beam at pit lane entry to breaking it at pit lane exit. You can be slower, but if you're any quicker, you'll get a penalty. And I'm trying to remember, is this one of the ones, because you and I cover a lot of championships and series and everything, as uh, obviously, and, and there is a good chunk of them where we're getting always a raft of penalties where they're too short in the pit lane. They're really sort of trying to cut it so fine and they just do it too quick. Is this one, I'm trying to remember now, whether a lot of them in this do it or whether they're a little bit more sensible, if you will, <laughs> where they, they, tr they kind of go air on the side of caution. Um, at sensible and racing drivers yeah. in, the, in the same <laughs> sentence, right? Okay, okay, doors, right? I see. Um, Would that had inverted commas around it? Could you not tell? <laughs> um, um, they're not too bad in this one. No, if, if memory serves me correctly, um, they're largely well versed with it, so it, it doesn't end up becoming too much of an issue for them. Well, because it, it's it's a big old penalty you normally get, isn't it? If you come out too soon, so to try and save yourself like one second could end up costing you uh, an awful lot. Thanks to Jamie Peters Ennis, he's just messaged me to let me know that the number 70 car that is starting in third place on the second row there, Stefan Marsh is starting that one. So that's one of the ones we uh, we do know, the Civic uh, is being started by Stefan Marsh. Just see it there on the second row, the uh, black, red and white number 70 car. So we know for that one who is starting it. And uh, they've got them all gridded up. And it is showing, the good news is, on the uh, the, the, the screen, it is now showing that uh, we're going to get the full 45-minute uh, complement of, uh, of these for this race. And it does look like we've got the cars that were still on the circuit removed. We've still got two that they're getting rid of at the top of uh, Paddock Hill Bend. But... Uh, and they're just sort of clearing the debris, and I think that was also an issue, Mark. There's an awful lot of bodywork debris across the there circuit. There was an awful it? lot of bodywork yeah. debris, yeah. So, um, so yeah, we now know Stefan Marsh is starting the car from third on the grid. Do you want to know who starts in the pole sitting car? Please do. Alex Jones, because I can see Tony Gillam, former British touring car racer, of course, is in the pit lane at the moment. So, yeah, just uh, uh, I saw... Uh, what I thought was Tony and then yeah with a quick peer oh, through the binoculars yeah. yeah I can see Tony now so he's down in the pit lane so we know it's Alex Jones then that's starting that car so that at least sorts us out you know we, we used to get the starting drivers but I think you know it's uh, as MSVT have become ever busier and have had to Especially deal with ever, ever more with less people you know it is a, a whole meeting is almost theirs isn't it then yeah we, we just haven't had them today which which is a shame but we totally understand that they, you know they can't get them to us all of the time. No, absolutely, and, uh, and it's a lot of information that used to come on uh, A3 paper, wasn't it? So <laughs> yes. we couldn't, they then started emailing it to us, we were like, well, we no, can't see it because we haven't got A3. I can't bring that at home, it's no good to me. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, I mean, they've got all of it thrown at them in the same day, the Track Day Championship, the Track Day Trophy, the Turismo X pair of races as well, so uh, yeah, they're, they're sort of a, a wee bit busy down there. Last couple of cars hopefully going to be cleared away from the... Uh, what in effect is the escape road but they they haven't opened the barrier there to, to let them escape that way so they waited there for the um the recovery truck and that flatbed was down in the lower paddock already because it had taken a couple of the uh, um formula fours down there i think so so who, who can we put a line through there we can put a line through kevin sterling can't we we can put a line through mark russell it looks as though Ollie Owen's car, which also got tangled up, is now going on the back of a flatbed recovery unit as well. And did I also see Reese Warwick's car as well, the Mazda MX-5? Where did that... That was there. Oh, that's being pushed by the Marshalls now at Paddock Hill Bend. So that's uh, another one that we've lost. So we've lost the cars that started 9th, 11th, 16th and 22nd, I think, at this, uh, this stage. Uh, and not unsurprisingly, because we've lost a chunk of time with this clearing up, the race is no longer going to be a 45-minute race. Chris, it's now going to be... 40 minutes. 40, yeah. I mean, and hey, let's not complain too much about that. Five minutes, I think that's uh, a blessing that we haven't lost more than that. And well done to the teams for getting everything cleared up as quickly as they possibly could to leave us with as much time as possible. Interestingly, just looking up towards Druids, because one of the rescue vans or maintenance vans was stopped up there. I didn't notice anyone up there behind the trees, and it is moving away, so even any telltale signs are no longer there. And uh, I can't see any signs of uh, dressing the circuit, you know, as if somebody's been dumping fluids down anywhere. So we're okay for that one. So 
I think we're getting pretty close. Just the one car left to be bought back on the uh, the flatbed, and uh, and then we'll be good to go. And presumably, Mark, I'd imagine they'll set them off on another green flag lap. I they? would have thought so. Yeah, be another formation lap, and then um, another start um, under the lights with the gantry. Be interesting to see what the rear-wheel drive BMW does again <laughs> this time through. Uh, just to confirm as well, we, we know it's a 40-minute race now rather than being a 45-minute race, but they have also just confirmed to us as well that the pit window remains the same, which uh, means that the regulations are written that the pits uh, the pit stop must take place between the 15th and the 30th minute of the race, so it's not in the middle of the race now, it's just slightly back ended almost, isn't it? So, yeah, because there's less after less it. time, yeah, less after the pit stop window, yeah. So, still between the 15th and the 30th minute, but it does mean if you're the second driver and you get in, you know, you're going to get minimum of 10 minutes, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, uh, that's fine, and they still got that window, although they still seem to sort of manage. Uh, a lot of them coming in at the same time and making a very busy uh, pit lane down there, don't they? And uh, they, they might make some sort of last minute decisions to go, no, that's too busy in there, let's hang fire. And uh, they'll all have their own preferences, whether they want to get in and get it done as soon as possible, whether they want to leave it to the very last minute. And those with shared drives may well be looking to, to pretty much dissect it smack in the middle, which I guess, Mark, with it being a 40-minute race, suddenly becomes a bit easier to do. Um, slightly easier to do, yeah, <laughs> as a, yeah, absolutely. So it makes it nice. Even for mathematicians no, like me? Even for some of the struggles, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, but also, if you've put your, you know, if, if you wanted to do it to uh, put your slower driver in first, but pit as soon as possible, and that sort of undoes some of the strategy now because it means that your quicker driver is going to get less time in the car because it's been shortened by five minutes. Yeah. If yeah. you start to be the quicker driver in the car, you're in the same position as you were. So, yeah. Um, count down boards are being shown now so it won't be long before we get the green flag waved and they'll be off on another formation lap uh, around the circuit again so off they go another formation lap taking place so it is Alex Jones that is on pole position Adrian Pottinger that sits alongside so let's just I think probably rerun you back through the grid so Alex Jones on pole, Adrian Pottinger sitting alongside, Stefan Marsh and John Line on row number two, Freddie Hewitt and Harry Hardy on row number three, Charlie Polk and Jordan Honeybone will sit there on row number four. They'll be the ones to watch out for, Chris Dawes. It's going to be a busy first race. So there we go. As you say, Alex Jones, Adrian Pottinger, Stefan Marsh, John Line, Freddie Hewitt and uh, Harry Hardy. That's the front three rows of the grid. Charlie Polk and Ray Honeybone, sorry, Jordan Honeybone on row number four. Mark Russell missing from row number five. So on their own is the Jack Weaver and Nick Watling car. Kevin Sterling missing from row number six so Ronan Quain is on his own on row number six row number seven is where we see the car of Chris Dumpster and Jack Kemp alongside Will Arif with Darren Goes and then another absentee Ollie Owen from that eighth row of the grid uh, row nine is where we see Rob Burnham and Mick Presland and then after that it's uh, Gary Littlewood Dean Kirby the Barney Lower and Mike Darcy car Reese Warwick is missing from the 11th row of the grid George Jackson and Anser Eason are there on row number 12 and row number 13 is Darren Robinson followed by the Horny Golds Ashley and Rob then it's Ian Bonser Les Conway James Owen and at the tail end of the field is Mike Sullivan and Will Toger so that gives you the revised grid, to say the original grid order, but we've picked out those cars that are missing. And we'll see as to whether John Lyon can repeat the good start from the first attempt. Yeah, he's going to want to, isn't he? And he's going to want to do it as soon as he possibly can, see if he can gap them, because, as we say, the rear-wheel drive advantage uh, its not going to be existing for the whole race, and he's going to want to get past these cars. And that Team Hard Golf at the front just snatched it right at the end, didn't it, brilliantly. Uh, to, to bang it on pole position, so we have no idea quite how quickly that car could have got before the end of the session. Uh, but uh, all the while throughout, Adrian Pottinger in that 89 unique race in Clio, he was just the class of the field for a very long time, so it'll be interesting to see how this one plays out. Championships to consider, including, let's be honest, is that, say, for example, Jordan Honeybone, that car, the 44 car, is still trying to tie up second. They think they can get themselves up into second in the overall championship standings. So there are always a lot of drivers are going to be bearing the points in mind as well. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So they'll be uh, wanting to, to push as hard as they possibly can. We've got the first three quarters of the grid into position. The final three rows just coming to a halt now, including the BMW Compact at the back. When that comes to a halt, we should see the green flag waved by the Marshall. 
at the tail end of the field. And then we are good to go with hopefully this 40 minute race this time through. So red lights will come on on the gantry. The revs are already beginning to rise. Red lights are on and as the lights go out, watch out for the rear wheel drive BMW. John Line absolutely nailed the start that time. The first start was good. That was absolutely textbook. Really slow away though is Alex Jones at the wheel of the Volkswagen Golf and drops from what was pole position down into fourth and possibly fifth place as Jordan Honeybone tries to go around the outside of the Golf there and the Apple Car Centre Clio but he's on the wrong line heading up towards Druids. But what a start from John Line, not only to take the lead, but to take the lead and build daylight. Which is exactly what I said I know he would want to do and he has that daylight between him and Pottinger is quite impressive there. Alex Jones has managed to hold on to fourth position now, he's fighting with Jordan Honeybone but the Team Hard Golf held on to it. I've got to say the car just ahead of him, Stefan Marsh in that uh, that Honda number 70 did a fabulous elbows out job to, uh, to get past and the Golf just suddenly spins just as it turned right at the uh, McLaren's right hander back of the car turned even further right than it should have done he's managed to hold that and just stayed sideways so i say spin it wasn't my apologies he got very sideways a lot of cars passed him it's going to be exciting to see him work back through though yeah the problem is certes is a quick quick corner you've only lent on that right rear tire once coming out of graham hill bend and you lean on it a lot more through certes cold rear just snapping away there from alex jones but thankfully gathering up the moment and not getting clobbered by anybody so he will be able to continue but of course he's got a chunk of work to do now to try and carve his way up through the order he has fallen behind the super tune Puma of Harry Hardy which I saw a load of fuel coming out from the filler cap of that car as it went round through Druid so that will be something that the officials might pick up on as well so yeah watch out for that Ford Puma so for Alex Jones though still trying to thread his way through the order picking up places here and there he's gained probably at least three or four places since it's been I would say so much going on through this field and uh, we saw a, a few of them just getting a little bit out of shape there Mark it looks as though uh, that section from Surtees round to Clearways is a little bit greasy on the dance floor again now, isn't it? They, you can see quite a few of them just flipping the rear end back and forth as they change that direction from the left to the right. We've also got the 22 car there of uh, Darren Goes. We saw well, he's one that got out of shape. And there's still a little bit of smoke coming from the corner of that car, possibly from a bit of bodywork. Yeah, it looks like it's the front right that it was coming from as he came over the start-finish line. Definitely some tyre rub on that car. He's uh, still doing battle, though, trying to squeeze his way up the inside of one of the Ford Fiestas that he, he is uh, squabbling away with. That's a number 14 car of uh, Jack Wheeler and Nick Watling that uh, Darren Goes has managed to squeeze his way through a pass. And then he snatches a break in the Clio as he heads down in towards Graham Hill Bend that time through. John Line still leading the way from Adrian Pottiger. The lead advantage was less than a second as they came over the start-finish line last time through. And also, Stefan March is not that far away, is he, in the third place Honda Civic? Which is what I think is actually good news for, for John Line, isn't it? Because it means that the second place Pottinger is probably more aware of a car and filling up his mirrors than he is trying desperately to close in on that uh, BMW at the front of the field. So it is enabling the, uh, the blue BMW to still stretch his legs sufficiently at the front. Every now and again, it looks like that margin's coming down slightly but he then just manages to gap them a little bit further. Stefan Marsh in third is under no pressure from behind because it's a wicked battle there for fourth place. Jordan Honeybow uh, with the, uh, another one of the unique racing cars, that being the, uh, which one is it that's there? That's, sorry, that's Polk, isn't it? 98, Charlie Polk all over the back of that Clio, so fights all the way through this field. And we still see a little bit of fuel residual just falling out of the fuel filler cap of Harry Hardy's car. The leading three, they're just turning through. Uh, clear ways. There goes Jordan Honeybone, still under pressure from Charlie Polk that sits behind him. I see what you mean, fuel, yeah, fuel still coming out of the Puma. Now the officials will will look at that. If if they think it's overfill, they'll leave it a few laps. If it keeps doing it after a few laps when the fuel level should have dropped, it will be black and orange. Mm, interesting. I mean, it's certainly not slowing him down, is it? It's a bit wacky races to make sure no one can get onto the back of him as it stands at the moment. But and he's all over the back of the uh, Freddie Hewitt number 17. That. Uh, Mini that was a late entry. That was a reserve for the trophy, I think, wasn't he? But he's in this championship one. And uh, interestingly, that pair have closed in on the pair ahead of them. So we've suddenly got four cars in a row 44 Jordan and Honeybone, Colt in 98, 17 Hewitt, and the 191, that silver Puma of Hardy, all uh, line astern, equidistant from each other, with Alex Jones trying to close in on the back of them in that team hard pole sitting golf as well. Which, let's not forget, that's going to have a driver change in the pit lane. 
rather rapid Mr Gillum. It will be yet Tony Gillum that will jump on board that kite. You still see the fuel coming out of the uh, left-hand fuel fill of Apple with the Puma there as it came round through the uh, Clark curve. That's Harry Hardy going well uh, to the top of the times in terms of fastest lap of the race. has just gone Alex Jones, who I thought had gone off the, the boil a little bit at the wheel of the Volkswagen Golf that had the spin. But all of a sudden he pops a quick lap in. 55.367 seconds for the Volkswagen that is now closing in on Harry Hardy's Ford Puma. Yeah, that has not got any better at all. The fuel is just pouring out of the side of that Ford Puma. I think there's a decision to be made now. The driver might be blissfully unaware of it, but if he is, he ought to come in. And if he's not, then I think the officials very shortly will suggest that that's a good idea. Until the out of fuel light comes on. That'll probably work. Because <laughs> it just is throwing masses out, isn't it? Here we go. Is he, he's going to turn right, just bouncing around that corner, just pouring out there. Not causing him an issue on his rear wheel. And it looks like Alex Jones is now going to try and dive up the inside. Through goes the Team Hard Golf. He's reeled them in patiently. Now he's got that car into the sweet spot. He's absolutely flying, trying to cut through this gaggle of cars like a hot knife through butter. Won't be easy because these are very quick cars. They're having a great fight. We're talking, what are they? They're fourth backwards, aren't they? Yeah, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth. I think the officials are getting the news that it's dropping some fluid. So what they've That's got is... because you grasped him up. I know, yeah. <laughs> it's because what you've got is a scrutineer on the start-finish line looking. But, of course, as the car comes down the straight, there's no obvious sight as anything. Alex Jones very, very decisively dives up the inside of Charlie Polk, place gain, that's up to fifth position now for the golf as it continues to make progress. The next target is going to be Jordan Honeybone at the wheel of the Apple Car Centre Renault Clio. Now, for Jordan, if the golf goes through, it doesn't take any championship points away from him because that Volkswagen is non-championship scoring this weekend. It runs in the guest class, so Jordan Honeybone may well just opt to let it go through if he's aware it's in the guest class, of course. We've got a black and orange flag now, and I'm pretty sure I can't see the number, but we can have a fair assumption which one it's going to be, can't we? So that Puma's going to have to make its way in as uh, Alex Jones tries to have a sneaky snifter round past Jordan Honeybone as they got to Paddock Hill Bend. Not done it there. Up past the back marker they go towards the Druid's hairpin. Jordan's, although, you, as you say, it's not going to take points away from him, he's a bracer at heart, and he's not going to let this team hard golf through, particularly easy. He's going defensive down towards Graham Hill Bend, onto the Cooper Strait. Is this the point that that golf's going to be able to blast down? He's looking towards the inside as we get towards Surtees, sign sealed, and it's delivered. Absolutely cracking job. It looked to me as though Alex Jones has clearly got the, uh, the skill in this car, but just struggles when it's cold at the beginning of the race. Yeah, yeah, maybe depending on the, uh, what they've done with the tyre pressures, they might opt to, if they're back out later on in the track day trophy, they might opt to start that car with slightly higher tyre pressures. Brilliant fight going on behind Jordan Honeybone. Charlie Paul comes to pressure from Freddie Hewitt. The mini pulls out from behind, draws himself alongside the Renault Clio, but he's not fully alongside by the time they get towards Paddock Hill Bend, so all he can hope for is to get a better exit coming off the corner and try and get the undercut on Charlie Polk but Charlie Polk is wise to that at the clear and therefore just moves across to the right hand side of the circuit on the run up towards Druids so again Freddie Hewitt wide line into Druids no has little choice but to sit behind the clear so good fight going on now for fifth sixth and seventh down towards Graham Hill Bend yeah and you notice the car that is no longer sat there with them fighting sadly 191 the Super Tube Motorsport uh, Harry Hardy that Puma has been brought into the pits and they're just having a conversation with him to make sure that they know what the issue is, see whether it's something they can resolve now and get him back out again. But we, we struggle to believe that's a quick fix, whatever that is. Across the line to complete the ninth lap is our race leader and it is still John Lyne, but I tell you what's a bit of a struggle for him now is the fact that uh, the second place car of Pottinger is no longer under pressure, so he's able to start re reeling him in. But in towards uh, Paddock Hill Bent. I mean, this fight is alive, isn't it? Yeah, brilliant stuff. Uh, Jordan Honeywell and Charlie Polk, Freddie Hewitt going at it to tooth and nail. There is uh, Harry Hardy's Ford Puma in the pit lane. You can see all of the attention to the left-hand side of the car because that's where the fuel filler flap is on the Ford Puma. They've got the filler flap open and are just uh, having a look. It's not just a case of sticking some gaffer tape over it to, to plug the hole. The scrutineers will need to be satisfied that whatever was causing it to leak in the first place has been fully resolved. The one great thing about the Trap Day Championship is no matter where you look, there's always some good battles going on as well, Chris. Uh, and one of those is the the three Ford Fiestas and the Renault Clio just coming down in towards Graham Hill Bend now. Being kept rather busy is Rob Burnham, I think, at the front of that little uh, uh, train of cars. 
yes, the orange and the black one. Yeah, the orange uh, 25 car, you're absolutely right, it is. And, and I've, I've always said that this is one that gives me a, a, a stiff neck. Just quickly, the uh, Jordan Honeybone's under pressure, and it looks like as they get towards Paddock Hill Bend, he's been passed. So the fourth place now goes the way, sorry, fifth place now goes the way of the 98 car of Polk. So he's been threatening that move for a while, hasn't he? But you notice he's going defensive all of a sudden, isn't he? Yeah, Jordan Honeybone weaving around as they head up towards Druid's corner in that dichotomy. He wants to attack, having just lost the place, but he needs to defend because he's got oh, Freddie Cook's car. Sorry, Mark, we just had the uh, Fiestas cubed uh, heading in towards Paddock Hill Bend, and uh, the 25, the orange car of uh, Rob Burnham, just got tapped wide as they tried to go around there. He's kept it on the tarmac. That was impressive, Mike. Normally, once they tap there, they disappear into the kitty litter, don't they? But he kept it on the tarmac, but he's now way back from that gaggle, which is a shame. Yeah, so uh, he might have a little bit of damage, possibly, as a result of the contact, but he's uh, yeah just heading down towards Graham Hill Bend now and hopefully he will r remain out there in the race. Uh, how much time did he lose? He probably lost, what, three places, four places, didn't he? So uh, we've got, what, 30 minutes of the race still remaining. So it's going to be another five minutes yet before the pit window opens in this one. We've also now got Alex Jones up a further place. So the Volkswagen Golf is now up into what will be third position because he's got himself ahead of Stefan March at the wheel of the Honda Civic this time through. So the next of the targets for the Volkswagen Golf of Alex Jones is going to be the number 89 Renault Clio in the hands of Adrian Pottinger. So uh, the battles are beginning to form and there is Adrian Pottinger just heading out of clearways now. Look in his mirrors, what's behind him? Alex Jones and the Team Hard Golf. Yeah, and you've got to say, look how close Pottinger is to our race leader John Lyne as well. That BMW's been slowly reeled in as well. Um, but, uh, yeah, both of them are going to be under huge pressure from this uh, Team Hard Golf, but now it's into the sweet spot. He's flying and up towards Druids. Are we going to see a dive towards the inside? He's certainly motioning as though he's going to. He's just not quite there, and it looked to me as though Pottinger knew that was coming, decided not to butt the fight for the reasons you said earlier, Mark. It's a guest-class car. There's absolutely no need to do it. And uh, through goes Alex Jones up into second place. Yeah, the difficulty for Adrian Pottinger is if he wants to lift the championship crown, though, he needs to get himself ahead of John Lyne and also keep his fingers crossed that John Lyne runs into trouble at some point because at the moment John Lyne doing what he's doing and having the pace that he's doing is going to be more than enough for him to, subject to official confirmation at the end of this race, scoop up the MSVT Track Day Championship for 2022. Now he's coming under pressure for the lead though this time because Alex Jones has already closed right onto the coattails of the BMW. Is John Lyne going to let him go up towards Paddock Hill Bend? The door is open. Alex Jones sets the fastest lap of the race and through Paddock Hill Bend goes side by side with John Lyne. The Volkswagen is on the inside line now as they get past the back marker and should pick up the lead of the race. So yeah, fastest lap and now the lead of the race. John Lyne not making it easy. But as we say, he knows that he is the championship leader. He knows he is ahead of all of his championship rivals. He's just lost the overall lead, though. In reality, he was never going to want to make it too easy. Not for trying to keep that golf behind him, but more about if he deliberately backed off and, and sort of said, there you go, sir, he's leaving himself vulnerable to Pottinger behind. I thought Pottinger was going to sort of try and stay with Alex Jones as much as possible. He's let them him through without it overly compromising himself, hasn't he? So, John Lyne still holds on to second on the road, but first of the points scores. Yep, so uh, John Lyne still looking for championship just, glory. Hewitt's just got past Jordan Honeybone as they came up towards Clearways. So the Apple Car Centre uh, Clio just drops back in place, but he's already alongside him. Across the start-finish line is that we've got Freddie Hewitt trying desperately to, uh, uh, to hold him back there. Apologies, that was one that we were able to enjoy out of our uh, window there. So it's, uh, that's that fight that we thought had settled down once, Mark, and it, it hasn't. Yeah, it's just going up towards Druids now, isn't it? So with Charlie Polk, Freddie Hewitt in the mini, followed by Jordan Honeybone. No let up in the pressure that Jordan Honeybone is applying. All of this is just allowing the number 98 car of Charlie Polk to pull away a bit from the Mini and the slightly newer shaped Renault Clio that sit behind. Both of them bounce over the kerbs on the entry and the exit of Graham Hill Bend. Freddie Hewitt, if anything, there was a little bit wide on exit there, so just needs to be careful that he stays within the confines of the circuit. Now, if I've got my maths right, we've also got less than 60 seconds to go now until the pit window opens. The race leader has just completed lap 15. Caesar Alana, Reef and Matthew, so 
safe in the knowledge that you got it right there. But uh, yeah, the uh, interesting to see that. Potter, oh, and we've got Alex Jones who's run very wide at Druids. He's kept it on the tarmac, but completely missed the apex. What's your phrase you use? Forgot to make friends with the apex. Did make friends with the apex. That's your yeah. phrase, isn't it? Yeah, and it, uh, that was very much the case. No issue. But it shows it's still got to be paying massive attention as they go around this. Has the race lead, but behind him, you can see in the background, John Lyne is under growing pressure. This was what I was about to refer to. That blue BMW of John Lyne under massive pressure from the white Clio that's directly behind him of the 89 car of Pottinger. Not only is that for the first of the point scorers, they are both in Class B as well. So that is a very meaningful battle between those two, Mark. Uh, yeah, there's uh, 38 points between them, I think, in terms of the championship scoring. So uh, uh, it would really n need John Lyon to lose several places before um, Adrian Potty would mathematically stand there any chance of overhauling that kind of deficit. So John Lyon's still in a good position, even if Adrian Pottinger goes through. Good fight further down through the order as well. Uh, the number 57 Ford Fiesta of Gary Littlewood, who's been a long-time competitor in MSVT Championships, fighting away with the blue Ford Fiesta ST of uh, Jack Wheeler and Nick Watling, who share that car. They are fighting for what would be fifth and sixth in the class for 11th and 12th overall as they turn their way around through Paddock Hill Bend. So the yellow one is Gary Littlewood, the blue one behind is, uh, as we say, the, uh, the other car. So that's a good one to watch out for. Pit window is now open as well. And we're now also starting to see some of the takers for that as well. So Ian Bonser comes in at the wheel of his Ginetta G40. The line. Meanwhile, goes our leader. Alex Jones is not coming in the pits yet to hand that over to Tony Gillum. So number 34 still circulating in the lead. That is now, what's that, 17 laps completed. And uh, some of them may sort of choose, I don't really want to come in at the moment. We're having a cracking fight. I don't want to break it up because pit stops can suddenly, bizarrely, even though they've all got the same you know, maximum time. It can split these fights up completely. Actually, uh, one that I was referring to is that the Fiestas that we saw fighting earlier are splitting them because through goes number 57, Littlewood still uh, circulating, but the 14 is into the pits. And that's going to be a driver change between Wheeler and Watling. And we don't know what the dynamic is there, do we? Whether that's going to see it go even quicker or it's done its quickest so far. So. John Line still under this pressure from Adrian Pottinger for what is second and third position overall. Alex Jones just edging away all of the time, having taken up the lead of the race. He has now built almost a three and a half second advantage between himself and this little squabble that's going on. John Line, remember, is the championship leader at this stage, so he would pick up the points for the win, which would be 30 points for a win, plus a point for every person in his class he beats, up to a maximum of five. Well, that is one, two, three other points he would pick up because there are three other runners in Class B. Into the pit lane has come one of the Ford Fiestas that was involved in that good little battle. That's the Jack Wheeler and Nick Watling car that was uh, involved in that fantastic little squabble with Gary Littlewood. So for the moment, that fight has uh, just uh, had the pause button pressed. Yeah, that was the one where I said that the yellow one kept going. I wondered whether he was going to come in at the same time, but it's decided to go. You know, are we going to get the undercut from that 14? <laughs> so much here but hey it's, it's good fun to, to consider it through comes our race leaders and uh, the golf is already making its way back down the hill at Paddock Hill Bend and uh, Pottinger is still there with line but that BMW is not even given a nibble is it you can't say that that white Clio is even posturing to make a challenge at the moment he showed his nose in a slightly different line there but not close enough to make a move so you, you've got to say at the moment John Lyon is, is just calmly going about his business isn't he? Uh, he is yeah he's, he's had a brilliant season John Lyon you look at what he's done so far this year John Lyon and he has had three overall race wins he finished third at Snetterton but was first in his class on that occasion because I think again guest cars were involved in it he was third overall at Anglesey and last time out even at Donington Park he was third so he has had a, a mega season where he's finished on the overall podium in every single race and has had brilliant brilliant consistency as well and he's showing that again here as over the start finish line he'll go still with Adrian Pottinger not that far behind him uh, and uh, you that's the season that John Lyon has had this year. In stark contrast to last year, where I think he only finished on the overall podium once last year, John Lyon. Yeah, yeah, different season. Yeah, he 
is certainly, uh, you know, they'll, they, a lot of them will have the, uh, the busy uh, winter to, to get things sorted. Incidentally, by the way, Hardy's uh, Puma is now going down through the tunnel to the lower paddock, so that car is now out. It went back out onto the circuit, didn't it? But they clearly weren't happy. Into the pits has come the uh, number 70 car, so that Honda is going to be uh, a change of driver, so we know that it's Stefan Marsh that started that one. Justin Roberts will be taking over that team KAR Honda Civic Type R. Also in is the number 17 Freddie Hewitt Mini. That car, of course, was up there having a fabulous three-car fight with Polk and Honeybone, 98 and 44 cars, but they're going to be changing drivers as well. Uh, and this is where we almost have, a, have to have a patience, don't we, Mark, where they come in and we need to then wait for them all to come back again and see what fights resume or what new ones are taking shape. Uh, absolutely, yeah. It's that, that period where we're in a bit of flux in the race and you don't know what part two is going to look like. We also saw uh, there uh, in the pit lane the BMW of uh, Barney Lower and Mike Darcy as well, so that is also in the process of conducting its uh, pit stop. So we've got 20 minutes left in this race. There is a five-second penalty for car number seven for exceeding the track limits. Well, that's a man who probably has more experience than anybody in the field. Will Arif uh, at the wheel of number seven Ford Fiesta getting a five-second penalty for exceeding track limits. Will has been around um, a while, it's fair to say. <laughs> yes, and uh, it goes to show that it doesn't matter. Still pushing it incredibly hard and just pushing it that little bit too far. Uh, as is quite common here at Brands Hatch, there's a, a few hot spots, in particular down at Graham Hill Bend, where they push it a bit hard. And into the pits comes that uh, third place car, Pottinger. So John Line gets to just have a bit of a breather in that BMW in second place because the white, unique racing Clio, number 89, comes into the pits to make his mandatory stop. Obviously, pit speed, uh, speed limit that feels so slow, doesn't it? Even just stood down there as they come in, it feels so slow compared to the racing speed. But down he comes to serve those two minutes. He just pulls in front of Freddie Hewitt in the number 17 car as that one was about to go. But thankfully, the team obviously warned Freddie Hewitt, don't go yet, but there he goes out onto the circuit. Two minutes will just feel like an eternity, won't it? It does. It feels like forever when you're in the pit lane. So for Freddie Hewitt, that was two minutes and seven seconds from pit in to pit out. So he lost seven seconds there somewhere that he could have um, otherwise have gained on track. So, um, And that's the difference. That's why some of those battles that you're talking about just don't reappear for part two because some cars get it bang on two minutes from pit in to pit out can't be any shorter others uh, are looking through some of them you know, two minutes 34 when we saw the horny golds come in at the wheel of their mgzr uh, alex jones the pit race leader is into the pit lane this time through now they are positioned right the way at pit lane exit so uh, this is where adrian pottinger is and you should see the volkswagen golf probably park up behind it i would have thought because yeah there you go bang on there <laughs> is there is the golf uh, out jumps alex jones and in is about to jump Tony Gillum. Yeah, and of course they've uh, been quite closed up on behind there as well. Is the uh, yellow and blue clear that was involved in that great four-car battle, three of which were Fiestas, isn't it? Uh, and uh, pretty close up behind them, the uh, the number 76 car, uh, which of course is another team hard race in George Jackson in the uh, in the Clio. Tony Gillum is going to go really whack, rapid in that car. In fairness, it was already in the lead. Alex Jones, once he got everything up to temperature, was flying. Still circulated, not pitting is our race leader, which is now the 71 BMW of John Line. Remember, he got that incredible start, that blue BMW, kept that lead for a long time until the Team Hard Golf took it. That one, as we see, is still in the pits. Tony Gillum getting strapped in there, ready to be launched. But there's the BMW that's going to want to do as much as possible to, to make sure that he's not leaving himself vulnerable to Pottinger when that uh, 89 white clear comes back out again. Yeah, did you spot who was doing the straps upon Tony Gillum's? I see. It's Daryl Wilson, TCR UK oh, racer. Really? Yeah, it's Daryl. Yeah, so that's who's doing uh, Make sure the seat belts are tight, Tony Gillum. And then uh, that car will head back out in the hands of Team Patron to see what he might be able to do to reassert uh, itself in the lead of the race. We need to get through all of the pit stops first, and John Line needs to be um, heading into the pit lane in the next six and three-quarter minutes, just under, Loads because the pit window will close when there are ten minutes to go. So we can keep pressing on at the moment. He's got a 19.2-second lead over Jordan Honeybone. I predict he's going to come in this lap. Uh, just saw him come down and start finish straight, just flashed his lights to his crew on the pit wall. I think that he's just acknowledged that he's, uh, he's coming in this, unless he's got some kind of code that he's flashed a certain number of times that tells them how long he's going to be. But I, I just reckon he's likely to come in this time. He's caught up in, uh, in a slightly slower car there, but he's passed him before he gets down to Graham Hill Bend. So 
25 laps completed for John Lyon. Is this going to be the one where he brings it in? And that's where we're going to be glued to that pit exit. How is he going to do? Now, Pottinger, what did he do? His pit stop, 2.02.406. That's a lot closer to the maximum, isn't it? Yep. So, uh, so uh, yeah, or minimum, yeah. So Sorry, minimum. Yeah, yeah. We'll uh, see what he might be able to do. So, John Lyon is indeed coming into the pit lane, as correctly predicted by Chris Dawes. And as he flicks his way through the little chicane, pit lane entry, gets the car slowed down to the regulatory speed limit and then almost trickles his way all the way down pit lane to where his team are based. And of course, from entering the pit lane to exiting it cannot be any less than 120 seconds. But if you can get as close to that as possible, you start to pick up a bit of time in your pit stop, which is so much easier to pick up in the pit stop than it ever is on track. Yeah, absolutely. I saw further down, just see the bottom left of your screen there is uh, Jordan Honeybone, number 44. Remember that car still trying to see if they can sneak that second place in the championship standings. But uh, John Line there, you see, 71, the incredibly rapid start in BMW and uh, was doing such a good job holding on the overall race lead. Still, it was, of course, the race lead as far as points were concerned. And he wants to make sure he gets out there ahead of Pottinger's white Renault Clio. As we say, Pottinger did, what did I say, 202.406. So just two, uh, just under two and a half seconds longer than the minimum they have to be there. How are they going to get it right? Uh, and also, the other thing we need to consider is uh, Alex Jones giving way to Tony Gillam. What was their pit stop time? Well, their pit stop time was two minutes and ten seconds. So they were even slower. So uh, John Line, if he can get this absolutely right, you never know. Uh, whilst he's in the pit lane, out on circuit, though, new fastest lap, Tony Gillam, 54.190 for Tony Gillam. That is, at the moment, the best part of two seconds quicker than that very same car went in qualifying. Which I think he only managed to get one flying lap in before the red flags came yeah. out. He just nailed it right at the end there, didn't he? Just suddenly leapt out of nowhere. Uh, Jordan Honeybones rejoined the circuit and... Uh, it's just, it's just as intriguing keeping an eye on the pit stop times as much as anything else to make sure that uh, everything is okay in terms of those times. You think about it, two seconds over the minimum, that's one, two, that's it, that's all you've done. You've, you've cut that really fine and John Line is now making his way out of the pits. As I look down below our commentary box, I should see that blue BMW appear. There he goes, he's now out of that pit lane. Now, what did he do? 204, Mark. He's done a 204. He has, but as he's rejoined, he's rejoined behind the Volkswagen Golfer Tony Gillam. So that would have given him the lead had he have come out ahead of that car. Yeah, I mean, I think that that was only going to be a matter of time. The Golf had got the lead overall before the pits, hadn't it? And was going to get even quicker. Importantly, coming out of Druids, directly behind that BMW is Pottinger. So he's managed to keep himself ahead of a point-scoring car there. Those two pick up their battle again. And in fact, looking in towards Gra Graham Hill Bend is that we're not far away from the, uh, the number 70 Robertson Marsh car is still there. You've just seen the background, the uh, red, white and black lights ablaze coming towards us right now. That is the car that sits there in fourth place now. So they're not that much split apart, are they? You no, know, so that's Justin Roberts. Everybody now has now completed at least one pit stop. So I think we are done and dusted for um, all of the pit stops taking place. There is one still, one car still in the pit lane, I can see, though, um, over my left shoulder, so that could potentially be a retiree that is not going to play any further part in the race. We've got 12 and a half minutes of the race still to go. We've got the battles back on again, so Jordan Honeybone, together with the car of Charlie Polk and Freddie Hewitt, are all together again as they come over the start-finish line, but it's Jordan Honeybone that is now at the front of that little trio of cars as they head up towards Paddock Hill Bend. So they have resumed their battle, albeit not quite in the same order. And then also resuming battle is uh, the car in the hands of Rob Burnham, his Ford Fiesta. But he's now squabbling with a different car. He's got the uh, number seven car behind, so that'll be Will Arif, who has, of course, got that five-second penalty hanging over him for track limits earlier on in the race. Yeah, and I was just uh, checking as well that uh, it's showing that the 141 Fiesta of Wheeler and Watling, that was the uh, the blue one that was involved in the fights earlier, was it not? Although I had that down as 14, so I'm not sure why that's showing. There's uh, still in the pits 141, but there is no 14 running anymore, so it looks like that car's hit an issue despite being involved in a great tussle in the early stages. Yeah, still showing he's in the pits. I think he might have retired to the outer paddock potentially as Will Arif tries to draw himself alongside Rob Burnham, decides. Uh, better of it as they head up towards Paddock Hill Bend. So the uh, hugely experienced uh, Will Arif, who's been racing for the best part of, I would say, probably 40, 50 years, uh, but he's still as quick as ever, 
trying to do battle with Rob Burnham and that at the moment is going to be for second and third in Class D. It's going to be for 14th and 15th places overall. I have to tell you, a cracking battle. I just watched along the start finish straight coming down towards Graham Hill Bend. Jordan Honeybone, 44, at the head of this three-car train. We've just seen them not leaving each other alone. About to come into our eyesight now, the white Renault Clio of Jordan Honeybone. Behind him is Polk in the uh, red, another one of the unique racing uh, Renaults. And then directly behind them, of course, is the uh, Freddie Hewitt, number 17, the grey Mini. The three of them still glued together. And what we had a second ago is as they made their way towards Paddock Hill Bend, as uh, Jordan went round the outside of a back marker, all of a sudden the pole dived towards the inside, and I was a bit worried that Jordan wouldn't know that Polk had made that dive up, and thankfully they both got through and survived it, came out uh, squeaky clean and still fighting, and that's just they just won't leave each other alone, will they? That's good value, isn't it? All the way through the order, just ahead of them is that great battle I was talking about between the two Ford Fiesta STs, the orange one of Rob Burnham fighting away with Will Arif, and I'm afraid uh, retirement for Chris Dumpster and Jack Kemp's Renault Clio as well. That has retired at the end of the Cooper Straits, heading up towards Surtees Corner, so there'll be localised yellow flags, as you can see at the end of the Cooper Strait there being waved as the marshals head in that general direction to try and get that stricken Clio out of the way with less than 10 minutes remaining. Yeah, hopefully the fact that it's gone up that, uh, that, that escape lane will have it just as localised and if it's still freewheeling, the uh, wonderful orange arm will be able to get that pushed out of the way, which will be a relief to keep this race going. And Tony Gillam still stretching his legs at the uh, overall front of the field. He's now nearly seven and a half seconds clear of John Lyme. But most importantly, from the points perspective, is that John Lyme still keeping Pottinger behind him, the 71 BMW holding on to second. But this fight we're looking at here is the one you draw attention to that's absolutely brilliant. Burnham still keeping that orange Fiesta ahead of Will Arif. And, uh, yeah, as you say, he's got a five-second penalty, but it's not going to stop you getting involved in the race, is it? Will won't worry about that. He'll just roll his sleeves up and crack on still. And uh, he's pushing hard, but Rob Burnham is more than up to the task at the moment of making sure he hangs on to the position. What they do need to do, though, is watch their mirrors, because whilst they're busy squabbling, uh, we've got Jordan Honeybone edging up on them, and Jordan Honeybone, of course, can't afford to be compromised here. He's running in fifth place. He's got Charlie Polk right behind him, and then Freddie Hewitt has just dropped away a shade more in seventh place at the moment. So here for the two Ford Fiestas over the start-finish line any second. Now pretty much side-by-side side again on the road towards Paddock Hill Bend but they do need to keep an eye on the quicker cars coming through. I think Will Arif has finally got the job done, has he? Rob Burnham breaks as late as he dare and tries to keep uh, hang on to the position, and they still remain in the same <laughs> order as they come out of Paddock Hill Bend, but now they've got the traffic trying to wiggle their way through. Yeah, I've always said that uh, there's one thing worse than back markers, and that's battling back markers, and that's what you've got here is Jordan Honeybone desperately trying to pick his way through. Of course, the back markers want to keep their own fight going, but they don't want to pick up a penalty for ignoring the, uh, the, the the blue flags and thankfully they're just in it will Arif fair shout you could even see him through the window there that he was looking to the left to let these back mark uh, sorry the faster cars through is he going to know that Freddie Hewitt is part of this as well now the problem is the back markers are, are lapping back markers as well and somehow we're just about getting away with that, this aren't we? that was Les Conway's uh, BMW 3 series that they met just in the wrong place there but Les saw them coming stayed out of the way sensible driving from everybody with seven and a half minutes to go over the start finish line they will all go if anybody has lost time through this traffic it's Freddie Hewitt at the wheel of the grey Mini who has just lost a little bit of time in fact he's only now just got past Will Arif and he's still got to deal with the orange Ford Fiesta of Rob Burnham so uh, Freddie uh, and his hopes of getting inside the top six are slightly being dashed at the moment because say, he's still working his way through the traffic. Seven minutes to go. Race leader has now completed 32 laps. Make that 33 as Tony Gillam goes over the start-finish line. John Lyne in second place, though, still under enormous pressure from Adrian Pottinger. Yeah, the problem you've got is these Fiestas are incredibly quick in a straight line, aren't they? So it's not easy for these quicker cars to get past them. And there was no blue flags being shown for Freddie Hewitt that I saw there. But he's managed to make his way through now. And uh, he now the problem for him is he's got a reel in these pair ahead. However, it's not out of the question because I thought that Jordan Honeybone had escaped from the chasing pole, the 98 car, the red and black unique racing uh, Renault Clio. But suddenly that gap between those two has come down again. So you don't need to lose sleep if it's disappeared. And these Fiestas have picked up their fight again. Will Arif had somehow got past the uh, orange Burnham 25 car. Burnham's taking it back again. It's do -si do your partners. Brilliant stuff. Will Arif flashing his lights, trying to do anything. But they are <laughs> fighting for position. So why should Rob Burnham 
give the place up. Try to confuse him. <laughs> <laughs> Fighting over 12th and 13th position. It's been good value, has this little squabble as well. It's still good value for second and third overall in the race as well, because John Lyne has still got Adrian Pottinger within half a second of him. You might just see them go through the background of the shot. Yeah, down through Paddock Hill Bend, you could just see those two go. So there's still nothing to choose between them. So uh, the key a, thing, Mark, this oh. is second and third in class, isn't it? It is, yeah. We're yeah. Watching now. So it's no wonder they're going at it hammer and nails because they, there is silverware available for them. Yeah, Ronan Quinn is the man who leads the class. This is the white car with the blue bonnet, but he's about five or six seconds up the road from this little pair as well. So uh, over the start, finish down, come. Will Arif is going to have another little nibble, is he? He's not quite as alongside as he was on the previous lap, so a nice wide line in. Try and cut back on the exit, get a bit more momentum coming out of the corner. Is that going to be the ticket? No, it's not, because Rob Burner will just see that coming and defend again. Across the line has gone our race leader still, uh, Tony Gillam, the 34 car, stretching his legs comfortably at the front, but about to come towards the line now is the point scoring lead battle. John Line, 71, still leading the way, under constant pressure from Pottinger, the 89 car, but never close enough that he's having to take defensive lines or even worry that the, 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 no, the, the lunge is going to be launched by Pottinger. You see Pottinger, the white clear, just in the background there. He's never dropping him completely, is he? But he's just keeping it a big enough gap. Uh, yeah, two very different cars, aren't they? Renault Clio, nice uh, you know, car through the corners. The BMW, um, a bit more pointy and squirty, so a bit quicker in a straight line. But overall, it's a heavier car, so it might have a bit more power. But power to weight means that both of them end up in the same class in reality. John Line doing a really good job again of hanging on to a potential podium spot it would be second overall of course in the race but he would be the first championship registered car home because it's a guest class car that continues to lead in the hands of tony gillam having taken over from alex jones during the pit window so four minutes to go lead gap slightly growing there's more traffic up the road just to deal with so the e36 bmw will try and get past the e30 of les conway but that is going to les conway but that is going to happen one would imagine on the exit of druid and on the run down in towards graham hill yeah, I was just looking behind us. It's, it's like you say, is that everywhere there's fights going on. We're looking here at this lead battle. John Line trying to hold that on across the line. Goes Jordan Honeybone trying to keep Polk behind him. We've still got these two Fiestas going at it for second and third in Class D. Across the line they come. And it is Burnham, number 25. Still just about holding Will Arif and Blue, number seven, behind him. But they get side by side, don't they? So. That's what we're not seeing between these pair at the moment. John Line still, that BMW, able to keep that Clio just enough at bay. And he's got less than three and a half more minutes to be able to keep that as the way he wants it to finish. Yep, so pressure will still be on all of the time to try and make sure that he remains where he wants to be. John Line on course potentially to stitch up the championship and will want to make sure that he just keeps pressing on. It would need an absolute disaster for John Line to not be the champion but he's got to keep going he's got to see the checkered flag even if he were to lose two or three places in his class would still not worry him at this stage but what he couldn't afford to do is non-finish in these final three minutes that would be an absolute disaster there's Charlie Polk over the start finish line he just dives up the inside of the class D leading Ford Fiesta of Ronan Quinn Ronan circulating in 11th position Charlie Polk in sixth place so that puts a lap on the class D leader Charlie Polk has really sort of settled down into that sixth position now because he's managed to remove all of the pressure that was placed upon him. He's fallen away from Jordan Honeybone, but he's also got daylight between himself and Freddie Hewitt. And what of the two Ford Fiestas fighting over second and third in Class D, I hear you ask? Well, out of Druids they will come, race leader bearing down on them, but Rob Burnham and Will Arif still haven't sorted out who wants to finish second in the class and who wants to finish third yet. Yeah, and uh, long may that continue. I'm, I'm sort of almost ready to look at the uh, trophy to see if they're going to be against each other in the track day trophy as well, because I'm absolutely loving this. They've just been passed by Tony Gillum, and it's slightly spread them apart. But you almost get the impression they'd wait for each other, wouldn't they? Uh, yes, you would. Yeah, yeah. They're having so much fun, yeah. they don't want, either of them don't want to lose out. Freddie Hewitt also with a bit of work to do. He's now got Ronan Quinn's car ahead of him. Freddie Hewitt just outside of the top six in seventh position. We're fast approaching the final 90 seconds of this race as well. But for John Line, all he needs to do is just hang on to where he is, keep Adrian Pottinger behind, and even if Adrian got through, it would still be sufficient for him to lift the, the championship crown. Yeah, already Tony Gillam onto his penultimate tour of this uh, circuit, just coming out of Druids as the uh, key battle for points. John Line comes through. Two more tours 
of this uh, Ken Indy circuit for him to go. Keeping Pottinger behind him, that rapid start wasn't just a flash in the pan, is it? He's done brilliantly to, to maintain that position all the way through to this stage. Fourth place, number 70, the Class C leading car of Robertson Marsh. They've done a great job. Remember, at times, they were sort of nibbling away at the, uh, the cars just ahead of them, the Line and Pottinger cars. They've settled back into a sort of fairly lonely fourth on the road, but with a Class C victory looking good and potentially at least one hand on at the moment, it's not surprising they don't want to get stuck in too much. Fifth is the uh, uh, 44 car of Honeybone, just ahead of Polk is the runner-up in Class C as it stands at the moment. Uh, and yeah, co we've got some more penalties coming up, by the way. 57 picks up a five-second penalty, and seven, Will Arif picks up 10-second penalty now. What a shame for those track limits. So yeah, a real, real shame for, for Will Arif. Uh, didn't heed the warning, uh, but it's still, uh, no doubt, Will will have a big old smile on his face. He'll have enjoyed that little uh, race that he's been having with uh, Rob Burnham. So uh, we'll have to wait and see as to uh, exactly where on corrected times that will put him. So 10 seconds to go. Clock is almost there. This is going to be the final lap. Tony Gullum isn't going to quite get towards the start-finish line before the clock ticks to zero. So out of the final corner. And to receive the chequered flag, it is going to be Tony Gillum and Alex Jones that claim the win in the final race of the season for the MSVT Track Day Championship. Uh, we'll have to wait and see who finishes in second place. John Line was coming under pressure from Adrian Pottinger, but Adrian Pottinger, I think, has picked up a time penalty somewhere, so ultimately it won't happen. So uh, up towards the chequered flag they will come, and John Line's BMW, subject to official confirmation as he goes through now and over the start-finish line. That will be sufficient for him to be crowned the champion for this year. So number 71, John Line, second home. Uh, and third home, Adrian Pottinger, who did pick up a five-second penalty in the closing stages of that one so uh, we've got the car of Justin Roberts and Stefan March finishing in fourth position Ray Honeybone sorry Jordan Honeybone could should come through and finish in fifth place and then Charlie Polk chases him over the line to finish in sixth position so uh, that is it for the MSVT track day championship for this year a few more cars still to take the checkered flag but as ever brilliant battling all the way throughout and for John Line having previously been a runner-up in this championship a couple of years ago for the first time he'll be lifting the championship crown so we should now be able to confirm the results with you for our final race of the season for the MSVT track day championship for 2022 and they look as follows it was a win for Tony Gillam and Alex Jones with John Line in second place but subject to official confirmation that's enough for him to be the champion for this year Adrian Pottinger was there in third position and it was Justin Roberts and Stefan Marsh that finished in fourth place Jordan Honeybone was fifth ahead of Charlie Polk and Freddie Hewitt they had a brilliant battle all the way through and a rather quiet race for Darren Goh who finished in eighth position. Gary Littlewood was there in ninth place and George Jackson from 23rd on the grid finished in 10th place. Ronan Quinn won class D as he finished in 11th, head of Rob Burnham and Will Arif with Ashley and Rob Hornigold in their MGZR finishing in 14th position. In 15th place, it was Darren Robinson. 16th place goes the way of uh, Bonser and then as you can see it was uh, Owen from the lower and DRC car Les Conway finished in 19th position completing the top 20 was car number 177 which was Mick Presland now, the rest of the cars there were all our retirees that we had throughout the course of the race we know of the retirement of the Dumpster and Kemp Clio we saw the Ford Puma of Harry Hardy having its issues but uh, Alistair Eason was the one who retired very very early on in his master at the wheel of that car so uh, the rest of the cars are all making their way back round in towards the pit lane area once more Chris Dawes has made his way down in towards the pits where we're hoping we're going to be able to pick up with some of our drivers in the final track day championship race of the season of course we've got four drivers in those top three positions to try and chat to so it'd be good to chat to our race winners it'd be really good to chat to John Line our champion as well and maybe pick up the thoughts from Adrian Pottinger who had a busy old race I don't think there was any point in that race that Adrian Pottinger at the wheel of his Clio was not either attacking or defending so it's always the case in track day trophy or track day championship there's always somebody to squabble with and that was a great way for them to finish their 2022 championship season. Uh, more racing to come up from the Track Day Trophy later on over the course of the day, of course. We've got Turismo X that we've got to look forward to as well. And that will be coming up shortly because uh, after we've got the Turismo X race out of the way, we'll then be heading towards our 
a lunch break, albeit a rather brief one here at Brands Hatch and the final day of racing in the 2022 championship season. So all of the cars then have trundled their way down the pit lane. The circuit is reasonably clear. I don't think there's many cars to be cleared up by our marshals. So I think everybody is out of harm's way. And I'm hoping Crystal's might be able to pick up with a driver or two down there in the pit lane. So I think what's happened is probably the cars have ended up getting shuffled into Park Ferme and that's why we'll not be able to hear from Chris so they'll have to go through a, uh, a range of technical checks as I mentioned earlier on you know we, we we say John Line is the champion but we always say it, say it's subject to official confirmation because those technical checks have to take place to make sure that the cars are compliant with the regulations in every way that they do match the power to weight ratios that have been registered in the championship and once all of that technical aspect is done only then uh, will the official results be issued and once all the checks and balances have been done then that's when you can officially then crown the champion so i think what's happened is yeah they've all been shuffled into park ferme which might just take a while for them to head towards crystals So I think after a slight delay, we should now be able to hand you downstairs to Chris Dawes, who's managed to catch up with somebody down there. So we're down here in the pits. Unfortunately, I've not been able to get as many of the drivers as I was hoping to be able to get. They've kind of disappeared, but I have been able to get hold of the start driver in the race winning car. It might have been a guest class, but it's great to see the team hard golf out there. So we've managed to get uh, Alex. Congratulations on a great overall race win. You had to work hard to get yourself back in the lead there. I did, but I absolutely enjoyed every minute of it. I done it on purpose, to be honest. I wanted a bit of a, yeah, I wanted a bit of a challenge. So uh, no, it was a good, good race. I really enjoyed it. But yeah, I did have to work quite hard. It looked like it was quite a handful when it was cold. Yeah, definitely. Um, coming out on the, oh, well, going out on the first lap, um, tyres were a bit cold, struggling for grip. But obviously, as second, third built up so yeah I was, I was happy in the end <laughs> yeah as soon as you tamed that bucking bronco you were able to then just pick your way through i mean impressive but you still had to be patient because they didn't need to jump out of your way did they no not really obviously there was quite a few in front of me and stuff um and i just wanted to take my time uh obviously it was a, I had 20 minutes so yeah i just like i said didn't do anything stupid and just concentrated on the race and then you handed over to Tony, who brought, brought it home. He got the yeah. glory bit, didn't he? He did indeed. He always does. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The boss is able to do that, isn't he? But listen, well done. Great victory. Thank you. Cheers. So that is uh, who we've got there. Uh, and uh, the others, I was hoping we catch John Line, but I'm going to have to hand back now because the next race is underway. It's so the Turismo X. So back to Mark Werrell. Thanks a lot, Chris. Yeah, so we're ready to Turismo X are on their formation lap, so it's probably uh, a good idea then to guide you through the grid and the way that they will line up for this, their first of two races that will be taking place here today. And again, the championship is still up for grabs. So uh, the qualifying took place earlier on, and it was Darren Goes in Super Pole that managed to grab a pole position. Dylan Brichter lines up alongside. Row two of the grid is the Honda of Richard Clark and the BMW of Gary Hufford. And row three is the Jamie Hayes and Alex Reed's shared car alongside the Volkswagen Golf of George Wright. On to row four of the grid, it's the Lotus of Al Bull. With, for company, he's got 144, which is Lewis Gatt. Uh, uh, Adam Blair did not do a lap in the Super Bowl session, so he is going to start rather further down than one would have expected on the fifth row of the grid. And alongside him is Sean Andrews and Clive Golf for Volkswagen Golf. And James Owen had problems in qualifying. Let's hope the Audi is fixed indeed. I can see it is there. It will join at the tail end of the field, having had issues in the qualifying session. So this is the first of two races in the Turismo X. Again, it will be a sprint race. 
as has been the format all season. So rather than have longer pit stop races, it's two 20 minute sprint races that we will see. And the championship is still wide open. Adam Blair leads the championship on 295 points coming into this one. Darren Goes, who starts from pole position, is second in the championship on 262. And Dylan Brichter, who lies upon the outside of the front row of the grid, is just a further nine points adrift on 253 championship points. 30 points for a win, 27 for second, 24 for third, and so on. It diminishes from there. Three points for pole position go the way of Darren Goes. There'll be two points going the way of Dylan Brichter because he was second. And one single point will go the way of Richard Clark, who qualified third. You also get points for cars you beat in your class. Points also for the fastest lap as well. So there's plenty of championship points still to tot up over the course of this race and the race that we'll see later on over the course of the day. So the grid is fully formed for the penultimate time this season. We're about to get Turismo X underway with the TCR Audi of Darren Goes on the front row of the grid. Watch out for the rear wheel drive BMW of Gary Hufford, who doesn't get a great start, to be honest, but then through the second phase starts to get going. But Dylan Brichter has had the best start of all. He's going to lead the charge up towards Paddock Hill Bend for the first time with Darren Goes in second place. And now, by the look of things, Gary Hufford trying around the outside of the Honda of Richard Clark and making it stick. So Gary Hufford up into third position. And I think Richard Clark might drop even further down through the order because he's been given a thing or two to think about by George Wright and Adam Blair who was already at the wheel of the number one car the championship leader carved his way through the order remember he did not set a lap in Super Pole a little nudge of the Seat onto the coattails of Gary Hufford there just unstabilizes the BMW and that allows not just Adam Blair to go through but George Wright at the wheel of the Volkswagen Golf sneaks his way through as well However, we have also now had a brief spin, I think, and that brief spin has gone the way of Dylan Brichter, and off also is going George Wright, who nearly deposits the Volkswagen Golf into the gravel trap there. Lots of arm twirling, eventually getting it back under his spell. So again, cold tyres just affecting the cars as over the start-finish line goes Richard Clark, who is indecently quick in a straight line at the wheel of the Honda Civic, carves his way past Gary Hufford rather effortlessly in that respect so picking up the place there so Richard Clark now up into third position so Darren goes leads the way Adam Blair who started ninth up to second by the end of the first lap of the race in the hands of the championship leader again you can just see tyres not fully up to temperature there Adam Blair just taking a couple of little nibbles to try and get the car turned in appropriately in towards Graham Hill Bend Dylan Brichter also looking to try and make progress after his spin at this part of the circuit on the lap prior. So he now gets himself through and ahead of Gary Hufford. So that's up into fourth position for the recovering number two car that lies third in the championship standings, remember. So two laps completed. Darren goes leading the way as they head through Paddock Hill Bend. Further down through the order, squabbles still occurring as the Jamie Hayes and Alex Reed shared say at land Supercopa works its way past the Renault Clio and then you've also got Al Bull's Lotus in the mix as well and Lewis Gatt doing a good job at the wheel of that little Renault Clio actually so that's the squabble towards the tail end of the field for Darren Goes though at the sharp end 17 and a half minutes remaining he leads the way and the lead advantage has now been shrunk because now up into second place comes the charging Richard Clark and there's problems and the problems are for the championship leader Adam Blair all of a sudden slowing out on circuits he comes down towards Surtees and McLaren you can see yellow flags being waved there because he's pulled the car off the circuit or has he? he's only just pulled it off the circuit it's on the very edge of the circuit whatever's happened Adam Blair was hoping I'm sure to limp that car back to the pit lane but it's stopped and it has stopped I would say in a very dangerous place Surtees is a quick corner quick left-hander if you run wide at the exit you are on that curb where Adam Blair has parked that car so I think I know what the outcome of this one is going to be and I think it's going to mean that we're not going to be green flag racing for too much longer Chris uh, no and I mean I just walked up the stairs to the commentary box again as I saw him lose the back end of that th basically where he stopped now and the car was looking very loose and we never found out what the issue was in qualifying did we uh, it wasn't him that lost it Dylan Brichter that spun Oh, was it? Yeah, it was still Brichter ah, that spun. Okay, yeah, sorry. yeah. So, but yeah, whether that is a reoccurrence of whatever happened in qualifying, simply don't know. But that car is, um, it's not in a safe place, that's for sure. Uh, yeah, right on the uh, the apex there of a very fast part of the uh, the circuit. Safety car boards are out now, so safety car is out as you anticipated. They just need to be able to move that. And, and I agree with you because he's gone past the uh, the escape road, hasn't he, to get into the rear of the paddock. So he's yep. obviously hoping he could get in 
or possibly even reset it. What was it we said about the uh, Seats? They're wonderful cars, but they're very highly strung. Yes, absolutely. And this now um, rather blows the championship wide open, doesn't it? Because you you don't count any drop scores. There are no drop rounds ah, in Turismo okay. X. Every single round counts. So all of a sudden, that has blown things wide open for the second race later on today because uh, Adam Blair is not going to be scooping up any points in this one and the likes of Darren Goes at the moment is in the strongest position isn't he because he managed to qualify on pole position so he picked up the three points for that he has so far in this race set the fastest lap of the race so he'll be picking up the extra point for that and he is also potentially on course for a win if he stays where he is so that would really really shuffle the championship order and for Adam Blair that's going to be a tough old pill to swallow at the beginning of the day with another race still to come up later on yeah of course uh, it wouldn't have been him that was having that moment because Adam Blair started on the penultimate row didn't he with whatever the issue was in qualifying that's reared its ugly head yet again sadly uh, I did notice that another one that had an issue was uh, was circulating the Audi TT but that seems to have disappeared now as well uh, can't see it in the train there Ah, it's just circulating at the back now, that's okay, so it's yet to catch up. But that, that stopped very early, didn't it, in qualifying, so it's good to see that, it back out again. That stopped very early in qualifying, no, you're absolutely right. The other car that uh, I think maybe had an issue at the start of the race, but uh, couldn't quite mm. see it, uh, was the number 14 car of Jamie Hayes, because yeah. that seemed to sort of drop down through the order uh, from where it started. It started fifth, it's running seventh at the moment, so that is... Uh, uh, a car that yeah perhaps has had a problem it's showing is Hayes is the surname so I'm guessing Alex Reed will do race number two and it's Jamie Hayes in for this one whereas the other two car uh, two driver car that we've got Sean Andrews and Clive Goldthorpe there's no indication on our screens as to which one of the two it is in this race so we'll stick with uh, with both of the names so the pack is fully formed the uh, trackside recovery team are just in the process of I think having a chat to understand what the issue is with the car and They've sent the 4x4, which suggests that they are fairly confident that just a straight toe to get the car out of harm's way. But what they do need to do is just make sure that all of the pack of cars are past that point before they start to connect it up and drag it out of the way, which they're in the process of doing now. So, unfortunately, the safety car is just about to complete another lap. So it's going to be another lap after this one before we can go green. So let's just run down through the order with you. Under safety car, Darren Goes leads the way. Second is Richard Clark. Third is Dylan Brichter. Fourth is Gary Hufford. Fifth place is George Wright. Sixth place is going to be Jamie Hayes. Seventh place is Al Bull. Eighth place is going to be the Lewis Gatt Renault Clio. Ninth place is Sean Andrews is now being yeah. confirmed <laughs> as the driver of that car. Just spotted it. So Sean Andrews is driving the Volkswagen Golf. Uh, uh, tenth place is going to be James Owen, and that will be the last of our runners now. Mm, this is not the way that uh, Adam Blair would have wanted to go for. He's changed it from number 11 to number one, and uh, that seems to have made the difference for him, sadly. When the number one fell off of his car, he's, uh, he's, he's had a torrid time. It looked fine in qualifying in the, the first qualifying session, though, didn't it? It was absolutely fine, yeah. In the main qualifying session, it was great. And then from Super Bowl onwards, it's sort of gone wrong for him, yeah. hasn't it, in reality? So, um, yeah, a big old shame for him. Now, safety car lights are out at this stage, so we're going to get this race back underway. Darren goes the number 22 car, that Audi RS3 TCR, that wonderful black and metallic green. And uh, he's decided to go already. Has he got the timing right on this? He's just applied the brakes as he goes through the tighter parts of this. He's going to get this absolutely right. He's gone earlier than I've seen for a long time, Mark. And he's got the timing absolutely right. That brilliant restart, wasn't it, from Darren Goes. Look at the advantage he's already built up between himself and the rather lethargic restart by comparison of Richard Clark, who at the wheel of the Honda is heading round through Paddock Hill Bend. Now, Dylan Brichter is there in third place. We've got Gary Hufford, Jack Wright, uh, and then the next of the cars is going to be Jamie Hayes. So I think, yeah, the Wrights have now confirmed it. It was down as being just George driving, but now it's showing as being Jack Wright that's driving the car. Is that right? Yeah. It, George was the only one entered on the entry sheet that I got. The fact they've deliberately put the J. They put a J there now. Yeah, we'll stick with it. Stick with what it says. Yeah. 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 Um, he was obviously just suddenly available at the 11th. <laughs> hour 
they couldn't say no. So, uh, yeah. Oh, and going straight on there is the uh, the grey and yellow 46 car of uh, Jack Wright. Uh, across the grass there. It's not looking comfortable, that car, is it? It's as if it's got a puncture or something. It has been a troubled car all season, that car. It's uh, one that they've got at the beginning of the year, and it's been... Um, yeah, difficult. It's been like a petulant teenager, as that car. And uh, he's not gone into the pits, interestingly. So he feels that he can shake it off, clear its throat, and get going again. He's just weaving it down the straight just to sort of see how it feels. So it's clearly not a puncture, but something looked very unsettled on it, didn't it? It did. Yeah, it uh, it didn't look great through there on the first lap, and I put that down to cold tyres. But that looked very similar in that the car just didn't want to do what the driver wanted it to do. So, yeah, very unusual indeed. So bit of a, a weave from side to side down the start finish line just to try and understand what the car's doing and is it going to spit you off or was it just something that it might have run over on the track that caused the difficulty we'll have to wait and see uh, back to the fight for second and third though uh, Richard Clark with his slightly slower restart means that he's into the clutches of Dylan Brickter to a degree so over the start finish line now come but the one good thing for that Honda crumbs it's quick in a straight line crumbs isn't it just uh, but Brichter, of course, having started on the front row with that moment, that hairy moment on the uh, the opening lap. Look at this, we're suddenly going three wide, sorry, onto the start finish straight, uh, which was the one that held their breath out. I think that was the, uh, the, the, it says 27 on it, it's 127 on the screen, but Andrew's at the wheel of that one, basically just held his breath as he was filling in this, a rather tight sandwich through uh, Clark Curve then. Yeah, he got Lewis Gap to drive us right, he got Jack Wright to drive us uh, to, to the opposite side, so yeah, good stuff between that one. Now Sean Andrews breaks very, very late indeed, sneaks up the inside of Lewis Gat. Uh, so place gain there for the car of Sean Andrews. I notice it does say 27 and 127 on the side. Oh, it says both. It actually says say both. Yeah. Ah, okay. That means it's covered his bets then, because it does appear in other races later, doesn't it, with the different numbers. That uh, obviously got a bit too tight through Clark Curve, judging by the, uh, the, the, the smoke coming off of the back of that car. That does look more like bodywork, doesn't it? Yeah, it looks like tyre rub, doesn't it, on that front corner. Let's just have a quick look. No obvious signs of, of anything. But there's definitely smoke, wasn't there, billowing from the front left-hand side of that Renault Clio as it went down the Cooper Strait. But by the time it goes down the Brabham Strait, it seems to have cleared itself. Well, fingers crossed. You hope that it's the bodywork that burns away rather than the rubber that it's uh, it's touching. And it seems to have been the uh, the former that at the moment he's getting away with. So carries on through. Already Darren goes making his way on to complete yet another lap. This will be 11 in the book with still just over eight and a half minutes left to go in this first of two Turismo X races. Uh, but the real fight still looks like could be taking shape between second and third. Across the line they go. It's the 66 Honda Civic of Richard Clark holding on to second, but Brickter, the number two car, front row started, towed his wild ride on the opening lap, coming back through this field, and he's just patiently bringing him back in. Sadly, the 144 car has decided enough's enough, it doesn't feel right. And he's exiting through the uh, the rear entrance to the uh, to the pit lane there. Yeah, shame that for Lewis Gatt. So that's another one that we have lost. We've got some back marker Lapry now going on as James Owens' Audi TT is passed by the race leader, then by Richard Clark, followed by Dylan Brichter. So he'll be staying neatly and tidily out of harm's way. But for Darren Goes, this is all going beautifully well as far as he is concerned uh, uh, for the championship because whilst he would never wish any bad luck on Adam Blair, you'll take it when it happens, won't you? Uh, of course, because, uh, you know, what goes around comes around invariably. And you've got to take the good luck when it comes your way. doesn't mean you gloat about it, but, of course, he's just going to be, uh, you know, getting a good haul of points coming through this one. I was just trying to grab to see what difference it actually makes, literally. I oh, know you're relying well, on there, me to do there was, that. There was 33 <laughs> points between them at the beginning of this race. All rounds count. At the moment, Darren Goes is on for 30 points for the race win, plus the three points for pole position, plus the extra point for fastest lap, plus uh, a point for every person he beats in Class S, which will be one, two, three, and will be four cars, because Blair did take the race start. Yep. So an extra four points there. So he's going to be in the lead of the championship. Wow, so he's going to go with one last run later today. Uh, for the whole of the 2022 season. He's going to have got himself into the lead, but not by an awful lot. Only by about three or four points, yeah, wow. something like that. Not a lot in it, no. Not a lot in it, so we'll have to wait and see.
And you of couldn't course, script that, could you? Let's no, no. And there are less points on offer for race two, you could argue, because you don't get the extra points for pole position that you'd get for race one. Yeah, so yeah. I think that's the way it works, because you, you get the points for fastest lap, so you can't have them twice. And, and I'm not surprised by this, because I said to you when we got to uh, even qualifying, the main qualifying session, is that he came out quite far down in the, in the, in the queue out of the pit lane, but he then was like making really damn buster moves to get himself up to the front of the field in that qualifying. It made no difference, there's no points up for grab, but he wanted a clear track, he got it, and he's just been on a mission ever since we first saw him on track this morning. Uh, on a mission at the moment is Dylan Brichter as well in second place, because he's catching up with the Honda of uh, Richard Clark. But as I said earlier on, that Honda is just so quick in a straight line at the Seat, which isn't um, an underpowered car, just runs out of puff. They are all in the same class as well, so it's Class S cars first, second and third at the moment. The first of the non-Class S cars is Gary Hufford, who runs in Class X, the most powerful class. He's in fourth position, the way things currently are. Your other class leaders are uh, leading Class G is Al Bull at the wheel of the Lotus. He's in the guest class, and leading Class B is Sean Andrews at the wheel of his Volkswagen Golf. So, they're still working, oh, by the way. On and, class, and Class A, Jack Wright, of course. Forgot that of one. course, yeah. Uh, and yes, the uh, Team R crew are still working on uh, Blair's car down there. Of course, they want to try and get that sorted for race number two, which doesn't mean, don't rule out, he might suddenly sneak out for a lap or so at the end of this just to make sure it's OK. Darren Goes goes through and completes 15 laps, but this race for second, uh, second place between Clark and Brichter, 66 and 20, uh, 66 and 2, is uh, absolutely alive. The uh, the temperature will be firmly in these uh, powerful cars now, and the tyres, the brakes, everything's going to be okay despite the cold temperatures we've got there, ambient and track-wise. But uh, now Dylan Brichter, he's got the confidence in that car again. He's reeled in patiently onto the back of that Civic and the 66 car of Clark. He's, I wouldn't say he's going defensive yet, though, Mark, is he? No, uh, not as yet, because um, I don't think Dylan Brichter is quite close enough and. For Richard Clark, all he needs to do is just make sure, particularly this part of the circuit that they're coming to now, which is round through Clearways Corner, he's just cleanly off that because his car has the straight line speed advantage. So look at how close that gap is at the start of the straight compared to how big it is at the end of the straight. Now you can just see he starts to edge away, doesn't he? And then by the time you get towards Paddock Hill Bend again, he breaks that little bit earlier because he's carrying more speed. Uh, maybe isn't quite as confident on the brakes and Dylan Brichter starts to close back up again through the twiddly bits. Still wonderful just watching on the, uh, the stream there, watching the way these cars handle around these corners. They just look... Uh, just wonderful pieces of kit, don't they? As they, they go round this undulating indie, car, uh, indie circuit here at Brands Hatch. And Brichter closes right onto the back of Clark as they come down the hill, throw the anchors out the back for the left-hander of Graham Hill Bend onto the Cooper straight. They've got back markers they're going to be encountering fairly soon. Thankfully, they are split apart. Uh, the bad news is it's Lapry of Lapry ahead of them. And Darren Goes has already got through with three minutes, 20 left to go on the clock. Darren goes, goes through, and that's 17 laps completed. And are we going to see Clark manage to get past the uh, 127 car of Andrews? Yes, Richter doesn't manage to do it just yet. That's split them apart a little bit. Yeah, he's going to have to wait. He'll get past Sean Andrews on the exit of Paddock Hill Bend. So he manages to do so. There's then the further traffic just up the road, which is James Owen's Audi to deal with, and they both get past that on the run-up towards Druids. So the gap that had opened up very briefly through the traffic is now back down to exactly what it was again through there. So nose to tail, they will head round through Graham Hill Bend. Darren goes is on lap number 18, the way things currently stand. There are two and three-quarter minutes to go. The best of the battles is still for second and for third position with Richard Clark, who lies sixth in the championship standings coming into this one, uh, managing to fight off Dylan Brichter, who is, of course, third in the championship standings. Uh, as I predicted, the number one car of Adam Blair has gone back out to the circuit, so circulating in last place about 12, 13 laps down, but just trying to make sure that car is OK for race number two because that is what his championship will hinge on. He's going to have lost the lead by our, uh, our maths... I say our, your maths. Uh, I took credit with <laughs> you then, didn't I? You did. Uh, <laughs> and... Uh, yeah, so he's just going to make sure that he can at least give it his all, even if it's going to be a challenge from further down this grid. But we're now down to less than two minutes remaining in this race. Darren goes, knit, goes over six and a quarter seconds clear of the rest of the field. And that rest of the field is headed by these two that are involved in their own fight. That means 
it's not likely to be closed in on, to be fair. They're so focused on their own fight, understandably. And Clark is still holding on to it. Richter still there. Every tiny little mistake that we get from Clark, and it's not even fair to call him a mistake. It's nothing significant. But all of a sudden, you see Richter see just closing right onto the back of that Civic. I think there'll be five points between them. So I think uh, Darren Goes will take over the championship lead by five championship points, if I've got the maths. Just very quickly scribbling down then. Right, I think I've added them all in. Uh, yeah, I think so, with there or thereabouts. Um, oh, no, no, there's another an another thing that I need to try and factor in as well. So, yes, we'll have to wait and see. It might be, it, it might be six points between them, because uh, the regulations <laughs> also give you an extra point for each competitor beaten in a higher class up to a maximum of five and of course Darren Goes is beating Gary Hufford who's in a higher class so we pick up an extra point for that as well so yeah there'll be six points between them goodness me right okay <laughs> so it's 30 30 plus three plus one plus four plus one there you go Darren Goes is clearly backed off now because that margin is coming down visibly as well as uh, on the clock but they go on to their final tour and uh, Darren Goes is down to three and a half seconds I am assuming that he's choosing to take this in e easy rather than being a, a, a problem but it also looks like third place Brichter has just dropped away from the 66th uh, Civic of Clark yeah so Darren Goes let's hope there's no cause for concern whatsoever we're into the final few seconds of this race so Darren Goes is on to his last lap of the race turns his way through Graham Hill Bend accelerates his way down the straight, and that car is struggling now. I think Darren goes really? all of a sudden. Has he realized that Richard Clark is closing a little bit quicker than maybe he thought? So, I think, yeah, first part of the lap was being taken easy by Darren goes. Second part of the lap, yeah, all of a sudden he's realized he needs to get the hurry up here. So, he's just about got enough in hand. So, Darren goes comes out of the final corner. The checkered flag is being readied. It's going to be a win in the penultimate round of Turismo X 2022 for Darren goes who picks up the championship lead in the process. Uh, Richard Clark comes through to finish in second place with Dylan Brick in third place that won't do his championship hopes any harm uh, either uh, we'll wait for the fourth place car to come through which is going to be the winner of class x which is gary hufford in the bmw so he takes the checkered flag now and then it will be jamie hayes who should be next through after the lapped car of um, what is sean andrews goes through so that will be the car in class b that takes the checkered flag there is now over the start finish line the fifth place car of Jamie Hayes. Uh, sixth place should be George Wright. Oh, sorry, Jack Wright. I should say Jack Wright who took over that car. We were expecting it just to be George, but Jack is showing us the name uh, for this one. Uh, good to see that Adam Blair did get to the checkered flag, albeit, yeah, was something like 12 laps adrift in the end at the wheel of his Seat Leon. So uh, I think that's uh, pretty much everybody to take the checkered flag now, or, albeit has James Owen come through yet at the wheel of the Audi? Um, yes, he has. So we've got everybody through. Uh, so Darren goes, you see, is flashing his lights and waving to the marshals and the crowd as he works his way around on the slowing down lap. He'll be as pleased as punch with that one, not just because of the race win, because of what it will do for his championship tally and he could be the champion by the end of the day we'll have to wait and see so let's just confirm the results for you the win goes the way of Darren Goes from Richard Clark and Dylan Brichter Gary Hufford won his class class X and was there in fourth place overall with Jamie Hayes completing the top five and Jack Wright winning class A in sixth position Al Bull was there in seventh place with the, the car of Sean Andrews in eighth place James Owen was the last of the finishers in ninth place because unfortunately we lost um, very early on into the race Lewis Gatt at the wheel of his Renault Clio and Adam Blair may not be classified as a finisher we'll have to wait and see when the official results were issued but he was back out circulating at the end of the race but of course he lost 12 laps whilst they were repairing his car so Chris Dawes has again made it downstairs to try and chat to some of our drivers from Turismo X in what is the last race prior to our lunch break here at Brands Hatch but it will be a very short lunch break uh, if you are tuning in on the stream don't go too far if you're here at the circuit very quickly head to the Kentigan and grab yourself some food or refreshments or get in the warmth for a period of time because um, uh, time check now it is 20 past one we are bang on timetable and we are due to go racing again at 20 to 2 so it's only a 20 minute lunch break that is being scheduled so um, not much respite for competitors for officials or for marshals on this final weekend of racing here at Brands Hatch in 2022 looking forward already to the start of the 2023 championship season say so Chris Dawes is hopefully going to try and grab a word 
would, would certainly with Darren Goes, it'd be really good to hear from Darren Goes because say, if I've got the maths right, I think he's taken over the championship lead by what will be six championship points. I will recheck the maths over the course of the lunch break because it's important that we know that when we head into what will be the final race of the championship season later on this afternoon and of course for Darren Goes it doesn't just stop here with this race uh, and then one race later on he's also been out in track day trophy track day championship so he's a busy man over the course of uh, this final weekend of racing so I think again the drivers have been brought in towards Park Ferme which does mean that again we'll have a, a slight delay I can see that is that Darren Goes's car now is trundling its way down the pit lane so yeah they've been brought into Park Ferme for some technical checks and whilst our cameraman and Chris Dawes are waiting down at the opposite end of the pit lane Darren Goes is now trundling the Audi TCR car down the pit lane and hopefully we'll be able to hear from our race winner very very shortly because I say not only is he the race winner he is now also the leader of the championship heading into the very last race of the season and they are scheduled to be back out on circuit Turismo X at around about quarter past three this afternoon there or thereabouts so Darren Goes pulls up right the way down at the bottom of pit lane at pit lane exit end which uh, hopefully now means that we'll be able to grab a quick word with him once he's out of the car he'll have had his no doubt his crash helmet and hands device and everything else taken off already and then um, once he just hops out of the car and make sure that it doesn't trickle down the pit lane whilst he's out there chatting. We can chat to our driver who is going to be down there with Chris Dawes for a very quick conversation. So just awaiting final confirmation that we're ready to hand downstairs for our interview. And then we can hopefully send you downstairs to Chris Dawes, who is there with Darren Goes. Welcome back down here to the pit lane where the drivers have, uh, they, they weren't supposed to be stopped, but they were stopped at the far end. But we've managed to get, certainly the top two are down here with me. Darren goes, he's out of the car, but he's still got his helmet on. Come on, Darren, come and have a word, mate. You, you take it, you leaving it on? I'll leave it on. Leave it on for now. Uh, I mean, Darren, you come into this final weekend with the championship there for you to be able to retake the lead. We believe you've now taken the lead in that going into one more race i mean you just you're doing everything you need to do yeah um it's always the way i mean brands hatch always throws out nice surprises uh, it, fortunately it's very dry today which is nice uh, and the car does perform well in the dry this morning it was quite greasy um, yeah, and I, I only just got super pole so let's hope it stays out for this evening i think it's going to be quite dark this evening uh, well yeah quite i mean it's getting darker now and uh, there might be a few of your competitors doing rain dances yeah. right now but <laughs> i mean you could tell from the get-go this morning you meant business you you were a bit further down the queue to get out but you wrestled your way to the front of the pack to get your laps in you got the thing done as quick as possible in super pole you made sure even i mean that restart was brilliant i've never seen anyone go quite so early it's just, you you're on a mission yeah it, like i say we've got everything to play for um we're even fighting for second so i know adam finished towards the back but coming into this round there was only three points between us and second as well yeah. so it's all to play for well, we can't wait. It really builds up for that final race, doesn't it? Brilliant. Yeah, absolutely. Looking forward to it. So are we. Good luck. Well done. Congratulations. Right, well, let's jump back here to the 66 car. Richard Clark, the Honda Civic. Richard. Richard, <laughs> you look like you're taking a breather there. I mean, I'm not surprised. The, the, the fight, the defence you had to put on was just incredible, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, it was, uh, it was good. I had, it, I had the better of him on the straight, but he sort of was getting me on the, on the corners. So... Um, but yeah, yeah, it was. I was most, spent most of the time not looking at Darren. I was just looking behind. So uh, yeah, no, it was a good race, exciting. It really was. I mean, we spotted though. You, you quite got into a stage where you had to go defensive, no, did you? No, no, no. I just had. A, I knew I had just enough. I was just trying to not make mistakes. Which, when you think <laughs> about it, that's when you make mistakes. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> so uh, all good. Yeah. Thanks. Well, well done. Great second yeah. place. Thank you. Thank you. Cracking job there, Dylan Brichter, the number two car. He's just uh, checking bits and pieces. They don't like taking their helmets off, these guys, do they? They, they prefer to leave them on. Uh, Dylan, congratulations on the, uh, the third place. I mean, uh, pick it up first of all, that Toadie's Wild Ride on lap one. Oh, such a good start. I had such a good start. And I thought, all right, maybe I can hold on to this and just uh, defend from here on in. And then, yeah, I just dropped it with cold tyres into uh, 30s and clearways. So 
uh, to actually come away a close third is not too bad, I guess, by the end of it. So uh, it could have been a lot worse. <laughs> it certainly felt a lot worse when I was going around. So, um, but yeah, that's so frustrating. But um, yeah, I had decent pace after that. So, but just not enough on the straights to, to get past the Civic. So, what does that then give you in your head for race number two? Well, I think the leader in the championship failed to score any points just now. So that closes Darren up, it closes myself up. So uh, it makes race two more important for us all. Um, but if I can do that start again, we're going to be OK, I think. But I just need to, to get those tires in the, in the window first before starting to push. Which doesn't look easy. No, it, yeah, always doing a race in November is going to be difficult to get the, the temperature up. Um, so you can't treat it like, you know, in the summer. But, um, yeah, I'll certainly have that in mind uh, going into the next race. Good luck and well done. Thank you. So there we go. Oh, let's, uh, we've got a few others to grab here. Uh, we've got the, the 127 slash 27. Sean? Yes. Sean Andrews. Uh, you started in that one. That, at some stages, that was a rather busy race. I mean, we watched the three wide coming through Clark Curve and we all held our breath. Yes, um, me too. Yes. <laughs> did you shut your eyes like I did as well? Yeah, yeah. yeah, that was very wise. It's OK for us to, not you, though. Oh, I didn't read that bit in the driver's briefing. <laughs> So, so it was exciting. It was, it was a great race. I really enjoyed it. I had no expectations at all. We had a big accident. The whole uh, side of the car was stoved in yesterday and the front written off. Oh, wow. And the guys worked so hard to rebuild it. We just got out at the end of the last session yesterday afternoon. And the car felt great. It's straight at least. Um, and I didn't really expect anything today. So I was just enjoying myself. And I think there must have been people drop out. I, I, I didn't pass too many people. So, uh, but it was it was great fun. I really enjoyed it. So did we. So well done. Congratulations. Thank you. So that was the uh, the one two seven, the uh, the class B winning car. Let's have a look. Who else have we got here? The class X winning car. We've got a lot of noise in the background of the garages there. We've got Gary Hufford. Where's Gary? Ah, there he is. Gary. Uh, great class win there and uh, congratulations. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's right. There's only one person in this class. Hey, don't worry about that. You had to finish, <laughs> mate. Had... And in fairness, at one point, I mean, uh, I think it was with Dylan Brichter when he was fighting his way back through. You two, proper yeah. elbows out. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, we had a bit of a tussle. The rest of the race was a bit boring, really. I was just going around on my own, but yeah, it was all right. It was quite good. Well, well done. Great job to see. Congratulations. Oh, there we go. Oh, I tell you what, I do want to grab a quick word. It's our championship leader. I want to be able to find out what on earth has happened with our championship leader. I'm going to see if I can... No, I'm going to boof it. Sorry. Adam, while you're still... Do... See if you can multitask now. Can you focus as you're steering? What happened? Uh, so the car just completely cut out. It changed down gear by itself. So I was trying to reset the gearbox, um, and then the engine completely died. Couldn't get back to the pits. And I just said to the boys, I need to finish this race. I just need to finish it for the championship, and they got it going. I'm so... Wow. I'm so Is impressed. That, with that the same problem from Super Bowl as well? Uh, I don't know. I doubt it. I think it's different, actually. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, let's hope you have a lucky uh, lunch break then. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it, yeah. See you later. Well done. So there you go. That was our championship leader. I uh, shut the door off. Don't, wasn't born in a barn. Uh, find out what's happened. So they're not sure by the looks of that, and we'll have to wait and see how that one's going to turn out for the race a little bit later. But... That's it from down here. That takes us into our lunch break now. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure might, whether I'm throwing up to Mark that's going to take us into the lunch or whether we're just going to fade out now and going to grab some lunch now, ready to start the afternoon's action. But for me down here in the pit lane, we'll see you later. Thanks, Chris. Yep, so that is it for the moment. So if you're here at the circuit, uh, go and grab some refreshments at the Kensington and uh, wrap up warm, ready for this afternoon's racing. If you've joined us on the live stream, stick the kettle on and be back with us very shortly. So from Chris Dawes, myself and everybody from Alpha Live, thanks for joining us for this morning's activities from Brands Hatch. We'll be back with you very shortly. Goodbye.
Well, uh, welcome back, everybody, to Brands Hatch for what was a very brief respite from the racing, to say the least. So as soon as you've started to unpack your sandwiches, we're back racing this afternoon. So apologies, it was a very quick turnaround for uh, for everybody to uh, to make sure that we're ready to go for this afternoon's racing, particularly this time of year, of course, because we do lose the light that much earlier. And already we know that come the Enduro KA qualifying later on, that's going to start in daylight and it will be dark by the time we've got that qualifying done. But we've still got, even before we get to that point, we've still got three further races to come this afternoon the first of which is for the msvt track day trophy which is just on the grid now chris Dawes joining me in the commentary box myself mark Werrell, to guide you through all of the action over the course of this afternoon so uh, track day trophy is beginning to form up on the grid albeit there we've got the first four rows out and then everybody sort of stopped and nobody else has appeared subsequently one thing i do notice though is that the car that's scheduled to start on the outside of the front row of the grid is not there at the moment, which is Adrian Pottinger. So we'll have to wait and see as to whether he appears or not. Now, his car did run in the MSVT Track Day Championship earlier on today. It finished uh, third on the road and didn't have any obvious signs of any damage or mechanical woes or gremlins. So I'm, I'm somewhat surprised that the car isn't there. But as we say, it's been such a quick turnaround from last race before lunch to this first race after lunch just a 20 minute lunch break for all of our marshals and officials and they're straight back on it again immediately so maybe that is why unique racing haven't quite been able to turn the car around in time um, albeit you know other cars that are prepared by unique racing are there on the grid i can see charlie polk's car is there on the fourth row of the grid the red and black renault clio on row number four so that's there Quite why the sister car to it, I don't know. So they're still filing out. The grid is still being formed up. This is just purely a series of races. There are no championship points to have to worry about for this one. So this is just a, a one-off race. Winner takes the spoils in reality. And uh, the track day trophy is a, is a very affordable way of going racing. No motor racing is cheap, but you look at the variety and the costs of some of the cars on the grid then certainly, you know, if you pick up uh, a used car for four, five, six, seven, eight grand, uh, and then, uh, uh, and then, uh, with the, share the costs of, of running that with with two people because it's a 45-minute race uh, and therefore two drivers can race in it. Then it is a, a fairly affordable way of going racing, and it is a very friendly series as well. Uh, it's a 45-minute race. There is a pit window that opens between the 15th and the 30th minute of the race. And during that middle 15 minutes of the race, all of the cars from when they come into the pit lane to leave the pit lane have to be in the pit lane area conducting their pit stop for two minutes. So you break the beam on the way in, you break the beam on the way out. That cannot be any shorter than 120 seconds. If it is, you pick up a penalty. If it is longer than 120 seconds, you're fine, off you go. And during that period of time, if it's a solo driver, they can remain behind the wheel of the car, the, grab a quick drink, talk to the engineers who will be adjusting your tyre pressures. But of course, if you are a two-driver team, that is the period of time where not only have you got all that to do, you've got to try and uh, swap your drivers over as well. Uh, Adrian Pottiger is there. He was almost the last to appear on the grid, so he's trundling his way down the grass at the moment, trying to pick up into his respective position. So here he comes along the grass with one of our marshals and sprinting almost to try and guide him through and weave him round through the traffic. So he weaves through and is now able to take up his position on the outside of the front row of the grid. And I think they're all there. Is one gap further back where, alongside Rob Burnham, by the look of things, where Oliver Owen should have been. But we know that Ollie Owen was tangled up in an incident earlier on today. So I'm not surprised that his Renault Clio is not out. So, yeah, there you can see the orange Ford Fiesta. And there's a gap on the grid, isn't there, alongside him. And there's another gap further back as well which is where we should have had, I think, Kevin Bottomley, maybe. There's certainly a couple of gaps on the grid. We'll have to try and work that one out. Number eight, Mark Russell's missing as well. Uh, where should he be? Oh, yes, well, he w yes, sorry, he, he will be missing, yes, because, of course, he was also tangled up in that incident earlier on, wasn't he? So, yes. That's another one. Thank you, Chris, for that. So, red lights are on. There's no green flag left for these one. We're off and straight away. And by the look of things, it's not a bad start from Stuart Donovan from pole position. Uh, Adrian Potter is slightly slower away. He now needs to try and close the door, if he can, on the Alex and Dan Reed Volkswagen Golf to prevent that from sneaking up the inside as they go round through 
had a kill bend, but no, he can't do that. So the golf goes through into second place, and Adrian Pottinger might lose third as well, as it was a good start from the Jeremy Evans and Phil Hunt Honda Civic Type R that is looking to try and take up third place, and indeed has done as they head round through Druids for the first time. So really, really good start from Stuart Donovan, the Toyota Celica that qualified on pole position just 33 thousandths of a second quicker than anybody, but is now under huge, huge pressure from the Reeds Volkswagen Golf that picks up the lead of the race. So Alex and Dan Reed sharing the Volkswagen Golf. They go through to lead the way, and now by the look of things, the pole sitter might even be down into third place as the Semprini Racing Jeremy Hunt car goes through off at the end and into the barriers at the end of the Cooper Strait. I'm afraid that we've lost one of the Mazda MX-5s, and that looks like it was the Coombs, the Andy and Jay Coombs car that's off into the barriers and has got front left suspension damage. Oof, and he's not happy, is he? Wow, I mean, it was certainly looking very uh, fraught out there, wasn't it? They were trying to go three or four wide at multiple locations, and uh, I was sort of holding my breath as they were coming down. The car that must have been involved, 114, is just there crabbing down the start-finish straight. And, uh, well, certainly at that stage it was as it came past us. But the leaders are already not really caring. Uh, they're heading down towards Graham Hill Band already, about to get to that yellow flag zone. And it means that uh, the Reeds Golf 148 still comfortably sat in the lead. And then it's the 37 and 112 cars, the Evans and Hart and the Donovan uh, Salika, that uh, are, are sort of fallen away already from the Golf, haven't they? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so we're still just covering that incident with localised yellows at the moment. So uh, the Reeds Volkswagen Golf leading the way at this stage. The Jeremy Evans and Phil Hart Honda Civic. Big, big, big sideways moment for a Honda Civic there that was just heading round through shot and was able to gather it all up. I think that was the Jamin Shrupchelski's car that uh, almost had a moment there, but yeah, gathered it up with a bit of arm twirling. So it's uh, uh, all looking fine again as it heads over the start finish line <laughs> and is circulating in ninth position. The scary thing is, he nearly went into the side of that TT that was on the outside. It was outside of him as he drifted away from the inside of the circuit with that uh, squirrely moment but uh, thankfully they got away with that didn't they uh, did notice that uh, the stricken car was uh, waving fists it looked like it was to the uh, the 25 the bright orange fiesta of burnham and i wonder whether burnham maybe missed a gear because when he finished the race earlier the track day championship he was saying downstairs that he was having a problem with one of the gears it just wasn't going into properly so i wonder whether maybe that happened and it just caused a bit of a concertina effect. yeah it's maybe a damaged sink or something on it so yeah it's just affecting that that one um, yeah still um, gesticulation going on so still um, somewhat aggrieved is uh, the uh, the Andy and Jay Coombs uh, Mazda MX-5 safety car coming out uh, not unsurprising because of the position that that car is in you know we can't have marshals going out there to try and push that out of harm's way whilst the uh, cars are still racing so the BMW safety car is out there and it will pick up the pack for this one let's just have a quick look again at the incident so look towards the Mazda MX-5 Oh, that looked like it was the Renault Clio that um, had the little bit of contact with that maybe just tagged him in the rear and pushed him into the barriers. So not quite sure whether that was. Yeah, I think it was the number 43 Renault Clio, which was the Hurrells, Joe and Trevor Hurrell. Now, that's what it looked like on that replay. And they were directly behind them on the grid. Ah, OK. That right. Makes sense. And it, it, as as the contact was made, it unsettled the Mazda and pitched him across the nose of Rob Burnham's car. Right. So okay, I think that was what you yeah. saw. Yeah. So that was a, a well done to our camera team for, for picking up that one. It just looked like there was a little bit I, of contact that caused which it. Which makes me wonder whether it's a mistaken identity as well then, because uh, Coombs was uh, waving his fist and it certainly looked like it was aimed towards the orange Fiesta. So I think he now <laughs> wrongly thinks that it was uh, it was Burnham that uh, that caused that. Uh, but unless you're down there, you know, that's only me trying to, to you know try to roughly very quickly see what was going on. All of these cars tend to have in, uh, onboard cameras and, uh, and therefore... Um, the officials get the opportunity to review the footage as do the drivers as well but um, the one good thing is uh, and it's always a good thing is that the driver's out he's absolutely fine and the car will be moved out of harm's way and we'll get racing back underway very very shortly indeed so the clock is still continuing to tick whilst all of this is going on we've now got 40 minutes of the race remaining remember that pit window doesn't open though until we are 15 minutes into the race yeah, so we've got a uh, full, what's that, 10 minutes left before we get anywhere near that pit lane, a uh, uh, pit window opening. And then, of course, it's their call as to when they decide the right time to do it. Flatbed has arrived to pick up the stricken Mercedes, so they've obviously decided it can't be towed. 
I think there was one of the corners was at a jaunty angle, so they're going to have to uh, get it up onto the flatbed, move it out of the way. The problem with that, Mark, is that absolutely it had to be safety car. That's right at the end of the uh, the Cooper straight when they're uh, absolutely flying in a straight line. If they got it wrong down there, they'd just be aiming straight at it, wouldn't they? Yeah, see, and the marshals can't push it out of the way because it's got that broken suspension. We've got a bit of debris on the track as well that we just need to try and see whether we can sort out as well. That looks like a lens or a, a light fitting that has uh, come adrift from somebody. So uh, one of our marshals in a gap in the traffic I'm sure we'll uh, dash out and quickly pick that up and get it out of harm's way whilst the recovery is going on yeah there's still gesticulation going on and you're right that was towards Rob Burnham so yeah, yeah. mistaken yeah. identity by the looks I think of it. it is yeah purely because is. as you say it sounded like somebody else tapped his corner that Tep put him across side the the front of the uh, the Fiesta he's then seen that Fiesta that he's along the nose of and uh, assumed that it was him that did the whole thing yeah 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 so the good news is they'll be able to watch the replay back themselves. They yeah, will be able to have a conversation about it. I think I think there's no doubt that a conversation is going to go on. I think, I think that's a given, isn't it, at this stage? Yes. Um, but I'm sure it wouldn't have been an enjoyable but, moment because it would have been quick. But hopefully adrenaline will have just sort of come down a little bit from there. <laughs> so let's, let's just hope so. Let's just hope so. Um, so, yeah, let's uh, just guide you through the order then at this stage. You can see uh, on the left of your screens, if you're watching the stream, it's the Reeds and their Volkswagen Golf that leads the way, which is Alex and Dan Reed. Uh, second is the Semprini Racing Honda Civic that Jeremy Evans shares with Phil Hart. And third at this stage is going to be Stuart Donovan, the pole sitter, who is third at the wheel of number 112. Fourth is 89, which is Adrian Pottinger. Fifth is the Peugeot 205 GTI of Alex Di Donato. And completing the top six at the moment is another Toyota. It's Wayne Cockrell that completes the top six the way things stand at this stage. In seventh place, it's number 41, which is Michael Rawlings. Eighth position is number 23, which is going to be Tim Evans and Andrew Schofield with their Audi TT. Uh, ninth position is number 88, which is Damien Shrupchalski. And then completing the top 10 at this stage is car number 127, your mate, Sean Andrews, who you spoke to after Turismo X, who's partnered up with Clive Goldthorpe in the golf again. Yeah, and it was amazing to hear the story that yesterday the whole side of that car was stoked in, yet you'd have no idea looking at it that there was anything that happened to it. Yeah, team did a really good job. Yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm pleased he, he mentioned that because... I was the same as you. Yeah. I was gobsmacked when he said it. I mean, no way of telling. Uh, you'd kind of almost assume it'd be a bit Trigger's broom. Yeah, we wrote a car off yesterday. This is a different one. That, that I would understand. But it's like, no, they repaired it. Incredible job. And clearly uh, performing well. But you could almost sense that they went into it with a degree of unknown how it was going to perform for them. But it's going great. And they're getting, <laughs> they're getting plenty of uh, bang for their buck out of that car now as well, aren't they? Uh, they do, yeah. I mean, you think they, they can run that car in the Track Day Championship, in the Track Day Trophy and Turismo X because of the spec it's in. Yeah. Shell, which in normal weekends would be uh, a little bit more palatable, wouldn't it? Because you'd, yeah, you'd spread it over two days. Same, yeah, yeah. <laughs> all, all three on one day. Yeah, gluttons for punishment, yes. absolutely. And he still looked like a spring chicken when I interviewed him as well. <laughs> So uh, lights are still on on a safety car, which suggests that we're going to get at least one further lap, and that's not surprising because the breakdown truck is still at the side of the circuit trying to scoop up errant things. What have you just spotted? The, the driver's just not letting it go. He's just abusing Bur uh, Burnham every time he goes past. <laughs> He's, with all the hand gesticulations, the, uh, whichever of the coons it is that's down there, he is uh, gesticulating still every single time he goes past. So uh, still frustrated, understandably. Maybe a, a, a coffee to calm the nerves. Um, that might be the order of the day. So uh, the trackside recovery unit is just about to, I think, leave the grass now. The mechanic just making sure that the Mazda MX-5 is appropriately strapped down on the flatbed and is going to dive into the cab. The safety car is just coming down through Graham Hill Bend and onto the Cooper Straight. So if we can get the recovery truck out of harm's way, and if it's on the move, this potentially could be the last lap behind the safety car. Yeah, tr recovery truck is on its way, so I think lights might go out. It might be a late call, but they might go out on the safety car this time round, which would be good if they do. So are we going to have one further lap, or is it going to be a late call? Recovery truck is not fully out of harm's way as yet. They need to radio race control to say that they're clear, and I don't quite think they're going to do it in time. No, so we're going to have one more lap. I'm afraid, behind the safety car. We were nearly there, Chris, weren't we? It was nip and tuck, but no, didn't quite get it cleared in time. 
Yeah, yeah I mean, we've seen the odd late one, but that would have been incredibly late, yeah. wouldn't it? I mean, it was possible because, of course, it's not a championship and they, they might give it a little bit more leeway because let's not lose sight of the fact that the drivers don't want to be sat there on the safety car. They want to get going, especially those with the, uh, a pair of drivers where they're going to be handing this over to their, uh, their co-driver. They don't want to sit there and go, yeah, most of my stint was just a pooling around behind the safety car. They want to get going as quickly as they can. There's a number of cars there that I would say are, are sort of fairly out of position for where they would want and expect to be. So they want to get the uh, race conditions back underway so they can start working their way back through again. One of those is the uh, Pottinger. It sat there in fourth place. The 89 car started on the front row. has been looking good all day and is just going to want to uh, try and get that back again, which makes you wonder whether the Reeds in, uh, in the lead there are frustrated by this safety car. Um, you'd have thought so, because they certainly had the pace when the lights went out. We're on it straight away. And if that's their quicker driver that they put in of the two, of course, yeah. then again, that's where you want to try and gain advantage while you've got your quicker driver in. And you just can't do that if you're under safety car. So lights are off on the safety car. The BMW safety car is going to accelerate its way into the pit lane. And already uh, we've got the race back underway because Alex and Dan Reed's Volkswagen Golf has already got the foot down and is getting things underway. Remember, there's no overtaking until they reach the start finish line on this one. You can be alongside. You can't have your nose ahead. You've got to wait until you go past the control line where the green flag is. So over the start finish line goes our race leader. It's the Reeds in their Volkswagen Golf that leads the way. It's the Semprini Racing Honda Civic of Evans and Hart that's there in second place. And it is going to be Stuart Donovan. I very nearly said Jason. Stuart Donovan <laughs> that's there in third. How old are you? No. <laughs> right, so down they come, down towards Graham Hill Bend. And already it does look like uh, the Reeds have managed to make a, another mini breakaway in that golf. A 148 car scampering away. And the good news for him in the mirror, he's going to see the fact that the... Uh, the 37 car, the Evans and Hart, uh, number 37, started fourth place at Honda Civic Type R. Might be sat there in second, but he's under so much pressure from the 112 car, or uh, the pole sitter Stuart Donovan, that's Salika, that it's enabling that golf to just keep just eking away at this stage, and he needs to take advantage of this as quick as possible. Uh, I've been busy giggling away at Alex Di Donato, who has tried to get things underway straight away at the wheel of the Peugeot 205 GTI. But my goodness me, was he wringing the neck of that thing as he came <laughs> out of Graham Hill Bend that time through? He, he slewed from being sideways on one side of the circuit to being almost sideways on the opposite side of it, but still managed to gather it up and didn't lose a great deal of time in the process either. We're three wide coming over the start finish line, very busy heading up towards Paddock Hill Bend as things currently stand, uh, with, by the look of things, Sarah Hobson at the wheel of her Toyota trying to unlock the door and squeeze her way through and past the number 43 Renault Clio, which I think she's just about done on the run up towards the breaking area for Druids. Does she finally do it? Yes, she does. So Sarah Hobson just goes through and manages to take the place, and the Renault Clio that sits behind her loses out on that occasion, which is going to be the number 43 car of the Hurrells, Trevor and Joe. It's another one, as we saw with the championship earlier, the trophy race again. We, uh, we get a stiff neck from watching this because you're suddenly being dragged from one angle to another because there's fights going on absolutely everywhere, such as the entertainment factor. And uh, we've got at the moment is the uh, the number 47 car, which I've got a faint recollection. Was it Kevin Bottomley, that Genetta G40? Maybe one of the other cars that in qualifying seemed to have a few issues. Well, it's, it's looking good at the minute, but it's fighting really, really hard to uh, to keep Hobson, the 144 Salika, behind her at the moment. But uh, so far, so good. But they're almost, you, you kind of look behind them and they're, they're a cork in a bottle. Uh, Kevin Bottomley, monoposto racer in the past. Does ring a bell. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I was trying to think where it came from and all of a sudden, yeah, made me think, yeah, monoposto racing. So, yeah, wouldn't really associate him with saloon car racing. Uh, Sarah Hobson, by the look of things, still having a great little battle at the wheel of the Toyota Salika as she heads downhill in towards the... Uh, Left-hander at Graham Hill Bend, so Kevin Bottomley is just ahead. Then Not you've got anymore. the oh no, was he made a mistake? He has a like Mr. Gear possibly. All ah, right, so the Hazes go through at the wheel of their say at Leon. Yeah, Sarah Hobson goes through, and yet yeah, two places lost there for Kevin Bottomley. Yeah, I think the um, that the car that just walked past them, I think, is recovering to some extent because it's going incredibly rapidly through that 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 gaggle there. And, uh, and but it did look as though Bottomley just missed a gear coming out of Graham Hill Bend. But the 114 car, uh, the Haze, yeah, that's just suddenly made up. Sorry, two places on that last lap. So I think they're working their way back through again now. Yeah. So wherever you look, there are good little fights going on. Place game there for the Steve Begbie and Oliver Warner. 
Ford Fiesta as it also dives up the inside of the Hurrell's Renault Clio. So Ford Fiesta now goes ahead of the red Renault Clio, but with the yellow wheels. There's another red Renault Clio that sits directly behind it, but that is a car that's got totally different coloured wheels. Uh, look at the squabbles. No matter where you look, <laughs> there are fights going on. So we've got Fords fighting with uh, Renaults and Mazda MX-5s ganging up on them at the same time. Yeah, and that was uh, oh, looking up the inside, nearly a little tap on the corner there, but did a great job just to avoid it. That was the one that my eyes had been drawn to behind our commentary box for real then as well. And so the camera's just at the right time flipped to that as this was getting Larry side by side they go. And it's the 25, the Orange Fiesta of Fiat Burnham that has now been passed. I was going to say at the inside line, but uh, through goes the, uh, what was the Clio? It's the 14, so actually... 14, it's the Steve Begby Oliver Warner car, yeah. Yeah, was it ahead, wasn't it? And we're uh, going to see it change again now. Well, that's for the lead of Class D as well. That's why that's ah, important. So that is for the lead of Class D at this stage. So Rob Burnham goes back to the lead of Class D uh, for the moment. But look behind him, the number 87 Mazda is there. What class is Drew Fletcher in? Class D. So this is four cars all fighting away, first, second, third, and fourth in Class D. Fantastic. And this is what it should be like, isn't it? The two... Uh, MX-5s absolutely glued together at the back of that quartet of cars. Only one of them will, will get a piece of silverware as it stands at the moment. But frankly, all four of them are glued together. Yeah, and they've got the race leader bearing down on them as well before too much longer. So here comes Rob Burnham back over the start-finish line. Still with the Steve Begby, Oliver Warner car trying to draw itself alongside. So we don't know which... race leader. That's is it not? the recovering Ah, the Seat. recovering say out right, OK. Scheme, yeah, it? it is, yeah, absolutely. No, well spotted. So, yeah, so it's the it's the Renault that goes back into the lead now of Class D. So, a uh, good run down the straight, and all of a sudden, Class D shuffles again. Uh, missed as well on that last lap. Di Donato in the number 30, that jet black Peugeot 205 GTI, the 1.9 uh, mental version of that Peugeot 205 GTI, managed to jump up ahead of Pottinger. So, Pottinger isn't feeling quite as uh, as uh, at home this time round, is it? But uh, still going. Remember, it was very late getting to the grid. We wondered whether there was potentially an issue. Has dropped back behind the uh, 205. But then again, Di Donato had an issue in qualifying, didn't it? Disappeared into the pits for a good while with the driver sort of out of the car and into the bonnet. But side by side, and then Potter just got past him again. So a great fight between these two. That is fourth and fifth in Class B and on the road. Yep, so brilliant little squabble between the two of them. Uh, albeit the uh, the Peugeot is giving a few years away, isn't it, to the far younger Renault Clio of Adrian Pottinger that lies ahead. Uh, our race leader is carving his way through traffic. We've also got the Semprini Racing Honda trying to work its way through traffic and the man who qualified on pole position, Stuart Donovan, also trying to work his way through traffic at the moment. So uh, they're all having to deal with slower cars and thread their way through. This is also what uh, Adrian Pottinger and Di Donato are going to have to do before too much longer. Now the pit window has opened already. The first of those is in and it is Ian Bonser that comes in at the wheel of his Ginetta G40 is the first of those to come into the pits. Yeah, and actually it was Bonser that had the issue qualifying, wasn't it? Not the, the one that I was talking about. I think we just had a shuffle of positions uh, that just went past us there. Now where would that have been? It, it, it just you blink and you miss so much going on. Uh, I think I think Alex Di Donato's had a problem because he was very slow coming out of Paddock Hill Bend. We briefly caught him uh, on one of the camera shots there, but I think he's he's lost places there now. Whether he had a park yeah. spin, or whether he's got down, a problem, yeah. yeah, mechanical issue. Yeah, he's just crawling down towards uh, Graham Hill Bend at the moment and uh, diving to the grass to get out of the way. So what a shame. We I was sort of uh, drooling over that. Uh, classic car weren't we and as you say the 1.9 variant it is most definitely a classic car that one and it's uh, tucked behind the barrier safely so it's not going to cause an issue to the race but it's a shame to see that one out when it was uh, really starting to come good wasn't it was yeah qualified fifth quickest did Di Donato was running in fifth place before the thing packed up on him unfortunately so racing still continues 26 minutes of the race still to go not many takers for the pit stops yet. Uh, I think Ian Bonser is the only one of those that is still running that has come into the pits as part of a mandatory pit stop. There's still good fights going out on circuit as, though, as, as well though. So Sarah Hobson at the wheel of the largely white and yellow Toyota is under pressure from Rob Burnham. Rob Burnham has got Drew Fletcher's Mazda MX-5 right behind him. Then it's Alistair Eason that's just behind that as well. And Alistair Eason has another car right on his coattails as well, which I think is the 141 car that is going through. And that is going to be, um, I say the 141 car, uh, the 144 car and the 114 car all together as well. So yeah, great little fight that it is still. 
Yeah, and it's interesting that the uh, the 41 car, the uh, the BMW of Rawlings, was involved in that. I wonder whether there's a little mistake earlier, but it's managed to pull away again. The TT now has done a great job. That's the number 23 car of Evans and Schofield up into sixth place, fifth in class. But it's just taken a while to get up to that place and uh, was involved in a bit of rough and tumble in the early stages. Got that sorted, got himself comfortable and is now starting to pick his way through this field. The next target will be that uh, Rawlings BMW that is leading Class C and may choose not to need to get involved because actually the car behind Evans and Schofield, the 88 car, is, is, is the nearest Class C uh, challenger. That's the Honda Civic of uh, Tripjack. Uh, Tripchowski, sorry. Uh, that uh, is going to want to keep that one behind it. The one that looks in the same uh, colour as the livery as our race leader almost, isn't it? Uh, yes, it is. Yeah, it looks very, very similar, doesn't it? The livery of the two of them. So more cars diving for the pit lane. Rob Burnham in the orange Fiesta still trying to hang on to what will be second place in, uh, sorry, the lead of Class D, I should say, at this stage. He's still got the car of Drew Fletcher right behind him. So first, second, third, fourth in Class D, all pretty much together as they head down the Cooper straight and this time Drew Fletcher gets a better run in the Mazda. Rob Burnham is going to lose the lead of Class D and actually loses second place in Class D as well as the number 14 car squeezes its way through as well. So a couple of places lost there, unfortunately, for Rob Burnham. And that was somewhat frustrating really there because he seemed to be doing everything beautifully well for the lead of Class D but now it's the Mazda coming over the start finish line. Drew Fletcher that leads the way in Class D. Well, there's so much fight in that, that battle, isn't it? That it's, it's not surprising to see. Yeah, the, the 14 it shows on that car. Actually, the, that car's just got into the lead. Oh, sorry, ahead of Fletcher. But that's a Class C car, isn't it? So they've let that one clear off. Uh, Fletcher, number 87, now leading the way in the MX-5. Burnham's still there, isn't he? So only one of the places he lost is, uh, you know, is of any great consequence to him. So he just needs to remember that. And look, he's right there. He's, he's like the fill-in in, uh, with the bread being M Mazda MX-5s. Uh, yeah, so uh, uh, more drivers heading for the pit lane. This time into the pit lane comes the Barney Lower and Michael Diarcy BMW. The buzzer goes off at the end of the pit lane, which suggests that somebody else is coming in. That's Ben Cater and Malcolm Scott, the two ex Monoposto racers as well, at the wheel of their Mazda, uh, uh, sorry, Mazda, no, Toyo Dram R2 that come in. But our race leaders, which are the Reeds and their Volkswagen Golf, still staying out there for the moment and pressing on with what is now a almost four-second lead between themselves and the new second-place car, which is Stuart Donovan, who's moved ahead of the Honda Civic on that lap. So position lost for Semprini Racing. The number 37 car of Jeremy Evans and Phil Hart dropped down to third. And a long way back in third mm. for, yep. uh, for Evans and Hart. So uh, that must have been a, a mistake on the last lap or two. Although saying that, Less. another lap that's a bit slower there. Yeah, two laps Something on the trot have been right. about a second and a half slower. Mm, and it's not looking quick heading up towards uh, Druids at the moment. So I reckon that now third place car is uh, nursing a bit of an issue. We're getting clear to, uh, close to their pit stop presumably as well. So I'll be able to bring that uh, 37 car in. It's going to be a driver change as long as that car is healthy enough to keep going. But the lights are blaze there that you can see is the now second place Toyota Celica of Donovan. Where is the third place? There's another one that's just exiting at the end of the straight, by the way. I didn't catch it, it was. One of the Fiestas is out of the race. It's number 14 car that was running right at the sharp end of Class D. Well, one so one it's down as, isn't it? Uh, Wheeler, what then? Yeah, it is, yeah. So into the pit lane, 127 is in, which is Sean Andrews and Clive Goldthorpe. Buzzer goes off, into the pit lane comes Semprini Racing, not surprised because that Honda was losing time. So the Jeremy Evans and Phil Hart uh, Honda Civic that was running in second and dropped to third also now dives for the pit lane as well. And it also looks as though Rob Burnham, who'd been doing good jobs at the wheel of that orange Ford Fiesta for the lead of Class D, has lost a few more places as well now. So uh, things are, are not quite going to plan for him, but things are very much going to plan for our race leader and for the Toyota that's there in second place, still in the hands of Stuart Donovan, who's now working his way through traffic on the Cooper Straight. Yeah, our pole sitter's been very patient there, hasn't it, to be honest with you as well, just making sure that uh, it was always putting pressure on the 37 car and uh, has picked up those pieces. Yeah, the lead gap has really shrunk. It was 2.3 seconds. It's now down to very little uh, at all as they come over the start-finish line. This is now going to be 23 laps completed, and what was a 2.3-second advantage from Volkswagen back to Toyota is now down to just four tenths of a second and that's not to do with traffic that's just all of a sudden the Toyota has come alive and the Golf has lost a little
little bit of pace. Now they've got traffic up the road to deal with. That traffic up the road was three wide briefly on the way up towards Druid. So this could delay our race leading Volkswagen of Alex and Dan Reed, who work their way through the traffic. Stuart Donovan tries to squeeze his way through as well. Now the golf breaks as late as he can, tries to get a back marker between himself and the Toyota, but then runs a little bit wide as a result of breaking a bit too late going in towards Graham Hill Bend. And Stuart Donovan at the wheel of his Toyota then down the straight effortlessly eases his way past the traffic. So the lead pair are together again as they come through and are about to start lap number 25 this time through. Yeah, of course, that's the uh, Class D uh, lead battle that they're in the middle of there at the moment as well, isn't it? They're, they're just about to lap the car that's second in Class D as it stands at the moment. Isam in the number one car. Through they go, job done. The silver and purple MX-5 pass. The next MX-5 they're going to encounter, though, is the car that's leading Class D, number 87, Fletcher. The blue and black car uh, is, is going to see them in a mirror, but so close between the leaders. And what have we got? It, 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 they were kind of almost the same lap times this time, last time round, but you wonder whether there's a slight issue with that golf at this stage. It just really has just dropped off, hasn't it? Its yeah. lap times have, have dropped off for a couple of seconds. No more, I suppose, than the Toyota is doing at the moment, but I think, yeah. But it did do get a 57 through. last time, yeah, which is a long way off. Back in it? the 56s now, but yeah, I think the Toyota is quicker. It just can't get through and past the Golf at this stage. Back markers could be the catalyst for a bit of change, though, as they come up towards the car that is leading Class D, which is Drew Fletcher. He moves uh, neatly out of the way and allows a leading pair to squeeze their way through. But into the pit lane comes the race leader. So uh, Alex and Dan Reed's Volkswagen Golf into the pit lane, which means the black and the light green Toyota in the hands of Stuart Donovan now picks up the lead of the race. Yeah, as the uh, lights are blazing, not just to sort of let the uh, the slower cars know a faster one's coming. It's actually needed now, Mark, isn't it? It's gone proper gloomy out there. Sorry, I went for a stone on you there, didn't I? Uh, but it is, it's incredibly gloomy, and you can actually see the uh, the headlights glaring off the back of the car in front of them, such as the uh, the drop in the light. But there's the uh, our race, what was our race leader, the 148 Golf. Driver change going on. Uh, don't look... He's just, no, he's just going to help his, uh, his co-driver get in. So they don't appear to be worrying about anything, do they? No, no, no. We've just got a um, mechanic just adjusting, uh, well, I'm going to say adjusting tyre pressure, but more than anything, just checking that the, the wheel nuts are torqued uh, appropriately. So we have race leader coming last time. Stuart Donovan took up the lead. He comes in this time through. So one race leader in one lap. Someone else takes over the lead. They come in the following lap. So Stuart Donovan is in, uh, and also the leader of Class D is in as well, which is Drew Fletcher. Now, back to the point we were talking about earlier on in the Track Day Championship. Those two cars for first and second were so close to each other on the circuit. If one can pit as close to two minutes as possible, and the other one is two minutes yeah. and five seconds, all of a sudden the whole race dynamic changes. Yeah, it's just a huge risk to take. If you undercut it by a fraction, then uh, you, the book's thrown at you pretty much. The uh, the penalty just eliminates anything uh, being achievable thereafter. So it's uh, when you consider we saw things like two minutes two uh, compared to two minutes four, well, one, two, there you go. That's that's the difference that you're getting. It's, it's not a big gap, so it's it's a tricky one. Hence, we're seeing a lot of them is, is around the two fours and, and higher. They're just keeping them as self as safe as possible. Ben Cater and Malcolm Scott left loads of contingency in theirs was a two minute 22 from them. So they were 22 minutes over the minimum period that they could have been. But most people, yeah, around sort of two minutes three, two minutes four, two minutes six, two minutes seven is about right. But yeah, get it as close as you can. We're about to find out how good the pit stop has been for the erstwhile race leading Volkswagen Golf because in the hands of the Reeds, it's about to get to pit lane exit. Two minutes and 4.8 seconds. So about five seconds more than they needed. Yeah, and I think that tends to be the, the safe sweet spot for a lot of these, isn't it, around that 204 mile, which is why it was quite impressive seeing someone banging a 202, because they're really taking a risk. 203, who just put in a 203? It's moving so quick, I can't keep up. That's... Uh, Shrupchalski. Yeah, OK, so that one was uh, was pretty close. Oh, we had a 201. Who's just putting a 201? Polk, 98 Polk put in a 201. I think that was a little while ago, actually, but um, a really impressive uh, pit stop window for them, and that could be interesting because that car was involved with uh, several other cars. Yeah, the one we now need to keep an eye on is what Stuart Donovan is doing, because his car is still stationary in the pit lane at the moment. The black and the light green Toyota is about to see the clock ticking away, which means that they are comfortable that they can release that car back out onto the circuit. And as he rejoins the circuit, it was two minutes and three seconds. So almost two seconds quicker than the Golf, which means that the Toyota picks up the lead of the race 
by the fact it was about two seconds shorter in the pit stop. Fantastic. So the pole sitter retakes that lead, but has had to work mighty hard for that. And, and I guess you've always got to remind yourself, just keep yourself in the hunt. Let's see what happens in that pit stop. And then we know what we've got to do for the second half of the race. Yeah, that looks like Sarah Hobson who's in. Yep, so it's the uh, white and the yellow Toyota is also in. She was running inside the top 10 in the early stages of the race and had moved up into second position um, as others around her had pitted. Uh, so we've got first, second and third in the race all in the pit lane at the moment. And I think those are the final three cars that need to pit now. So once we've cleared the pit lane of these three cars, we will be good to go for the rest of the race with, by the look of things, our new race leader coming over the start-finish line this time through. Should go to the top of the times. Yep, so through goes Stuart Donovan. The number 112 Toyota leads the way. Second is the 148 Volkswagen Golf. Who's going to be third? We'll have to wait and see because it might affect some of those cars that are coming out of pit lane. Well, I was just suddenly looking, about to come across the uh, the line now is the top three in Class C are absolutely glued together, and they have now split themselves slightly because the 37 car of Evans and Hart, we've had a change of driver, of course, in that 37 car, but just been passed by 41 Rawlings now as well. It, uh, that didn't look healthy before it went into the pits, and it's not looking like it's getting back up to speed now, but that is the top three in Class C that are, are having a cracking fight. And in fact, I think the lead of Class C has that just changed or is that a different BMW? There's two BMWs that look virtually identical there that I'm, I can't tell, but it looks like the 88 car uh, was already in the lead. So that's uh, Trapczalski that is leading Class C at the moment, but they're all in a line. It, yeah, so uh, there is a number 88 Honda Civic just bouncing its way through the curbs through Surtees and McLaren up towards clearways. It gets very, very, very side. He's going to have a spin from the lead of Class C right across the nose of a couple of his competitors onto the grass on the infield. Lights up the tyres again to retake to the circuit. Puts a load of grass and a load of leaves at pit lane entry. But just as you were saying, it, Shrupchalski has the problem. Spins the lead of Class C away and that is going to drop him down through the order. He was in fourth position as he retakes to the circuit, comes over the start, finish line. He's down to ninth and fourth in class. Yeah, that's the key one, isn't it? Fourth in class when he was leading the way in class C. Uh, uh, I'm worried about talking about any other class leaders now. I feel I might curse them or something. You've been doing a good job of I that am. so far today. <laughs> uh, lead advantage is growing at this stage. It's up to five seconds now between Stuart Donovan and the Dan and Alex Reed Volkswagen Golf. So it's going the right way as far as the race leader is concerned. Uh, Adrian Pottinger at the wheel of the number 89 Renault Clio is in third position at the moment, but he is uh, involved in trying to work his way past those Class D cars at the moment. So he's about to deal with Drew Fletcher's Mazda. He's then about to deal with Rob Burnham's orange Ford Fiesta and gets past all of them on the run in towards the breaking area for Paddock Hill Bend. So the third place car now having dealt with the traffic. Fourth at the moment is number 41, Michael Rawlings at the wheel of his BMW, but he is under pressure from Charlie Polk, as you suggested, and the number 23 car that sits directly behind that, which is Tim Evans and Andrew Schofield with their Audi TT. Yeah. They were one of the last to pit, weren't they? Yeah, and the BMW they just got past there is, is ironic, is it's the 36 car that's down in 17th, and Kian Massey has been a driver change, and the second driver's obviously quicker, is a lap behind all of this lot, but he's lapping around the same time of them, so that it's been mixing them up. The 41 BMW that's already managed to scamp through. Polk's got to try and reel him back in again now. Uh, and it's just, uh, it just kind of messed them up a little bit there, which was, uh, was interesting to see. I was just picking up, I was trying to remember, I was look, noticing something else there, but I've forgotten what it was. But it's the nature of the beast, isn't it? Once they've had their pit stops, like, that's what it was. It was coming across the line now, was this class D battle that I see that the 25 Orange Fiesta of Burnham, that we see there, just applying the brakes as he comes towards Paddock Hill Bend. And we've got a change for second place behind him, the two Mazda MX-5s. What I was about to say is that he's got ahead of both those MX-5s again now. And there, he's going to be loving the view in his mirror that they're having their own fight. Yep, so uh, yeah, that change has now occurred. So Alistair Eason has lost out to Drew Fletcher. So the blue and good metal grey and black Mazda goes through and ahead and up to second in Class D. Class D still being headed by Rob Burnham at this stage. It changed twice then. All oh, right, changed, Across changed the back. line, yeah, 87 had that second and he lost it and then he got it back again heading up towards Drew. That's how good that fight is. It's brilliant. Well, I mean, these are some of the cars that potentially we might see in the new Mayata Cup next year because we do have a lot of MX-5s in the track day 
trophy in Track Day Championship and several of the teams have already expressed an interest in moving over to the Miata Cup for next year with their Mark 3s and their Mark 1s so that could be a hugely competitive championship and here we go for the lead of Class D Rob Burnham trying to squeeze Drew Fletcher towards the pit wall and Drew Fletcher almost sort of looking over at Rob Burnham thinking right don't squeeze me anymore there's not a lot of room here now but fair play to both of them uh, they pushed each other as hard as they could but we've had the lead change in Class D. Uh, and we could well. Is that going to be a lead in the Class C? Not quite. Yes, it is. The Class C lead. Oh, and he's gone off. He's gone off into the gravel. In fact, is that both of them? The BMW is yep. off as well. So that's the lead pair in Class C, is it? That it, was talking about? Yeah. It was, yeah. Charlie Polk uh, coming together with the BMW. And I'm afraid they are both off. BMW is into the gravel trap that little bit further around the number 41 car of Michael Rawlings. And yeah, he's stranded in the gravel trap. The engine is running, but the wheels are spinning and it's going nowhere and Charlie Polk is off with damage as well so that's sorted that one out and now Rob Burnham not only has lost the lead of Class D he's going to lose second place in Class D because Alistair Eason goes through oh and there's a bit of contact between the pair of them as they squeeze each other towards the pit wall whilst the Audi TT of Tim Evans and Andrew Schofield was trying to lap them as well so that all got slightly marginal it's not actually lap them that's to get it's past them get behind, albeit right. a different class so that TT is recovering a little bit now isn't it that's just what gets confusing with this one as well isn't it yeah the, the 23 car um, oh, I see that actually. It's all just suddenly changed around. My apologies. That, that, it, was, it was to lap them. Yes, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, so they, they 32 laps completed, whereas Class D cars have got 31. Let's have another quick look at this replay. You can see Charlie Polk has already got two wheels on the grass. It, and so, oh, yeah, uh, and rather inadvertently piled into the side of Michael Rawlings there, who was very much the innocent bystander. But for Charlie Polk, yeah, he just sort of. So it wasn't a lunge for the move. He got on the grass, didn't he, on yeah. the inside? Yeah. Yeah, and, so, uh, and rather Michael Rawlings was very much, you know, the, the, the innocent bystander there. And that, I'm afraid, uh, those two cars stricken where they are is going to bring out the safety car once more with nine minutes to go. This is going to bunch them all up again. And you know that um, that race lead advantage that had been building and building and building between Stuart Donovan and the Reeds. It was up to 7.4 seconds. It's not going to count for a great deal, is it? Now we go safety car once more. It really isn't. I mean, with uh, with that amount of time, 8 minutes 50 left to go, is that uh, how quickly they're going to be able to get these two? You, it, I, I, I think they can probably get it back underway again, but what we're going to look at, a one or two lap uh, shootout at the end or something. Let's just have a quick look. So... Depends on where the safety car is, how many back marker cars are between our race leader and second place. I think there's only going to be potentially one or two. Let's just have a quick look. Here is Stuart Donovan, who's just getting... Yeah, so Stuart Donovan, then one, two, three back markers, and then the second place car. So for Stuart Donovan, that's not too bad, because, of course, come the restart of the race, he can accelerate straight away. Whereas for the Reeds in their Volkswagen Golf, they can't overtake any of those back markers. They've got to wait until the start finish line. So if I was Stuart Donovan at the restart, I would go, go mega early. early. Go yeah, mega absolutely. early. Yeah, I mean, that said, it depends. A Red Bull on the phone to the officials to change the way that we do the restarts. I don't probably wouldn't talk to them, would they? <laughs> point, good point. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, it's, it's a, such a shame looking at that, is the, uh, the 98 car of Polk there, that, uh, that's really munched the front of that car, isn't it? And that's yeah. been flying today, hasn't it? It really has. And, and as you say, so unfortunate, he just went on the grass. You can see the tyre marks where it's rejoined the tarmac there in the background. And, uh, and it just spat it. And then unfortunately for him is that BMW that he was trying to get himself into a position to, to, to make a challenge. I could see it coming. That's what I was building up towards and they disappeared behind some of our uh, furniture up here in the commentary box and the trees out on the circuit and then suddenly didn't reappear where they were supposed to reappear at the other side. Uh, it was uh, building up to be quite an exciting race for those guys at that point, but it's all over, that Class C lead. So that means that Cockrell, number 21, is now leading Class C. Yeah, which is another Toyota, isn't it, if memory serves me correctly, Wayne Cockrell. So, uh, yeah, leading Class B is the overall race leader, 112, which is going to be Stuart Donovan. Leading Class C is car number 21, which is Wayne Cockrell with his Toyota Celica. And leading Class D at this stage is the Mazda MX-5, number 87, in the hands of Drew Fletcher. So those are your class leaders at this stage. Uh, we'll also scoop up the leader of Class G because it's the guest's class, and that's the Ginetta G40, number 47, in the hands of uh, Kevin Bottingley. So those are your class leaders.
at this stage with six and a half minutes just under of the race to go. We are at the moment extracting Michael Rawlings BMW E36 M3 out of the gravel trap where it came to rest up there at Druids. As for Charlie Polk's car, well, that is still sort of backwards in the gravel trap up against the barrier. So I think there'll be damage to the back of that car as well as the damage to the front where he struck the BMW as he came back off the grass. So if we're going to get both of those cars out of the way, it really is a mute point as to how much racing we'll get. I think for Michael Rawlings, because the engine was still running and he was trying to get the car out of the gravel, they might drag him to the edge and then release him so he can go off on his merry way by himself, potentially, providing there's no damage to the car. Yeah, we can't really tell until he... Oh, he probably can't either until he gets out there and makes sure that everything uh, on the four corners are pointing in the direction that he uh, he expects it to be, but they've got it out to the tarmac. Ooh. Carried on going a bit further than the officials were expecting there, I think, didn't they? That the marshals are able to unhook him, just have a word and go, are you able to get going on your own steam yet? Was the thumbs up there? So as soon as they are, he's unhooked, they can give him the thumbs up to, uh, to pull away. The, uh, the, the snatch vehicle gets itself back into its position. And thankfully, yeah, that's, as you said, that's one less that they've got to worry about recovering. And it doesn't look like they're going over to Paul's car to, to move it, does it? And if the conversation was to just take it slowly on the way back to the pits, that was very quickly forgotten about because Michael Rawlings, you could hear the engine roar as he was pulling away from uh, the point at which he'd come to That'll um, be rest. why, because the safety car was just coming. Was it? All right, yeah. okay. So he needed, he needed to crack <laughs> on with it. Right, there we go. So, And now what they're doing, Charlie Polk's car, they're now going to try and attach as well. So we've got less than five minutes of this race remaining. Charlie Polk's car that's gone backwards into the barriers. Uh, lightly into the barriers, uh, but the, most of the damage is towards the front of the car. That's going to take at least another couple of minutes to get out of harm's way. I think you're right, Chris. I think we might get one, maybe at best, two more racing laps out of this, but it's going to be nip and tuck as to whether we get any. Yeah, because we don't know how easy it's going to be for them to drag that car out of the way. They'll try and get it behind the fence. And the good news for him there is that's wrecked to sell barriers there that he's, uh, he's sort of just nudged. So uh, that part wouldn't have done damage, but it does look like making contact with... Uh, I assume the BMW has caused most of that. that yeah, damage to the that front, yeah. 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 The rector cell barriers really just give you a, a, a pleasant hug almost. It is. Yeah. It not, is. not I've crashed into them, but they do seem to absorb the energy amazingly well. As I've said, we're not allowed to talk what they're made of, but we hear rumours that it's the lint from a mouse's handkerchief, the cream from a bourbon biscuit, and the hair from a unicorn's tail. Is it? But wow. We're not allowed to talk about you know. that. <laughs> <laughs> That poor Luke stood that sat next to us going, what? <laughs> I'm, I'm the same, Luke. I'm shaking my head. I'm not shaking my head. Um, so, uh, yeah, they, uh, they're now trying to assess the best way to try and scoop up Charlie Polk's car. So the JCB telehandler that was at the rear of it is now going to attack the front of it in the nicest possible way. And I think what they're going to do is put the straps onto it to try and elevate it slightly or are they just going to drag it out? We'll wait and see. But whilst they're doing that, we're now down to three minutes of this race remaining. So... Um, I think we're going to end up under the safety car. I just can't see. And in fact, now that they've done it, out come the red foot right. So we, uh, we are going to finish this race under red flags, I'm afraid. So just going to take too long to scoop up the rest of the cars. And we are going to count back a lap, but it won't affect the results because, of course, even if you go back a lap, that lap would have been behind safety cars. So the results were set as soon as the safety car came out. So Stuart Donovan is going to be the winner of the final MSVT Track Day Trophy race of the season and it just goes to show how important it was for him to get as close as he could to that two minute pit stop because it was really in the pit stop that uh, because he stopped for a shorter period of time than the rest the minimum was two minutes he was about two minutes three the car that was leading before the pit stop stopped for about two minutes five that was just enough for him to overcome that deficit with his slightly quicker pit stop take the lead of the race and ultimately go on to win it so all of the cars heading over the start finish line now we will confirm the results with you as soon as we possibly can. But I think the right decision made, ultimately, that we weren't going to get any more racing in. We weren't going to get the car cleared out of the gravel trap in time for Charlie Polk. You can see only now as it's on the very edge of the gravel. And in fact, by the look of it, yeah, no damage to the tail end of the car. There's nothing that's obvious. I thought it would be a light touch into the rector cell, and indeed it was. Most of that damage is at the front, on the front left-hand corner, of course. That was the corner that struck the BMW and put them both ultimately into the gravel trap. And out of the race I'm afraid to say so all of the cars will continue around the circuit they will peel their way in towards the pit lane and hopefully not this time get held up in the Parc Ferme process at the top of the pit lane hopefully they'll be all released down towards 
to the bottom of the pit lane. Let's just have a quick look. No, they're getting waved in. You can see there is Stuart Donovan already getting waved in towards the Park Ferme area by the MSVT officials who will usually automatically pick out the top three in the race and then randomly they might scoop up in a few more so it will be a while before we get Chris Dawes able to chat to our top three drivers albeit I noticed one of them Adrian Pottinger has already been waved through so he is not being ushered in towards the Park Ferme area but hopefully we should be able to confirm some results with you very quickly just in a, a short while so uh, let's have a, a quick look at what the results look like for the final race of the year for the MSVT track day trophy it was a win for Stuart Donovan with the Reeds that being Dan and Alex in second place and Adrian Pottiger in third place Jeremy Hunt and Phil uh, Sorry, Jeremy Evans and Phil Hart finished in fourth position with Wayne Cockrell in fifth place picking up the class win. Sixth place went the way of Damien Shrupchalski with seventh place going the way of the Samprini Racing at Honda Civic. In eighth place, it was the number 114 car of the Hayes, that being Luke and Jamie with Sarah Hobson finishing in ninth place and the number 127 Volkswagen Golf for Sean Andrews and Clive Goldthorpe completing the top 10. Drew Fletcher claimed the win in Class D at the wheel of his Mazda. What was a very hard fought battle between himself and Alistair Eason with Rob Burnham and the Begbie and Warner car sitting there in 14th place. The BMW of Makia Massey was there in 15th place. Kevin Bottomley was the leading guest car home as he finished in 17th place. Then it was the Hurrells in there, Renault Clio, followed by Moss, Bowen and Murphy's Ford Fiesta that completed the top 20. Uh, outside of the top 20, there were plenty more cars, including, of course, those cars that had issues. We know of the retirement of the Peugeot, of Alex Di Donato and, of course, the uh, rather unfortunate incident that befell the Coombs in their Mazda at the very start of the race. So that was it for the final race of the season for the MSVT Track Day Trophy. They'll be back with a full calendar in 2023. Looking forward to seeing a chunk more of them over the course of uh, next year as well. So Chris Dawes is going to scoop up the drivers as and when they are released from the Park Ferme area. We still have more racing to come up here as well uh, at Brands Hatch with a further race for the United Formula Ford featuring the champion of Brands coming up very shortly. And then we will have our final race of the day, which will be the final race of the season for Turismo X. But even after that, we are also live on the stream for the qualifying for the Enduro KA ahead of tomorrow's 500-minute race here at Brands Hatch for the Mark 1 Ford KAs. The IndyCar 500, as it is billed, which does have a cracking entry list. Former winners from last year, Gala perform uh, sorry, the GM performance are, are back. Gary Mitchell and Ian Mitchell. Uh, former winner, Nick Tandy, and of course, uh, Le Mans winner, Porsche driver, racing back for Porsche in IMSA this year, is also back out uh, on that entry list as well for the Enduro KAs, which will be qualifying from the last bits of daylight through into darkness, and that is going to be around about 10 to 4 until 10 to 5 their one hour qualifying session but as we say still two more races to come before that but uh, before that we'll hand you back downstairs to Chris Dawes who's managed to catch up with a driver or two Back down in the pit lane we are. We're going to grab a word with as many as we can. Our race winner's only just making his way down now. We did have... I'm going to quickly grab a word with a class winner, because he's going to have to take his helmet off yet, yeah, is uh, Stuart Donovan. But I'm going to grab the uh, the 87 car, Drew Fletcher. Drew, Drew, come here. <laughs> Got to grab a word with you, because honestly, that, that class battle was incredible in the MX-5. I mean, there was like three or four of you at times having an absolute ding. Yeah, it's absolutely brilliant. Um, that's what it's all about, having a, having a right old battle. So, yeah, <laughs> thoroughly enjoyed it. I mean, it, it suddenly looked at the end as though you found a boost button because you were able to get past them easier than you were earlier. But I bet you were relieved to just clear off after that point. Yeah, yeah, that, <laughs> that was it. Yeah, just listening to my, to, my, to my mentor and just sending it when he said I should send it <laughs> and get away. Yeah. I bet you were gutted when you saw a safety car, though. Uh, <laughs> To parts, yeah, but then when I saw the clock time ticking down, I thought, yeah, OK, we'll do it. Just get the elbows out and try and keep the position. You've done enough. Well done. Cracking class win. Well done. Let's take a wander over here. We've got our outright uh, race winner, the 112, Stuart Donovan. Stuart, wow, I mean, congratulations on that. I mean, it, it, the golf in the early stages seemed to just be able to scamper off, and you just patiently eked back into it, cracking job in the pit stops, and then from there, just stretch your legs. Yeah, I've got to hand it to Reed. He's been on it from the start all season 
season. He jumps me pretty much. A very familiar story. <laughs> this has been my entire season chasing him. Um, yeah, the Salika works best in clean air. So as soon as I could get that, I was able to put in some lap times and then a good pit stop. Uh, shame to finish under the reds, um, but uh, one of those things. Uh, great, great season. All right, absolutely brilliant job. Well done. I just thank you to my sponsors, Quaif, AP Estates, uh, Seven Motorsports, uh, Real Neon and Vixio Payments Compliance. You've thank done you. that before, haven't you? Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, well done. It. Cracking job. Fantastic. Let's have a chat to the Reed guys. Who started? Me. That, I mean, that was a, a cracking start and you managed to pull away as well. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Stuart always gives plenty of racing room, so you know you can trust to go side by side. So, yeah, really enjoyed this year racing with him. It's been great. Did we suspect that there was a slight issue towards the end of your stint before you came into the pits? It just seemed to suddenly lose two to three seconds a lap. Yeah, actually, I, I tried to go down the inside of a back marker and he didn't see me coming. Um, I had a bit of a grassy moment trying to avoid him um, and then Stuart closed the gap. So not really, you know, back marker's fault, just one of those things. I was trying to get through quickly and he didn't see me so it's just one of them that's okay we were worried it was a mechanical oh, okay so you took over the car and uh, you know you, you didn't have a you were once he got the clear air it was too difficult to reel him in yeah just too fast today so um, it was just about keeping some consistency after that um, Alex on the pit wall was saying how far p3 was behind me so I knew I didn't have to do everything every lap and risk a mistake um, but in result I wanted a, a restart off the safety car to get a little bit of a fight even if it was to defend but um, um, yeah, that's our day today, and, and P2 is what it is. Which is still a pretty good finish, let's be honest. Yeah, thank you very much. Well done, guys. Absolutely wonderful entertainment. Uh, let's have a look. Who else have we got? We've got the 89 car here that actually finished third overall, Adrian Pottinger. Adrian. Hello. Congratulations. Great third position. Looks a bit out of sorts at the start. Uh, I had to drive across the grass, so with wet tyres, no, no warm-up lap. Uh, yes, so, unfortunately, course. I had wheel spin for the first three gears. Was there an issue to make you late out onto the grid? Uh, I was in the other race. I thought it was yeah. that, yeah. yeah. I, got, I forgot that, so you were wet from that, you had to get it dried, and then it was yeah. just be patient. And, and they made me drive over the grass, yeah. So. <laughs> Which is tricky, isn't it? It's yeah. a tricky one, but well done, a great okay. first. No worries, yeah, thank you very Congratulations. much. Congratulations. Uh, let's see, can we quickly grab, uh, they're only just, they're starting to go out onto the grid, so we maybe need to knock it on the head, In which case, I'm going to have to hand it back to you. We managed to get the top three, we got one of the class winners, but Mark, back to you for the Formula 4. Thanks, Chris. Yep, so we have already on the track for the final race for them this season, the competitors for the AMC Vehicle Solutions United Formula Ford Championship in association with LMC Technologies and combined with them is the Ormento Coaching Champion of Brands competitors. If I've got the maths right, for the uh, uh, United Formula Ford Championship, Morgan Quinn is on 30 points coming into this race. And Lucas Romanek, who won the race earlier on, is now on 25 championship points. So it's Morgan Quinn's to lose, you could argue, because there's five for a win, an extra two for the overall win, and then it's 5 4 3 2 1 in each one of the classes. So we'll have to wait and see what happens. For the Omento Coaching Champion of Brands, again, if I've got the maths right, Chris Sharp will start on 25 points, Simon Proust is on 17, and John Barnes is on 15. But as they head off on the formation lap, should be able to guide you through the grid and the way that they line up, which is based on the results of the race that we had earlier on today. So on to pole position. It's going to be the winner from race one earlier on today. It's Lucas Romanek that starts from pole and alongside is Morgan Quinn. Row two of the grid is Alex Walker and Jordan Kelly. And it's Neil Toft that has Bob Hawkins for company on row number three. On to run number four. That's where we see Nathan Down and the Van Diemen RF90 of Jonathan Barnes. It's the Swift of Sean Macklin alongside Christopher Sharples. And then onto the next row of the grid. It's Simon Proust. And then we're into the retirees from earlier on. Adam Fathers, who had a left wheel come off his car. Hopefully he's back. And also at the tail end of the field was our other retiree from earlier, which was James Hadfield. So that's the way that they line up for this final single-seater race of the season at Brands Hatch. And remember, we've got not just the United Formula Ford champion to crown, we've also got our champion of brands to crown coming up in this race very shortly. Lucas Romanek, Morgan Quinn and Alex Walker were all so evenly matched in the race earlier on today. Alex Walker won on the road, remember, but was given a penalty for being out of position at the start. So he'll be hugely conscious this time that he parks within his grid slot. And last time, of course, he did that, but the car had a clutch issue and that's why it rolled forward 
forward of the grid slot and ultimately that was what put him out of position at the start. So he'll be hoping for better fortunes in this one. Could he win it on the road and keep the victory this time? I'll have to wait and see over the course of the 20 minutes that's coming up. So the final little bit of tyre warming just being done as they then position themselves on the grid. And Lucas Romanek is the black car with the white flashes that sits there on pole position. It's the car that is blue with the little white and red stripe down the side of it, Morgan Quinn alongside. It's the all-black car of Alex Walker on row number two. And alongside him is the blue car, but with the thicker white stripe down the side of it in the hands of Jordan Kelly. Neil Tofts is red on row number four, and it's another red car. Uh, the ray of Bob Hawkins lines up alongside him. So green flag is waved at the tail end of the field. We're about to get our final race of the season underway for United Formula Ford and the champion of brands. Red lights come on. Red lights go off, which they do now. And it's a good reaction from Lucas Romanek, who is going to lead the way. Alex Walker comes over to try and squeeze Jordan Kelly because uh, Alex Walker had a poor start from what was third position. He's already dropped down into fourth place. So it's Lucas Romanek that leads the way. It is Morgan Quinn in second place. Jordan Kelly was in third, but already Alex Walker is making up for that poor start and sneaks up the inside of him as they head up towards Druids for the first time. There's lock breaks further back down through the order, but thankfully every Everybody is safely through Druids as they plunge downhill and in towards Graham Hill Bend for the first time. Yeah, and you can see that it's so tight further back. Uh, James Hadfield, the orange 129, is trying to work his way through a bit further back. You can see in the background there. But again, it's the uh, the front four that have made a, a bit of a breakaway already, haven't they? And in fact, you've got to say, Lucas Romanek has got some incredible daylight between himself and the second place car as it stands. Morgan Quinn is going to look to uh, to eat back into that as, uh, soon. And I think we saw daylight in, in the early stages in the first race. Formula Ford races, they don't tend to last long, do they? No, not at all. No, look at this squabble that's going on here as Sean Macklin is looking to try and squeeze up the inside of Christopher Sharples. Christopher Sharples looking to try and attack and defend at the same time. We've also got James Hadfield trying to carve his way through the order after his retirement in race number one. And he weaves one way, weaves the other, and is looking to try and put Sean Macklin under pressure further back through the order. Also, very late on the brakes was Bob Hawkins as he snuck up the inside of Christopher Sharples at the wheel of the Palliser. So everywhere you look, there are fights going on, including at the sharp end of the order as well with the first few cars, Lucas Romanek, Morgan Quinn and Alex Walker all so evenly matched in race number one. In race number two, Lucas Romanek seems to be out of the box a little bit quicker here, doesn't he? And he seems to have broken the toe on those behind. Yeah, I think after it being so tight in that first race, he's wanted to break the toe, break the, uh, the spirit as quickly as he possibly can. Sean Macklin's about to be uh, challenged by James Head Hadfield across the line there. Incidentally, thank you to Gary Hill. He says that Adam Fathers isn't out in this race because, do you remember, he had that off uh, yep. at Clearways. Uh, suspected hub failure, you said, that suddenly the wheel just went yep. bop. Yep. Uh, yeah, hub failure causing the wheel to come off his car, and they haven't been able to sort it out for this second race, unfortunately. Yeah, it's an enormous shame for uh, Adam Fathers, so that means that we're down to just 12 cars in this particular race. The one to watch out for at the moment is James Hadfield, who at the wheel of the orange van D and RF03 is carving his way through the order. Remember, he was a non-finisher in the race earlier on, and on the base of the grid is formed by the finishing order of race one. He had to start at the back and has worked his way beautifully well through the order now. Should be inside the top six, I would have thought. As over the start-finish line, we see the fight for second and third place. Ronan Quinn looking to try and see if he can reassert himself back into second place, because on that lap, he's lost it. Alex Walker is through into second. Yeah, incredible. I don't think that's over just yet. And, uh, yeah, you're talking about James Hadfield for, for fighting his way through. That car just looks a lot happier, doesn't it? And uh, he uh, he looks at one with it again. It just wasn't right in qualifying all the race. And whatever they've now tweaked on that, the feedback he's been able to give for that to get it into the sweet spot, it appears to be working. And he's absolutely flying. Got himself up there into fresh air. The next target is the fifth place, the red number 17 car of Toft. So going well. Yeah, we'll keep an eye on him and see how much progress he makes. Also keep an eye on what's going on for the battle for second and third place. Can Morgan Quinn close back up onto the coattails of Alex Walker? Is Alex Walker then going to try and charge and bring the gap down to the race leader, Lucas Romanek? Over the start finish line, they'll go. Alex Walker sets the fastest lap of the race. That answers the question. 50.916 of a second. Uh, it's uh, only a few hundredths of a second quicker than Lucas Romanek, but the gap's going the right way at this stage. Number 73, race one winner, Lucas Romanek, leads the way still as they head on to lap number five. 
Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, it's still early stages, but there is a uh, surprising sized gap between all four of them at the moment, isn't it? You wonder whether it's just l lulling us into a false sense of security. I mean, Alex Walker, I saw him as he came out of Graham Hill Bend there onto the Cooper Strait, still very animatedly looking into his, uh, his wing mirrors, just making sure he knows where Morgan Quinn is. The 88 car there, is he still within striking distance? The answer that he'll have found when he looked into his mirrors is not right now, but it goes to show he knows that that gap can disappear if he doesn't pay attention to it. Yeah, Alex Walker, interesting to hear him chat to you earlier on as again he sets another new fastest lap of the race, a 50.748 second lap, which is two of tenths of a second quicker than the race leader. Interesting to him to say earlier on, yeah, he'd been out of a car for a, a couple of months. Well, yeah, it's good to see him back in a single seater because, of course, Alex Walker was the man that was at the sharp end of the GB4 championship um, at the beginning of the season. Ah, yes, of course he was, yeah. I remember that now because I remember that Snetterton, the, uh, when uh, he, he no longer was, and, uh, the, uh, and I was, I've been looking forward to seeing him. So it's good to see him back in a car, and it shows uh, form is temporary, class is permanent. Yeah, he's, uh, he's, he's a very quick driver, is uh, Alex Walker, and is again showing that by the fact that on this lap, I think he has closed the gap down even further, so it's down to just less than 1.5 seconds at the beginning of the lap. This time as they flash their way over the start-finish line, the gap from Lucas Romanek, the number 73 car that leads, back to Alex Walker is a second, because again, three laps on the trot. Alex Walker, new fastest lap of the race, 50.635. That's half a second quicker than the race leader. If he's half a second quicker this lap, he'll then be in the toe. I thought you were going to say the DRS though. <laughs> DRS and Formula 4s, no, <laughs> never to be said in the same sentence. <laughs> Absolutely, but yeah, he's got to be taking it down to sub one second this time round as they go down the Cooper Strait, left-hander at Surtees, and certainly it's not enough to put uh, the uh, the EPGBs off uh, Rummenek. I haven't used that phrase since I was a youngster, but uh, it kind of describes it. Rummenek just looks calm and collected, doesn't he? He's doing as much as he needs to. He got that clear air there in the early stage. He's got 14 minutes left. And Alex Walker is closing in in that 41 car, the pair of black cars at the uh, fight yet. It's another new fastest lap of the race, but he only took a tenth out of the leader, Romanek, this time. He is less than a second, but not as much taken out this time as it was the last tour. Yeah, we had a, uh, a slight off at Paddock Hill Bend for Nathan Down at the will of the Getham Mikhail on the previous lap. He manages to get the car out of the gravel trap and will continue on his merry way after that, uh, that brief moment. Lucas Romanek turns his way for the eighth time out of Graham Hill Bend and along the Cooper Strait with Alex Walker looming ever larger in his mirrors at this stage. He is now, I think, within the distance that he's going to pick up a slight advantage from the hole in the air that our race leader, Lucas Romanek, is making. The one thing that Alex Walker needs to try and do is make sure he stays in the confines of the circuit. He did that beautifully in the race earlier on. Can't afford to run wide, can you? You can push, 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 but once you start running wide, then you're in danger, aren't you? Mm, yeah, exactly. And uh, not only that, that we also know we're going to get uh, warnings as well. Fifth lap on the trot, he set the fastest lap. This time it's a 50.439 second lap from Alex Walker. So the gap, first to second, now comes down to six tenths of a second between the pair of them. Morgan Quinn is now nearly two and a half seconds down the road in third place. And he, in turn, is now getting caught by the charging Jordan Kelly. So Morgan Quinn could lose out soon. Yeah, it's suddenly become a bit Noah's Ark, hasn't it? Two by two as uh, Quinn is definitely into the clutches of Kelly. I love what Walker's doing. Is that he's almost, It reminds me of Sergei Bubka, the pole vaulter, always just taking a little bit out of the record, a little bit each time, almost as if someone sold him for every fastest lap he gets, he'll get a cash prize. I never. I, I mean, I've seen your physique. I never had you down as a pole vaulter in the past, but there you go. Hey, I'm, I've, I've got the physique of a racing snake, mate. <laughs> Over the start finish line goes Lucas Romanek, still continuing to lead the way. Lead advantage came out. It is exactly three quarters of a second that time as they came over the start finish line. So Lucas Romanek responding to the fact that Alex Walker was getting closer to him. But I think Lucas made probably a bit of a hash almost there of Druids. There was lots of tyre squeal. And all of a sudden it looked as though Alex Walker has brought that lead advantage down again to a degree. Great fight still going on for third and fourth as well. Morgan Quinn having to work overtime to try and keep the blue car with a white stripe down the side, which is going to be... Jordan Kelly at bay. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of looking and wondering whether the, uh, the the temperatures changed a little bit out there again because it just seems to have changed somewhat for our race leader Lucas Romanek is that uh, doesn't really have a full answer for the chase in Alex Walker. I mean, he has a little bit. He did a personal best last time round, but equally Morgan Quinn being chased by the 99 car of Kelly is that both of them just seem to have dropped back ever so slightly. Although that time round. 
it was uh, status quo between the top two. Romanek and Walker both doing 50.7s. But look at this fight for third position. Morgan Quinn under huge pressure. Remember, it's five points for a class win. It's an extra two for the overall win. Well, at the moment, five points for the class win and the two for the overall win. Going the way of Lucas Romanek. That would put him on 32 championship points at the end of this race. Morgan Quinn sits there in third. That would give him three points. That would put him on 33 at the end of this. So there's a point between them. Morgan Quinn cannot afford to lose the place to Jordan Kelly. So at the moment, he's still got it by one point. By one point. Wow, and, and you know, maybe that's the pressure, but he's just sort of eased it off a little bit too much, and he's found himself in a vulnerable position there with the 99 car of Kelly, the pair of blue cars that are sat there, that second pair, that is where the championship really hinges right now. Uh, the only one thing is, if, if he does lose a place, they'd be drawn on points, and then it'd have to go to count back and who'd had most wins, and that's where I'll be reliant on James Beckett to tell me that, because all he gets the points, not the position finishes. And I don't know whether this makes a difference for the champion of brands, because uh, Chris Sharp has got his oh, hand no. in the air. In the, uh, in the historic, uh, uh, beautiful, uh, what was it, the Palliser. Palliser. Uh, and uh, he's just cruising back to the pit lane. I don't know, I think he's probably done enough to have secured that, or is he likely to be vulnerable in the champion of France? Uh, Simon Proust, depending on where he finishes, could do it, but Simon Proust is running in third, third position in the class, so I think that is probably going to be sufficient, depending on where John Barnes is doing. John Barnes is second in the heritage class, so I think he's all right. OK, well, uh, and that was, sorry, that, I got thrown then by the fact that the two blue cars in the lead got were lapping a blue car, and I thought we had a, a change then for it, but it is a listen to the screeching of tyres from those uh, Formula 4 cars as they push it in. My wife got to drive a Formula 4 car yesterday round uh, Castle Coombe, and she absolutely adored it. Uh, they're rather snug, aren't they, Formula 4? Just Fours. a smidge. We had yep. someone uh, on the day yesterday at the racing school at Coombe that was six foot seven, tried to get into the Formula 4, and they went... Yeah, it always amazed me how someone like Justin Wilson was able to carve a single-seater ca uh, career because he was such a tall guy, the late, great Justin Wilson. Um, so uh, this fight still going on for third and fourth position. Morgan Quinn still pushing as hard as he dare. He's still got absolutely in his mirrors uh, Jordan Kelly, who's not going away. So the pair of two blue cars, the two blue cars head over the start-finish line. Lucas Romanek still also leading the race overall. The lead advantage there seems to have settled, doesn't it, now, yeah. between Lucas Romanek in the lead and Alex Walker. It's been around three quarters of a second for the last few laps. Yeah, and uh, I noticed that the third place, Morgan Quinn, the 88 car, uh, the first of the two blue cars battling it out there, just putting a new personal best. So that challenge and the lure of the championship just eking a little bit more out of him. The problem is that 50.732 compared to a 50.778 of the chasing 99 car of Jordan Kelly, so still under huge pressure, but it's certainly trying to bring some uh, personal best lap times out of him, isn't it? Uh, it is, yeah, so pushing on. I'm assuming Jordan Kelly is registered for the championship. If he's not, then it becomes a bit of a mute point as to whether he gets passed or not, but for the purposes of, of excitement and trying to work out the maths, we'll, we'll assume that the number 99 car is eligible for championship points. Uh, we've got just under eight minutes of this race to go. 14 laps have been completed. Lucas Romanek has led everyone so far, despite the fact that Alex Walker has been looming reasonably large in his mirrors for the last half dozen laps or so. The lead advantage did come down last time through. It came down by a tenth of a second, so it's now down to 0.6 of a second. So maybe Alex Walker has had a breather for a few laps and is now in full attack mode again. Talking of attack mode, look at this, heading down the Cooper straight, third and fourth, absolutely glued together. I thought we were going to see a challenge by Jordan Kelly, the 99 car with the, the blue car with a white stripe front to back there was certainly lining up looking as if he felt that it was possibly on for him there but just couldn't quite find the opportunity so sits there still in fourth place Morgan Quinn number 88 still there in third the diminutive Morgan uh, just trying desperately to hold on to that third position round he goes down the hill before rising back up again to the Druids hairpin the pair of leaders are already exiting the hairpin and they've got a battling pair of back markers just ahead of them. Yeah, John Barnes isn't at the wheel of the Van Diemen RF90 that sits ahead the white car and he is busy squabbling away. John Barnes sees them coming. Lucas Romanek seizes the opportunity to try and squeeze his way through. Uh, unfortunately, however, Alex Walker also follows him through as well. So the lead pair are now absolutely together and there's still another back marker that they need to deal with, which is Sean Macklin, who doesn't want to get involved in any of that. He just stays out of harm's way. So race leaders are now together. This is the best opportunity for Alex Walker. He's worked tirelessly hard to catch the race leader. He's been about six, seven tenths of a second behind him for lap after lap after lap. And now the back markers have allowed him to be 
less than two tenths behind him. He'll be fully picking up the toe on this lap. Yeah, and if you think that he was able to lap a little bit quicker in the early stages, now he's got the toe. Is he going to go towards the outside of the uh, hairpin? Not quite, so Druids, they both go line astern round that, down, plunging back down towards Graham Hill Bend. He's trying to actually take the pace through Graham Hill Bend onto the Cooper Stake rather than looking up the inside there, and he's done that. He wasn't compromised on the apex, so he could carry all that speed through the corner up in towards Surtees, McLarens and in towards Clearways they go. Behind them, incidentally, the third and fourth place battle are now trying to get past those back markers. And at the moment, it is staying in the same order for third and fourth as well. I say that because we saw it squeeze up for the, the front pair, didn't we? But uh, at the moment, it seems to have worked out safely for the third and fourth pair. Yep, so up towards Paddock Hill Bend, this is now 17 laps completed. Pressure building for Lucas Romanek, who has now got just two tenths of a second between himself and Alex Walker. So that is roughly a Formula Ford length when they get towards the apexes of the corner. There's still more traffic up the road as well that they'll have to deal with before too much longer. And that is going to be, I think, Bob Hawkins at the wheel of his Ray GR08 is the next of those. Is it that they're going to uh, put a lap on? No, it's 96. No, it is, you're right. Yeah, so it's Nathan Down is the next of those that they're going to want to try and work their way through and past. And time is still plenty for Alex Walker to see if he can unlock the door to the lead of the race. They'll have the lap that they are just finishing and probably a further five laps thereafter before we see the chequered flag. Uh, third and fourth place, that actually split those two up as they came through the back markers. Uh, Jordan Kelly, 99, just got compromised. It looked like a very good job by Morgan Quinn to, to make sure there was a back marker between the pair of them. That pair of back markers have suddenly picked up their fight again and just noticed in towards Paddock Hill Ben. But the leaders make it round Druid, still the same. The white flashes tell us that it's Lucas Romanek that still just about has the lead in the 73 car. But Alex Walker there chomping at the bit, trying to find a way as they got passed down. It just brought them together again for a moment. But they're through and they've got some daylight before they get involved with any other lap traffic for uh, probably a good couple of laps, I would suggest. So it now just comes down to the, the pair of them with their gloves off. Formula Ford has been providing brilliant, brilliant racing for over half a century now. And it still is just a joy, isn't it, watching yep. Formula Ford racing. Uh, over the start finish line now go. Still together. Lucas Romanek still cannot get rid of Alex Walker despite his best efforts. He's just not going away, is he? And as they head this time for the 20th time up towards Druids, Alex Walker weaves one way, weaves the other. Lucas Romanek just concentrates on the road ahead. He's not going to get drawn into looking in his mirrors, but that's what Alex Walker wants him to do any sort of mistake and Alex Walker is poised and is ready to pounce out of Graham Hill Bend along the Cooper Strait. They're on lap number 20. The lead advantage is, well, next to nothing. It really is incredible, isn't it? I mean, like you say, it's always entertaining racing with Formula Fords. I really wish they would lower the age that you can start racing in this because a lot of uh, youngsters have already leapt onto other things and to get this mechanical grip lesson in Formula Fords is priceless instead of jumping straight into wings and slicks. It is always incredible racing to work out how to control a car that's on the edge of out of control, to quote a film. Uh, and, you know, these, these drivers really, it's like a ballet half the time. The way they just have them under their spell is just fantastic. Defensive line there from Romanek. He can feel the pressure on his throat, can't he? He can. Almost the nose cone of Alex Walker is onto the gearbox of Lucas Romanek as they went round through Druids that time. Both of them using as much tarmac as they dare, really, running the car right the way out towards the very edge of the red and white curb, but no further than that. So they're on lap number 21 at the moment. Together, round through Surtees, up towards McLaren is the door open for Alex Walker to try and squeeze his way through. He was almost trying to prise it open, but Lucas Romanek just got the car position where he needed to, so that Alex Walker was not able to get through. So over the start finish line, two minutes remaining. The lap they've started, two more thereafter. Wow, so, so, and Alex Walker is diving up towards the inside. Oh, thinks better of it. He certainly took a sneaky sniffer as he got towards Paddock Hill Bend, but just had to drop out and tuck himself behind Lucas Romanek. And I have to say, Mark, it looked like Lucas knew that as well, didn't he? Because he didn't really change his line. He took the, uh, the wide line to carry the speed through and plunge him back down the hill again. In, and he just needs to keep his cool, doesn't he? 
He does, yeah, absolutely. There's traffic to deal with again, though, which is going to be Simon Pruce's Reynard that they'll need to squeeze their way through and pass. They did that even before they got towards Graham Hill Bend, so the lead battle is on again once more. They're about to start their penultimate lap of the race this time through, and there could well be some more traffic as well that they'd need to deal with, and this time it will be the Ray of Bob Hawkins that they could meet, potentially, before they see the chequered flag. So through goes Bob over the start-finish line. Here comes Lucas Romanek, followed by Alex Walker, who through over the course of that lap has just fallen away to the tune of about three tenths of a second but visually you can see the gap has opened up quite a lot mm, yeah interesting and uh, i think that really came from attempting to have a little look as they got towards paddock hill bend and it just compromised plus there was a back marker as they came out of druids last time and uh, down towards graham hill bend they go and they're going to have quite a rapid uh, back marker to encounter bob hawkins number 91 the uh, the dragster racer that is uh, are they going to even encounter him i think they are on this last lap aren't they yeah i think they are yeah they're going to catch him on the last lap of the race so uh, out of clear ways and on towards clark curve onto the brabham straight for the penultimate time the checkered flag will greet them next time through so onto the last lap of the race they'll go bob hawkins still to deal with at some point neither lucas romanek or alex walker can afford to be compromised through the traffic where they're going to meet bob should be on the run up towards druids and hopefully you'll see them coming and stay out of the way lucas romanek is he going to get past before druids yes he does bob hawkins stays out of the way so alex walker squeezes his way through as well and as they come down in towards graham hill bend for the final time they are still together chris they are absolutely and still in third position is the 88 morgan quint that we believe by the mass is uh, is going to be just about holding on to the uh, the championship lead that he had as he arrived at this circuit but the lead two are already making their way towards clearways for the final time yep so as long as lucas romanek claims the five points for the win plus the seven uh, plus the extra two points for the overall win uh, so five points for a class win, extra two points for the overall win. That's seven points added to his tally. That makes him 32 points in total for the season. Uh, Alex Walker finishing in second place, but finishing in third, I think, will make it 33 points in total for the season for Morgan Quinn, who by one point will be the uh, AMC Solutions United Formula Ford champion for this year in association with LMC Technologies, if I've got the maths right. And I also think the champion of brands for this year, despite his retirements, should be Chris Sharple still, who, at the wheel of his historic, class I think had done enough albeit John Barnes did have a good run in the closing stages and picked up the win in the heritage class but that would only put him five points adrift still now so I think that's right yeah so I think we've got um, Morgan Quinn as the United Formula Ford champion. James Beckett will know downstairs for sure. He's bound to be around somewhere. And I think we've got Chris Sharples as the champion of brands for this year. So I think that's the way it will work out. So well done to Lucas Romanek. I pinned my flag to the mast with Lucas Romanek at the beginning of the day and thought he'd have a good weekend. And he has because not only did he win the final two champion of brands races in 2021, he's also won the final two here in 2022. Let's confirm the results with you as the cars make their way into towards the pit lane area. Lucas Romanek does the double here at Brands Hatch and wins with Alex Walker finishing in second position. And Morgan Quinn third is sufficient, I think, to claim the championship by a single point. Jordan Kelly was there in fourth place ahead of Neil Tofts in fifth place. And sixth off the back of the grid was James Hadfield. Bob Hawkins was there in seventh place with Nathan Down in eighth place. And in ninth place, it was Jonathan Barnes that claimed the heritage class uh, with Sean Macklin completing the top 10 at the wheel of his Swift. Just outside of the top 10 was Simon Proust, who finished in 11th place. And unfortunately, we lost the only car in the historic class, Chris Sharples, with problems early on in the race. But I think he still has done sufficient to be crowned the champion of brands for 2022. So the car's making their way down towards the bottom of the pit lane. None of them this time being brought in towards Park Ferme, which means uh, hopefully it's going to be a much, much quicker process to chat to our drivers and, of course, see if we can catch up with the champions as well, because hopefully James Beckett Motorsport uh, and their maths match my maths and uh, Morgan Quinn may well have finished third in the race, but he will be the United Formula Ford champion for this year, which, of course, is the first year of United Formula Ford, the new championship that was launched at the beginning of the season by James Beckett Motorsport. So brilliant racing as ever from Formula Ford. Shame that that is their last racing action of the 2022 championship season. But we look forward to seeing a lot more of Formula Ford, both here at Brands and hopefully with the United Championship visiting the likes of Cadwell and Snetterton and Donington and Alden Park and all of those circuits over the course of the 2023 season. So.
think we're nearly there. We're about ready to hand downstairs and grab a word with Chris Dawes before we then look forward to what will be our final race of the day, the Turismo X. But uh, even after Turismo X, our next race that's coming up, the last race of the day, do hang around still because we've got the Enduro KA qualifying coming up. Whether you're here at Circuit or you're watching the live stream at home, do hang around for Enduro KA qualifying. But before all of that, let's hand you back downstairs to Chris Dawes, who's in the pit lane. Well, down here, we've got the uh, the top three are already down here, so let's go and have a word with these guys. They've enjoyed this one. Lucas, wow, congratulations. This time it was uh, fully leading it from the front, but the pressure was relentless. Yeah, I know. I kept, I, I kept, well, every couple of laps, I'd look in my mirror just to see where he was at. It was just getting close and close and closer. And, yeah, in the end, just managed to hold on, really. But Oldfield Motorsport gave me a great car this weekend um, even if it did go up a little to the end but yeah, a little bit but not not too much but anyway she's a quick girl and that's all that matters wow quick driver as well well done Thank cracking you. double victory there alex wow you weren't going to mess about this time were you You couldn't quite get that win but i think you even tried the kitchen sink it this time <laughs> yeah no i put everything towards lucas then but he did a really good job made no mistakes um and yeah we just really good pace throughout the back mark has got a bit interesting throughout <laughs> um but no it was a really good fun fun day here at brands well done mate fabulous Thank job you. right let's go this way come on through because this is not only our third driver but it is our united formula four champion i mean how does that sound morgan Sounds pretty good, you know that that race is over. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I was uh, having a bit of pressure from my teammate there, but he, he, let, he let me have it. I was struggling a lot in that race. But, uh, he, uh, but it was kind enough to keep behind me. <laughs> yeah. It did look like he was going to at times, and it looked like some massive pressure. And, and what was going through your mind at that point? Uh, just looking at the time board, I said, on left, head on left. So, um, I'm just happy that it's not over a bit. It's done, I think it was only by one point possibly in the end, yeah. but congratulations, great yeah. championship win. Yeah, thank you. So there we go, Morgan Quinn, third in the race, championship win, what a fantastic job. Quickly, I know they're off, but very quickly, quick move, what a fantastic season. It's been another great year's racing with MSVR, champion of brands, um, and United Formula 4 deliver every time. Big, big thanks to everybody who's involved and who's helped support all the way through the year. And let's come and do it again next year. Fantastic. On that word, that's fantastic. Hand back to Mike Werrell. It's Turismo X. Yep, so it's Turismo X are on their formation lap, their final race of the championship season. Let's have a look at the way that the grid lines up for this last race. Remember, the championship is still up for grabs. It's going to be Darren Goes who starts there on pole position. He was the race winner earlier on today, so he goes from pole. And alongside is the Honda Civic of Richard Clark. Row two of the grid is Dylan Brichter and Gary Hufford's BMW. And row three is Jamie Hayes. And then we should have George Wright for this race. The fourth row of the grid, it's Al Bull alongside Clive Goldthorpe. And row number five, there'll be a gap on the inside. James Owen's car was not there when the grid was formed up. So it's just Lewis Gatt on his own on the fifth row of the grid. And Adam Blair starts off the back of the grid. He was still circulating at the end of the last race. He lost 12 laps, though, with a repair to the car, but he wasn't classified as a race finisher. So it does mean that coming into this race, if I've got the maths right, Darren Goes is on 301 points, six points in the lead from Adam Blair, who's on 295, and Dylan Brichter is now on 282, and is third in the championship. I think that's the way the maths work, but that is my maths. So it is always um, uh, got a, a caveat and several question marks beside it. But um, Darren goes, yeah, picking up the championship lead. Um, had uh, Adam Blair had been classified as a finisher in the position he was, they would have been tied on points coming into this one. So it could have been even closer. But no, Darren goes is the championship leader. He starts from pole position. He's had the pace all day as well because he was fastest in qualifying. He was fastest in Super Pole. He won the race earlier on today with fastest lap as well. So it's all gone his way today, whereas Adam Blair has had uh, a range of issues with the car with uh, I think it was some uh fuel pumps and fuel pressures and fuses and other things going in the car so it's been a bit of a torrid weekend for him so Darren goes lines up the Audi on pole position he's got the Honda sitting alongside it's the Seat and the BMW on row number two row number three it's a Seat and a Volkswagen Golf and row number four it is a Lotus and a Golf with the Renault 
and the Seat Leon at the tail end of the field. Watch out for Adam Blair off the back of the grid because he also, remember, has got a championship to think about. So championship leader at the front of the grid, second in the championship off the back of the grid for this one. Small grid though, red lights are on, red lights go out now and it is a brilliant start from Gary Hufford from the second row of the grid. Slightly slow away there was both from Roman Darren Goes and Richard Clark, but finally in the second phase, Darren Goes gets the Audi through into the lead of the race with Gary Hufford's BMW there in second place and Richard Clark at the wheel of the Honda is there in third place. Dylan Brichter and Adam Blair side by side for what will be fourth and fifth position. So it's been a really good start from Adam Blair off the tail end of the field to carve his way through the order. But as they head out of Druids and said, head downhill in towards Graham Hill Bend for, for the first time, it is Darren Goes that leads the way, oh, leads the way at this stage from Gary Hufford in second position. And then we get to Richard Clark's Honda City now in third place fourth at the moment what a start Adam Blair up to fourth from the back of the grid yeah super impressive that uh, he's, he's got to do everything hasn't he here to, to try and wrestle it back in reality it's interesting someone was saying earlier is that this is uh, another different car for them so it was always uh, a degree of risk I would imagine coming into this and uh, they'll be hoping that that uh, the fuel pickup issue is is all put to bed and they can just get on and start moving forward. But Darren Goes knows that's coming, so he's cantered off into the distance as soon as he possibly can. Hasn't yeah, he? so Adam's been in the in the Audi TT for most of the year, hasn't he? Mm. Yeah, I thought he had. So uh, the leader getting away, three cars fighting over what is second, third and fourth place. It's the Class X car of Gary Hufford that hangs on to second position at the moment, despite the best efforts of the Honda of Richard Clark. Followed then by Adam Blair, so they all sit there, second, third and fourth together, nose to tail as they flick their way through Surtees and McLaren. And Adam Blair fires one up the inside of Richard Clark and puts the Seat up into third position. He now needs to think about attacking the next of the cars up the road, which is going to be Gary Hufford. But then he runs wide, having gained one place on the way into the corner. He loses it on the way out. We've also lost Jamie Hayes into the grass. But for poor old Adam Blair, all of the hard work that he's done all seems to have come undone all of a sudden. And wow, that Civic was looking up the inside of the BMW, but it just didn't quite work. Hufford kept his foot in round the outside, and thankfully they all have managed to avoid any kind of contact with each other. And so the uh, the BMW still sat there in second, number 45, the orange uh, car of Hufford, with the uh, the Civic that just did a brilliant job in that first race, didn't he? And uh, it did Clark, number 66. But uh, this time he's the one that's not defending, he's the one on the offence, isn't he? Yeah, so Gary Hufford, the most powerful car that we've got in the field this weekend, but um, at the moment he is still managing to stay ahead of the far more nimble cars that sit behind, the likes of Richard Clark and then of Adam Blair. So in a straight line as the Beamer got the legs over what is a very quick Honda in a straight line. Now he's still got the speed, hasn't he? That is such a quick Honda in a straight line. Who's braver on the brakes? Gary Hufford is. Hangs on to second place. Needs to make sure he takes the apex at Paddock Hill Bend and doesn't run wide. Brilliant stuff. Hangs on to second. And all of this is playing beautifully into the hands, isn't it, of Darren Goes, who's away in the lead. Yeah, I think I'm almost going to have to tell him that there was a race going on behind him at this rate. I know when we speak to him downstairs, but at the end of the day, he's doing everything he needs to do. And he has done since the, uh, the get-go this morning. Just at the end of the day, he's not in control of what other people can do, is he? So he's only in control of his own job, and he's done that brilliantly. Up into second place does go the uh, the Honda. He's managed to get past Hufford's BMW, so 66 Clark up into second place, and it still looks like the number one car of Blair trying desperately to follow him through, and Hufford's held him back. Yep, so brilliant stuff. He's, has he held him back enough, though, uh, on a straight line? Has the Beamer got the legs? There's almost a touch between the pair of them. There was not a lot of daylight there, but Gary Hufford still manages to cling on to what is third position and for Adam Blair if he can get past that car it is an extra championship point for him because it will mean he will then finish ahead of one car that is a class higher than him at this stage so ah, yeah, of course. it's important important for him to try and get past Gary Hufford's car yeah he's uh, definitely trying absolutely everything as they came out of Druids trying to look up the inside at Graham Hill Bend he's now throwing it up there there was no invite and no waiting to be told he could he just threw it up the inside there got himself up into third place and as you say that is that extra point there's bad news for him is the two ahead of him have already managed to scamper off into the distance yeah that moves him from 22 points up to 25 points now in reality so uh, uh, you would get 24 for third but he's now ahead of a car that's a class he uh, higher than him so it's quite a, a, a complex system the way that points work in Turismo X but it is good fun trying to track it all down at the end 
of the championship season. So Darren Goes leads the way at the wheel of his Audi. Now by 4.1 seconds, you can visually see the gap, but one car is only just coming out of Paddock Hill Bend in second place, and the race leader is already up at Druid. So that's a relative gap between Audi and Honda. Now what we need to try and keep an eye on is what Adam Blair does at the wheel of the third place, number one, Seat, in his pursuit of the number 66 Honda. He's pushing hard, isn't he? Oh, and Blair's just run very wide on the exit of Graham Hill Bend there. I'm sure he'll have triggered the cameras down there as well, but more to the point, it just four-wheel drifted, didn't it? And it was, it was ironic that it did that because I was just about to say, I forgot to ask Darren Goes what happened to him at the tail end of race one because he definitely went off the boil, didn't he? So Darren's doing this now, but how much is he destroying those tyres for the closing stage of this race? I mean, he's still got 14 and a half minutes left to go. Yeah, he's just set the fastest lap of the race, so the tyres are in good condition at the moment. 51.785 seconds, 51.785. Well, that is only about a tenth of a second shy of the fastest lap that he did in race one as well. So that will also pick him up a championship point as well. So Darren goes looking to try and scoop up maximum points and see whether that is enough to propel him towards the championship. At the moment, if uh, he stays where he is and Adam Blay stays where he is, he would be the champion, Darren goes, in another 14 minutes' time. Interesting as well, if you look at the number two car, Dylan Brichter sat there in uh, fifth place. He's closing in on that orange BMW, the number 45 car of Hufford, because uh, what did he do last time? 50. It's not a lot in it, but you can just see that that car is starting to close in on the, the BMW now. Clive Goldthorpe at the wheel of the number 27 Volkswagen Golf. It's been a very busy golf as that uh, car today. It's been out in, I think, everything other than the Formula Ford races, hasn't it? We've seen that Volkswagen Golf in not pretty for the much so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for some reason, they wouldn't let him in. No, no. Other than that, they'd have put an entry in, that's absolutely for sure. That oh. car is running around in 10th position, so it's in last place at the moment. And we've also got a good fight going on between George Wright in his Volkswagen Golf and Al Bull in the Lotus. That's just heading up towards Paddock Hill Bend. That will be for 6th and 7th place. Now the number one Blair car has got himself up into third. He's not managing to pull away from Hufford BMW, really, is he? He's still sat there, not necessarily having to worry about it, but he's not pulling away, and he's definitely not closing in on the lead, too. He was uh, 0.8 slower than Clark, and even, oh, well, a second and a half slower than Darren goes. So I wonder whether he's just making sure that he gets that car to the finish in third and see where that could leave him. What could happen to Darren in the closing stages? He's got to be sort of in the mix, hasn't he, at the very least, even if he can't catch Darren now. Yeah, as long as he's there or thereabouts, uh, I, I think he probably realises that the championship is edging away from him over the course of today. Yeah, it's uh, the, the, the damage to his disappointment will have been done earlier, but uh, he, as I said with Darren just doing his job, is that that's, that's all that, uh, uh, that he can do now as well in that number one car. Uh, Adam Blair just needs to... to bring it home and he's fought quickly through to that third place hasn't he but just looks like unless he's just allowing it to to cool down again now yeah i think gary hufford's closing back in on him isn't he by the yeah. look of things so there goes the number 45 car in the hands of gary hufford fourth overall still leading class x by virtue of the fact he's the only entrance in it this weekend and let's just have a quick look at the relative lap times from number one adam blair at the wheel of the large in white and red Seatly and Supercopa and Gary Hufford. Yet yeah, there's two tenths of a second difference between them, so the gap closes between the pair. Yeah, and that seems to be the proverbial elastic because it will then stretch back out again and then close back, and it just kind of shows how tight it is. Darren disappears down at the uh, Cooper Straight. That was uh, a fair bit slower last time round, which uh, meant he was going about the same pace as the second place car, number 66, Clark in the Honda Civic. Uh, and, uh, but the gap was still, what we at, four and three quarters seconds last time round, but with 11 and a quarter to go, we just to see what we're going to see from Darren Goes. Here he comes to complete his 10th lap, double figures in the book now, uh, and it's a 53 mark. So he is starting to just drop those couple of seconds, and it's nearly a second quicker for Clark in second place. Yeah, so uh, well, we saw that, didn't we, late yeah. on, that he just started to drop away a little bit. So we'll see as to how much drop-off there is. As for Adam Blair, well, he's just put in his fastest lap that he has done in the race so far at the wheel of the number one, Sautley and Supercope. He's done a 52.598. That's nearly half a second quicker than the race leader Darren Goes could muster on that particular lap. Traffic to deal with as well for Gary Hufford as he tries to work his way through and past Clive Goldthorpe's Volkswagen Golf. He should <laughs> squeeze through and past it on the run down in towards Graham Hill Bend. But Dylan Brickton was very decisive <laughs> that he wanted to go through at the same point. Didn't he do well there? He's now right on the back with that 
BMW, he's definitely in the mix. Oh. So uh, that was a good lunge. It goes to show how much you can gain or lose with the traffic, isn't it? Right, Darren Goes goes through. He's back down to 52.5, so he's only a second off his best this time. But he still lost about another tenth to Clark, but he'll settle for that, wouldn't he? Because his lead is 3.8, 10 minutes left to go. If that's all he's able to eat into his lead, I don't think he'll panic too much. They still look a, a really pretty car, don't yeah. they, say, at Leon Super Cope. But when you consider that this car is now, Crumbs, what, it's nearly 20 years old, isn't it? It's about 15 years of age. A lot break there from Adam Blair, though, as he went in towards Druids. Uh, of course, we did have a not just a, a one-make series for them here in the UK that supported the British Touring Car Championship, but also there was a European series, wasn't it, yeah. for the Sayatli and Supercopa. There was a Spanish series. It was very much um, uh, of the time, wasn't it? And, and even now, yeah, 15 years later, the cars still look fab. Yeah, it's quite surprising when Seat pulled out of the likes of British Touring Cars as well, wasn't it? They decided they'd done enough, they'd got their name well enough known, uh, and, and they pulled out of that as well, considering what a good race car they made. And, and like you say, what a pretty race car they make as well. It'd be uh, good to see them come back in force because they've shown they've got the metal. Or, or, uh, but it's good to see that there's these legacy cars still out there being raced, isn't it? It is, yeah. So cadence braking there from Dylan Brichter as the rear brakes were locking up on him, heading in towards Paddock Hill Bend. So you could see them lock and unlock and look and unlock as he tried to get the car back under his control. So didn't lose too much time there to Gary Hufford, who he's trying to fight away with. The uh, Sayat that's ahead of him, just heading around through Graham Hill Bend now, which is Adam Blair, is still pushing on. Is he bringing the gap down to those ahead of him? No, he's not, but we do still need to keep an eye on what's going on with the race leader as Dylan Brichter sneaks up the inside of Gary Hufford's BMW heading around through Surtees and McLaren. That's the change for fourth and fifth position. So it is now Audi from Honda from Seat from Seat. The one gap that we do need to keep an eye on is what's going on with Darren Goes because he had eased his pace a little bit and the gap had started to close. He's gone quicker that time at the wheel of the Audi, so the gap has opened back up again. Yeah, he was 0.3 quicker than second place car Clark there, wasn't it? So, uh, yeah, is he just managing it? That would be interesting. You said Blair's still pushing on. He certainly is because, again, he nearly just washed out wide down at Graham Hill Bend. He's trying his best, and he's now got Dylan Brick to be the car behind him. But after the, uh, the lunge by Dylan on Hufford's BMW, that means that it's quite a big gap, isn't there, now between Blair and the chasing car. So he's not under any pressure. Will that free him up now to... Uh, start putting in some uh, Banzai laps and possibly reel in Clark ahead of him. It's a long lot to, to reel in though, isn't it? It is, yeah. Race leader over the start-finish line. Traffic to deal with. Al Bull's Lotus will need to be dispatched at a lap down, but our race leader, Darren Goes, is not going to do that until the exit of Paddock Hill Bend. So Marshall's waving the blue flags. Uh, Al Bull will see race leader coming up alongside him and leaves the door open for Darren Goes to rather effortlessly work his way through and past on the run in towards Druids. There's more traffic just up the road from that, though, and that will be George Wright as well that we'll need dealing with. George running round in the uh, Team Air Supply backed Volkswagen Golf, number 46 car in seventh position. And Darren Goes is not going to meet that car until probably the end of the lap. But the one good thing for Darren is he's got enough time to just work his way past these back markers. He will now be thinking about the championship because we're only seven minutes away from potentially him being crowned the Turismo X champion for 2022. The interesting one to bear in mind now, Mark, is that as they go down the Cooper Strait towards the left-hander of Surtees, the sun, you can't see it that clear. Well, there you can suddenly could. The sun is out now. It's been really gloomy most of today, hasn't it? Which is what they'll have been prepared for. The sun is out right at the worst time, Mark, because it's really low, isn't it? It is. And at that point, they're staring straight at it as they suddenly get to that very quick left-hander of Surtees. And is, is it going to throw any of them? Because I doubt they've put any kind of uh, tinted visors on or anything. Some of them might well have done that this time of year. It was the same here for truck racing a couple of weekends ago, is that um, you know, we needed to get the firework display done, but we ended up with the, the, all of the clouds disappearing. <laughs> so we had to delay the fireworks. But again, it's so low in the sky. And yeah, you're looking straight at it. And all you can see is silhouettes when you're going down there. So a lot of the drivers will put a tint on their visor, maybe for this second one. Darren Goes looks as though he's got a tint on his visor. However, it looks like the visor is up in his car and not down so he's clearly happy with the way things are going at the moment with now just what five and three quarter minutes to go over the start finish line he goes with 16 laps completed the lead advantage is 3.5 seconds between himself and the number 66 honda in the hands of richard clark yeah it looks at the moment like he's got it under control and i wonder if uh what you're saying about with his visor up does he then put that down with Possibly. the tin on it yeah. on the cooper straight yeah and that would make sense because the problem reason why i said have they put tint on is that it was just still gloomy when they started um, but yeah they, they need to avoid that uh, risk 
or of the impact of it, then it makes sense. So down goes Darren goes into that sun, beaming in his eyes. And uh, he didn't look like he was struggling at that point, did he? No, not at all. He's still pressing on. Everyone else just filing their way through and past Surtees. Adam Blair just heading up towards Surtees now. Dylan Brichter, his teammate, not that far behind in fourth place. Gary Hufford in the BMW. Sitting there in fifth position, they're all fairly equidistantly spread. It's about a three-second gap back from second to third and about three seconds back from third to fourth as well. So the gaps are reasonably similar at this stage. And in fact, even from first to second, it's about a three-second gap at this stage. So everybody is um, within similar touching distance of each other, which is able to see them, but not close enough to really get too excited about at this stage. Four and a half minutes to go for the 18th time. Darren goes heads down through Graham Hill Bend. It's now not just a race lead that he's got there. It is a uh, championship that he could be securing. He's going to be hearing everything. He's going to be feeling everything going wrong. It, it, it's just going to be feeling horrible to him in that car, isn't it? Because you're just ready for the worst to happen. He says with experience of trying to secure a championship. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, Darren Goes has been in this position before, so um, he will know what it's like. Because remember, he did win uh, what was the, the pre predecessor to this championship, uh, which was called the MSV Super Cup. He was the overall champion for that back in 2019, was Darren Goes. So he's been in this position before. Uh, he'll know what it feels like. The nerves might be jangling, or he might think, I've been here before what's the point in getting nervous all i can do is keep doing what i'm doing and he's not put a wheel wrong as yet so far today whether it be qualifying whether it be super pole whether it be race one or race two chris he's had the pace in every session he really has and, and he just has and it's clearly not just fallen into his hands he has just been on a mission from the get-go the whole body language of him and his car from the minute they were released from the pit lane you could tell that he meant business i mean he's such a cool character when you speak to him everything's so measured and relaxed but you just know that there's that glint in his eye that he's determined to find a way to secure another championship and he's now three and a quarter less than three and a quarter minutes away from securing this Turismo X, bearing in mind he arrived here 30 points down. Yeah, he was, yeah, he was, uh, what was it uh, when they arrived here? He was 33 points adrift in the championship and at the moment is uh, looking good to lift the championship crown as he is about to work his way out of Graham Hill Bend and along the Cooper Strait. This is lap number 20 that it's on at the moment. You can still see that Richard Clark's Honda isn't that far away from him. Richard Clark, though, was four tenths of a second slower in the Honda than the race leader last time through. Then there's quite a gap back now from the second place Honda to the third place car, which is Adam Blair. Adam Blair has got traffic to deal with, though, which is George Wright's Volkswagen Golf. And he can't really afford to be held up, Adam Blair, because his teammate, Dylan Brichter, is still not too far away at the wheel of the number two car. He's a teammate, he's not going to have a lunge on him, though, is he, surely? Oh, actually. <laughs> Bring up Red Bull again. But um, already through onto the 21st lap, two minutes, ten left to go. Dylan Brichter's uh, taking care of what he needed to do. And uh, Darren goes three, still around about that three and a four. And what he's actually done is he's always kept it around that three point something, hasn't he, that lead. Yeah. Uh, and even if he's just backed himself off a little bit, he's just managed that. If he sees that Civic get a little bit bigger in his mirrors, he's able to just find a little bit, just to eke it back out again. So traffic to be dealt with. Dylan Brichter sneaks up the inside of Clive Goldthorpe's car. He's not quite going to get past the next of the Volkswagen Golfs, which is the team air supply one of George Wright. He'll have to wait until just after Surtees and possibly up towards McLaren and Clearways to, to do that one. Darren goes though with a minute and a half remaining on the clock he will be very pleased that everything has largely gone as good as he could possibly have expected over the course of this weekend he'll just be coming out of Druids and heading down in towards Graham Hill Bend on what should be his penultimate lap yep so uh, I didn't clock how many laps we did in the race earlier but it looks like it's 21 be, uh, okay so we're gonna get 23 this time do we have a safety car earlier we did, didn't we? Because Darren goes really went early, didn't he? Did uh, yeah, because of Adam Blair's uh, retirement as a safety right. car. Yeah. Yeah. So they're going to get another couple of laps out of it this time round. But here comes Darren goes round Park Curve. He's going to complete his 22nd lap. Oh, and we've got a retirement there. That just looks like he stopped at retirement up at Druids. The, uh, the number 38, sadly, of Ball. That yeah. was the lead guest class car, wasn't That's, it? That looks like head gasket, potentially, to me. 
So, looking around the side of it, is that steam? It looks more steam than smoke, doesn't it? It's a mechanical issue, that's for sure. So that's Al Bull that's out of the car in the gravel trap up there at Druid's Corner. But for our race leader, the race will still continue. There are 15 seconds to go. And for uh, Darren Goes, he is on course to scoop up the win, his second of the day and in the process scoop up the title so he's just heading through Surtees and McLaren now the race leader for the final time as he carves his way past a little bit more traffic the clock has ticked to zero and for the final time this year Darren Goes makes his way out of clearways and clock curve he was 33 points adrift in the championship coming into today Darren Goes is going to leave Brands Hatch subject to official confirmation as the Turismo X champion for 2022 with a clean sweep of pole positions, wins and fastest laps as well. He couldn't have done any more. He scored absolutely every championship point that was on offer for him over the course of the day. Second over the line is Richard Clark. Third goes the way of Adam Blair, so he will finish runner-up in the championship. Oh, what could have been had it been a slightly better day for him. It was just one of those days, I'm afraid, for Adam Blair. Um, Dylan Brichter finishes in fourth place with Gary Hufford in the end, despite the strong start from the BMW coming through to finish in fifth position. Sixth place should be Jamie Hayes at the wheel of the all-white Seatly and Super Copa. He will shortly take the chequer flag. And we've already had through the likes of George Wright, um, Lewis Gatt uh, and Clive Goldthorpe all to take the chequered flag. So the only retiree we've got, I'm afraid, is that car there stricken in the gravel trap up at... Druids still with the smoke coming from the tail end of it, which suggests that, yes, yeah, something happened that caused him to put the car in the gravel trap or he just wanted to get it stopped as soon as possible to prevent any further mechanical issues. So Darren goes, as he was doing after the race earlier on today, waving out of the window. Well, he was a happy man earlier on when he claimed the win. He's going to be even happier now because it's a double win. And if we've got the maths right, he's the champion in Turismo X for this year. So with the cars making their way back in towards the pit lane, we can hopefully very shortly confirm our results for you for the final Turismo X race of the season. Darren Goes is the winner from Richard Clark in second place, and it was Adam Blair who was there in third. Dylan Brichter was fourth. Gary Hufford won Class X as he finishes in fifth place. And then sixth was Jamie Hayes ahead of George Wright, who won Class A in seventh position. Lewis Gatt was a class winner as he finished there in eighth place, as was Clive Goldthorpe, who finished in ninth place. And I'm afraid the other car that we had out in the race was that retiree at the very tail end of the order, Al Ball at the wheel of the Lotus Elise Series 1, but I think should still be classified as a finisher in that position. So with his car in need of extraction from the gravel trap up there at Druids, I think the front running cars, as they have been largely all day, have now been ushered in towards Park Ferme again, unfortunately. So I think it might just be a while before Chris Dawes is able to catch up with some of them. So it gives uh, the marshals a, a bit of time to scoop cars out of the gravel trap and look forward to what is more action coming up very shortly for us whether you're here at the circuit or watching on the live stream we've got the qualifying session for the enduro ka coming up that will be a one hour qualifying session and that will set the grid for tomorrow's fourth installment if memory serves me correctly of the indycar 500 as it's badged here at brands hatch because it's on the Indy circuit, uh, the car is just a K and an A, so it's Indy K, uh, as in the Ford KA, and 500 because it's a 500-minute race, which means eight hours and 20 minutes of racing to look forward to tomorrow in these little uh, pocket rocket cars, actually. Good fun to drive, they are. I've raced myself in the Indy Car 500 on a couple of occasions. So the sun sets here at Brands Hatch. The sun is already setting on the 2022 championship season. We have crowned our final champion of the weekend as well because that is a Turismo X championship, uh, whereas the KAs is just a series. So it's just a series of races that we'll get from them. So I think we're still awaiting the cars to be released from Park Ferme. So we'll leave you in peace for the moment, but we will be handing downstairs to Chris Dawes very shortly.
So uh, clearing up of the final few cars just being done. So now it's time for Chris Dawes to catch up with the driver and hopefully a champion down there in the pit lane. Down here with the top three, they've made their way down towards us and we see we're right next to this absolutely beautiful Audi RS3 TSR that uh, was driven by our champ of 2022. Double race win, Darren, come here, my friend. Oh, wow. I mean, could you have really have, have believed this before today? Oh, uh, yeah, absolutely shattered. So it's my sixth race today. Um, and yeah, the car, the car was brilliant, but we had no tyres at the end. Um, and he was just catching me, I think, the second <laughs> of the lap. Uh, just looked in my mirror and saw his lights getting closer and closer. Uh, was it like, no, no, let me have it? So, yeah, just, just going into clear the sun's really low yeah. uh, we just couldn't see anything so it was a guess where you're going so a few hairy moments going through there uh, ironically we were talking about that we wondered whether you had a, a, a tint on your visor that yeah, came down then it was up and down up and because it's quite dark down here yeah. so yeah it was all over but no we did it it's, i'm glad it was just 20 minutes <laughs> yeah. not quite sure how i would have done with five more minutes but especially seeing these lights behind me was it the same in race one because we saw you lose speed at the end there as well uh, no race one uh, were the same tires for the day so just trying to save tyres at the end. Ah, fine, fine. Yeah. I mean, we, I was talking about the fact that you must have felt everything, heard everything, and it's just like, but I mean, I know you've won a cha you know, championships in the past and you're, you're practised at this, but even so, when it's that close. Have I won it then? Oh, we believe you have, I think. Right. I think we have. I think so you have. I was third coming into it. Well, yeah, according to the championship table, you were second. Oh, there you go. I uh, didn't even know that. So, yeah, the points have been very, very Provisional. Close anyone's race, yeah. yeah so, we, uh, we think you have. That was by our maths. You arrived here 33 points behind the race lead or something like that, and uh, we think that you've won it. But don't take our word for it. We're not the officials. Uh, you, they can sort that out for you. But either way, I mean, today, it's just been perfect, hasn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's been, I mean, it's a new car. Um, we didn't end up racing at Anglesey, so both races so we dropped. There's no drop round scores. So we came in after Anglesey, I think, 57 points behind. So to haul that in over three races has just been brilliant. Wow. Awesome, job. <laughs> well done, my friend. Thank you very much. Cheers. So there we go. As Darren goes, let's uh, jump back to the uh, 66 Richard Clark. Richard, a pair of seconds. That'll do, won't it? Yeah, well, it's not, it's not bad. Um, obviously, I'd rather have first because no one ever remembers anyone who came second, as they say. <laughs> but uh, no, no, it was good. I mean, you know, Darren drove well. He managed to get away because there was uh, the second, third, fourth, fifth were all having the battle for a yeah. bit. So uh, no, it was a good, exciting race. And then me and him obviously just got away a bit in the, in the end. But no, I was happy. I'm happy with second. That's good. Could you smell blood at the end? You could tell that his tyres were off. Yeah, I could. I could and also, the sun oh. the sun you could not it turn in and I was sort of trying I'm guessing where I could turn and go over the curb and um, that's where I was getting you see obviously he was blinded he couldn't see so I was just getting him but there's never enough time is there so that's the trouble in a race <laughs> yeah this thing's quick in a straight line as well isn't it, is, it? yeah it's very quick yeah no it's it's yeah it's basically a standard TCR car so oh. yeah 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 so it's, it's nice yeah awesome yeah. job well done congratulations uh, so where, where are we going back into the third where's uh, Adam no Adam there he is Adam third position I mean that was hard work working through the field wasn't it it was yeah I don't think I could have got any more out of the car there um, and so yeah I mean you see obviously the speed these guys have got kind of draw your own conclusions but um, I think it kind of needs out him really to be honest uh, they've, they've got completely well, they've got switchable. Certainly, the Audi has a switchable map that's been giving him like an extra 100 horsepower since uh, I think Olsen Park. So it's pretty frustrating. I think we're the, not just me, Dark Sides, Team Hards, Moore's, NJM, we're the real kind of uh, legitimate champions. But there you go. That's one of those things. And we don't know. We we think that we've done the math, but we we never know. Never oh, trust so, us. Yeah. So Darren's Darren's won, but I mean, I wouldn't take a lot of pleasure in it if I were him. Um, it's uh, clear for everyone to see, and you can ask any driver. No one wants to talk about it, but I think this is probably the opportune time to out here because it's not really winning a championship if you've got a hundred horsepower more than your competitors. So there you go. I can't add any more than that, so I'll leave that as your final word. So thank you for that to Adam Blair. Uh, let's have a look. We got very quickly, Mr. Hufford, just quickly dive in. I mean, that, you were involved in some fabulous fights there. Yeah, that was a bit better than race one. Um, yeah, it was a bit more exciting. Had a bit of a battle, Got a, had a blinding start, had a bit of a battle. Um, 
until about halfway in the race and then I started getting a bit of clutch slip. Uh, so yeah, and that's when a few other cars went past me. So, uh, but yeah, it was a bit better, a bit more entertaining for myself uh, than the first race. Wow, nice job, well done. No, it's just man. So uh, I think that's probably pretty much everyone to grab a word with down here. There's one or two others here, but uh, I think that sums up. Who knew there'd be controversy down here as well, eh? <laughs> Nothing to do with me. I just pull the pins and walk away. But uh, that was the, uh, the, the the finish of uh, the Turismo X. It's been thoroughly entertaining. Some incredible cars. And I think that's now me handing back to Mark Werrell because we're about to get qualifying underway for the enduro car remember tomorrow it is the indycar 500 they've got to do half their qualifying in daylight half in the dark so mark it's back to you i think we're getting close to getting them underway Thanks, Chris. Yep, so it uh, won't be that much longer before we see the qualifying session getting underway for the IndyCar 500, the final race of the season for the Enduro KA Championship. So uh, that's going to be just a few minutes away. The cars are going to be heading out onto the circuit. So we're just going to leave you in peace for five minutes, get the session underway, and then we'll be straight back with you with all of the action from Enduro KA qualifying.
So we can already see all of the cars lining up in the pit lane ahead of the Enduro KA qualifying session and all identical specification Mark 1 1300cc KA. So in other words, these are cars that were produced between 2002 and 2008. Uh, they all run the same engine as well so it's the 1.3 litre Duratec engine standard configuration so no changes to the engine uh, gearbox is absolutely standard as well uh, however they do all run the same specification in terms of suspension as well so upgraded suspensions springs and dampers provided by gas and uh, PowerFlex bushes all running Mintex pads as well and all of them running on the control tyre as well so qualifying getting underway the cars feeding their way out onto circuit we have the winners from last year rejoining the series to see whether they can scoop up a second victory in the IndyCar 500 that is the GM performance car that Gary and Ian Mitchell brought to victory last year uh, the number 81 car there joined for this weekend by Darren Stapleton, Darren Stapleton and Jonathan Mitchell. So they were the winners in 2021. In 2020, the winners were Octane Jonkies, which was Adam Smith, Martin Smith and Baz Ward. Well, they are all together again for this season in the number 111 car. So we've got our 2021 winners here and our 2020 winners here. And then if we look back to the first year of Enduro KA in the IndyCar 500, which was 2019, it was uh, JTR that won it on that occasion with uh, Lewis Selby, uh, James Rhodes, Elliot Mason and uh, a Porsche factory driver, as he was at the time, and Le Mans winner Nick Tandy. And well, guess what? Nick Tandy uh, and Lewis Selby uh, and Elliot Mason are on the entry list for this weekend at the wheel of number 128 Napa racing car as well. So we've got all of our three former winning cars uh, and teams on the grid for this one this weekend, Chris Dahl. So it, it could be a really, really interesting race. It's going to be a quick one, I suspect. Helps if I press the button. Uh, what means you reckon it's going to be a quick one, do you? A quick race, yeah, it'd be competitive, very competitive. I like the sound of that. As I say, is that this is... Uh, Completely new to me. I love the fact that even on this opening qualifying, we suddenly had four of them in a bunch going down the uh, Best there. way. It's anyway to drive. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it just looks intriguing. It's one of those ones, multi many of us have been saying this, is that I, I can really think this will go. I fancy it uh, quite significantly. It looks so much fun. You've done, um, uh, you, you've raced in these yourself, haven't you? Yeah, I did, I did the 2019 and 2020 versions of the Enduro KA here. Um, and uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. You know, just great fun to drive, great fun to drive. I raced one at um, Snetterton earlier on this season as well, or qualified one at Snetterton, and the car had already retired oh, by the time it came right. to my stint. So uh, I was covering, actually, I was covering that one, wasn't I? Because I was gutted that it, it, did it roll? No, 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 engine went, no, no, no head, head there gas, was another one, head though. gasket went. There's yeah. another one I commentated on you, is it possibly last year or year before at Snetterton? Uh, that was a 12 hour race the year before at Snetterton yeah. that I did, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, no, they're just good fun. You know, it, you talk about motor racing being cheap. Well, you can't get much cheaper than one of these things. You know, they are not expensive things to run. Uh, and when you've got, in the case of some of the cars, three, four, five, six drivers sharing the cost, uh, it does make it very, very affordable. So, you, know, you could jump in one of these cars and you get, you know, an hour and a half or a two hour stint. And it won't cost you a fortune over the weekend just to hire the seat uh, in the um, uh, in one of the cars. Um, qualifying times for these ones, we're going to be hovering around just north of 60 seconds. So let's say, you know, a 102, a 103, I think might be pole in these cars. That would be that would be a, a reasonable time, I would say, on the on the tyres that they're on nowadays in these cars. So that's the kind of times that we're looking towards. But it has chilled off out there, Chris, hasn't it? Uh, and already we're starting to see some quick times coming in. So former champion or former um, IndyCar 500 winner, um, Ad Smith, Adam Smith, uh, a 104 point. 825 from Octane Junkies at the moment sees them the top of the pile. Um, that was a car that last year uh, was uh, was doing really, really, really well and unfortunately then had some problems and ended up dropping down through the order, I'm afraid. 
I'm just loving the sights of this, is that, of course, we've got that there's a whole load of them sort of deck them out with these fancy lights as well, don't they, during the night. Uh, uh, still, that said, somehow we've got to be able to, uh, to pick these out, haven't we? It's, it's going <laughs> to be It's going to be tough, yeah. It's going to be difficult because whilst I know the colours of them all, when it's dark, all you see are the headlamps or yeah. the lights that they've got. And I don't know the colours of the lights on the cars or the configuration of where their spot lamps are. So that will all come. Um, our cameramen are going to have a heck of a job as well, those that are on, watching on the live stream, to try and pick the cars out. Just being pushed backwards there in the pit lane. That is M&D Racing. So that's Tony Perfect, Daniel Martin, Alex Martin and Matthew Rowling's car. We don't know as, which, as yet which driver will be behind the wheel. We'll have to wait until it heads out onto track to pick up on that one. But top of the time still at the moment is Octane Junkies. Uh, up to second quickest comes turn seven. That's a number 14 car of Callum McDougall. And Powerbell Motorsports with pristine condition. Andrew Rogerson uh, is third quickest at the wheel of 154 at the moment, or was. He's now dropped down to fourth quickest because there was good improvement there from Purple Sector Racing, which is Mark Matthiasen. Yeah, I'm quite pleased, actually, looking at this. I've forgotten that they do tell us the driver that's, uh, that's in there. And, in fact, uh, they get in trouble, don't they, if they go out onto the circuit and they haven't flick, flicked, the trans, uh, flicked the transponder. Easy for me to say. It, it's, in it, it, it's different now in these cars. What you used to have, we used to have something called a Q-tag, which was a separate um, sensor that you put around your wrist, uh, and there was a, um, a, oh, that's another right. set of lights. Put it, put it up to it. Yeah, for this season, they, they've dispensed with that. So now there is a, um, a, um, a an app that they use where all of the team managers let uh, race control and the timekeepers at the same time know which driver is getting out into the car, and therefore then that automatically gets updated by TSL. So every time we get that notification through, it should update the driver that's behind the wheel of the car. Fine, that makes sense. Yeah, because there was a few that would forget, isn't there, as they were, went through. Uh, and then they'd get called back in again. Or, or no, it, I mean, in theory, it was supposed to be, uh, if it didn't register you, it stayed on red, didn't it? It wasn't letting you yeah, out. Yeah, it wouldn't let you out of the pit lane if it stayed on red, yeah. yeah. So you had to make sure your hue tag, you, you weren't allowed to go out until, until it had gone green. Yeah. So... At the moment, we just had a good lap put in by Adam Bonham at the wheel of the number 72 Misty Racing car. He was up into something like fifth and sixth position, but already he's back down into eighth place. Adam Smith still top of the times at the moment for Octane Junkies. Car number 111 with a 63.495 second lap. Callum McDougall is second quickest with a 50, with a 64.272. Third quickest at the moment, though, Wolf Motorsport, which is the pink pig of, who's that going to be? Patrick McCarthy will be behind the wheel of that one at the moment. And last year's winner, Ian Mitchell, has just gone fourth quickest for GM Performance at the wheel of number 81 car with Stuart Rod uh, Andrew Rogerson sorry, being in fifth. And sixth at the moment is car number 734, which is Daniel Ferguson. And when we get to the Ferguson Motorsport cars, most of those drivers around there have plenty of experience when it comes to racing minis rather than Ford KAs. And, and I mean, we're going to get an even bigger difference between the drivers in the cars presumably in this as well aren't we because there's a there's there's a lot of uh, historically there used to be a lot of novice drivers coming into this as well but then there'd be some pretty interesting drivers as well as we know um yeah you, we've got a real mix of, uh, of some with huge amounts of experience and others that are having their their first ever race here and if i if i look at one of those who's having the first ever race let's just have a quick look who do we need to pick out so let's pick him out because it's the number six car uh, msvt racing um, Will Marston, uh, who oh, okay. is having his first ever race here. He's been waxing lyrical about it. He's with uh, Mark Rusted, who also works for, for MSVT, uh, and Hannah Chapman, former mini racer, uh, are all together in that one. Wow, OK. Uh, that's impressive. I didn't, I, I'd missed that, and yeah, I, I should have been able to see that, but uh, that, that's pretty cool, and uh, it's good to see that he is still a fan of the race and that he wants to get out behind it, old uh, Will, out there. Well, he's, he's not the only um, employee for the venue that we're at that's out in the field as well, because we will also have, when I get to the right car, we also have Adrian Clark, of course, who works for MSV, out in the number 49 car, LDR Performance. OK, cool. <laughs> well, and I'm not surprised, you know, you consider that we've had you out there. I would be, uh, yeah, I am just really fancy the idea of, uh, of getting involved, uh, get my race licence and, uh, and make my way out there, but... Uh, like you say, it's, it's, it's affordable, it's fun. You don't have to take it too seriously. And 
we've had some pro drivers jump out of these cars with like the biggest grins ever on their faces, haven't we? Uh, yeah, I mean, why do you think Nick Tandy's back again? He just yeah. enjoys it, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, we've had Ross Wiley, we've had people from Porsche Carrera Cup, we've had Rob Gravitt, former British touring car champion. Um, we've had so Who many other people. At some point, come into this, and and they all absolutely love it because they're just great fun to drive, and they're so competitive. Uh, so we're looking at the moment. If you're watching the stream, that's Hannah Chapman, former Mini Challenge racer, uh, at the wheel of the MSVT Racing Number no. Six car, the black car with the orange stripe down the centre, just uh, working her way onto the Cooper Straight. And um, what did I say the pole time would be? I said about a one minute two, didn't I? Well, we're almost into the one minute twos now, aren't we? So uh, a one minute three point. 396 is the fastest time that we've had so far, but already we're seeing cars uh, being shown black and orange flags for various reasons, including Graves Motorsport, which is Alex Solly, Ben Jenkins and Nicholas Taylor, another bunch of mini challenge racers. And the other car that's being shown the black and orange flag is the silver auto mech motorsport car of Sam May, Samuel Blyne and William Sherwood. Don't know why they're being shown the black and orange flag, but they've got to come into the pits. And I was looking around to see if it's obvious because the first one that was springing to mind was light related. I would say fuel related in these. I bet it'd be over overfill potentially. Uh, really? Maybe, uh, maybe, okay. yeah. And coming out. Coming out the coming right. out the filler, filler flap, yeah. I, and I do apologise. Uh, I think it was Sam Pierce actually messaged me earlier on Twitter. I've been so busy, I haven't had a chance to, uh, to really look at Twitter. But he was saying that uh, that Puma that was fu uh, spitting the fuel everywhere, they, he said that you could just smell it from where they were and the marshals in front of them had seen it and were reporting it back. But he said that it was that much coming out that you could smell it mm. from the spectator banks. It's not a nice thought. No, there did seem to be quite a lot of it coming out. So we've still got Octane Junkies top of the times at the moment. Uh, Axiometrics, which is the number 18 car, that will be Chris, Rether Chris Weatherall that is uh, uh, second quickest at the moment. Number 14 is the turn seven car. Callum McDougall is third quickest. And Damon Aston, another former mini racer uh, in the Mini 7 Racing Club at the wheel of 736, is currently fourth quickest. Scott Parkin for IP Racing, the number 36 car is fifth. And Andrew Rogerson for Powerbell Motorsport Pristine Condition completes the top six the way things stand at the moment. Uh, seventh place is number 40, which is KPR. That's Michael O'Brien, not the Michael O'Brien that won GT Cup, a different Michael O'Brien. Uh, eighth quickest is number 63, IP Racing, the second of their cars, and that is going to be Justin Roberts, and then uh, ninth is going to be Adam Bonham for Misty Racing, completing the top ten is going to be Chris Reed uh, in the first of the two Wolf Motorsport cars, and so that's the order of the top ten at the moment. But every time you say something, it all swaps around again. Well, exactly. I mean, we're going to have cars further down the order that uh, uh, you know are yet to have their uh, their strongest driver possibly jumping in. So it's going to really change this about. Uh, and uh, and there's uh, the whole thing about well, I was going to say finding space. I would imagine that you gain quite a bit working with people in these cars as well because they're basically bricks through the air aren't they so you can get a good old slipstream from uh, behind these and some of the ones that have really gone to town with the uh, the lights on them that, that make them stand out it looks absolutely <laughs> brilliant uh, that's the problem is we now need to try and work out what all the different light configurations are so that we know come darkness which car is which because the light is fading quickly now and yes whilst we started with with daylight the sun has now set and we will end up in another 48 minutes in total total darkness and and for chris and myself and you <laughs> watching uh, whether it be here at the circuit or on the stream it's understanding okay so if it's if it's a car that's got a red strip over the roof there <laughs> but it's green there then it's that one and if it's two orange strips it's that one um it becomes Surely the obvious mark is we get to say anything and no one will know no one will know because it's dark anyway <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely yeah, we get away with it for a change. That's uh, brilliant. I mean, what what is the uh, the structure in this then, Mark? As someone who's who's taken part in it, presumably, I mean, there's the basic in there. Everybody's got to have done three laps. We know yep. that one. But is there a certain amount? Because it's not really. I thought half was going to be in daylight and half was going to be in in night. But it, it it's not really daylight even now, is it? No, no. So you're going to end up. You know, bearing in mind we've only just gone to four o'clock now. So the final, yeah two hours really two and a quarter hours of the race will be pretty much in in dusk to darkness i've always done the third stint in these races so i've always got in on the penultimate stint so i've gone from full daylight into darkness and i i love that stint it's a brilliant stint to do but, but that's my question is that in this qualifying session have you got to have done a certain amount in the pitch black no as well? no there's none of no, that no not for this one no all you need to do is go out and do your three laps because there isn't time to send out the first driver in daylight and then no, cycle them all through and then cycle them all through again when they're dark so as long as you do your three laps you are absolutely fine and it's nice also to see that some of the teams so we're looking at the stream at the moment for the car that's just coming up towards the start finish line now it's Su Subaru Sukaru <laughs> it's called ah, Sukaru okay. uh, the number 555 car yeah so it's got the right number it's got the right livery um, 
Um, uh, unfortunately, it's the wrong badge that's on the front of the car. It looks good, though. It does it? look no, good. I it does it. look good. Yeah, you know, we've got Castrol. So uh, instead yeah. of Castrol, Castrol. You know, we have a few of them. Carlamity, uh, Carmelian. <laughs> there are various teams that all have the KA name within them. And it's always good to see. Always good to see. So, yeah, Carmel Racing as well. You know, you talk about 555 would be um, an appropriate brands that can no longer be advertised <laughs> carmel as well you may remember lotus yeah, cars oh, running around yeah, um, yeah. yes so yeah. it's got a picture of a camel down the side yeah um so no it's all all good fun we've just had further improvement for karen uh, callum mcdougall at the wheel of the turn seven car he's now come into the pit lane we've also had good improvement for adam bonham at the wheel of the number 72 misty racing car because he's just gone fourth quickest in that car the sister car from misty racing is down in 28th at the moment so that's still got a little bit of work to do and the car that we're watching at on the stream the super sukaru car in the hands of former caterham racer tristan judge ah yeah 19th quickest at the moment yeah good to see tristan out there racing i haven't seen him for a little while actually but uh yeah the uh, it really does bring people from all sorts of disciplines of racing doesn't it in, in all honesty i say disciplines different championship different types of yeah. cars uh, and they just get out there and i remember when this first started and and it took a little bit of of going didn't it really winding it up but it's working there's my car that's the car i raced at snetterton this year that we could just see on the stream now the number 172 misty racing car just being pushed back by steve kite and the team and that's the car that i put sixth on the grid at snetterton Did you? yeah how many cars we got entered here 40 46 so far have set a lap in this session so amazing a number of cars that we've got out there circulating for this one so yeah misty racing carla as that car is affectionately known at ka <laughs> um is uh, heading out onto circuit uh, have we had a shuffle for the lead no we haven't but adam smith has gone even quicker at the wheel of the number 111 octane junkies car he's just posted a one minute three point 237 for Octane Junkie. So that is the fastest lap. That at the moment is provisional pole position for some of the former winners of this um, Enduro KA race. Mm. It's, it's quite interesting. It's not one where you'd kind of think that someone could suddenly dominate it. But, uh, you know, we do get some, from, you know, regular names at the pointy end, don't we, of this. And But you'd think that it would be open enough that, 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 that different names almost every time. But it just gets some familiar names uh, that, that, that bring home the trophies. Now the number 72 Misty Racing car was going very slowly there, so whether Adam Bonham had a spin coming out of Graham Hill Bend or whether he aborted the lap and just looked to try and build a gap for a little bit of traffic to avoid and try and crack on with, we'll have to wait and see. Uh, over the start-finish line now is about to come the silver number 28 car. Now that is the Vpex Motorsport car that Costa Christitis races with Alastair Dendy, Will Dendy, who has been racing in the GT Cup this year, Alex DeWalker and Damien Hurst are all out in that one. The number 28 car just flashing its way through Paddock Hill Bend and descending downhill. That car is currently outside of the top 30 in terms of its qualifying pace. I would have expected that car to be a bit higher up, but maybe we haven't cycled through the quicker drivers yet because... As you suggested, when you've got three, four, five drivers, some of which are experienced, some of which are inexperienced, the car can shuffle its way up and down through the order throughout the course of qualifying and the race, of course, come the eight hour and 20 minute race tomorrow. I'm just dreading what I'm about to bring up. We've got amendments to program to. Oh, no, I was expecting to see a whole load. Right. Will Dendy is not out, right. as uh, I, Lucas as was suggested. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, in, so he's not one of the drivers in number 28 and Nicholas Jackson is not in number two either right so was there a, was there a second lot of amendments to programme or was that yeah. the ones that right okay so I need to refresh then don't I amendments to programme two that's the one we need there's not very much on there I was expecting it to be a multiple page thing but uh, it wasn't and we've got bizarrely some on track day championship and track day trophy that's already uh, passed so we missed that um, but only two deletions in terms of drivers, so uh, well, that's not I, too bad. I can give you another one as well, and that's only because I know, because I spoke to the team earlier on, and that is in the number 72 car. Robert Thomas will not be out. Um, it is just Simon oh, and right. Adam Bonham, so just father and son that are racing in that one. So that was somebody that dropped out earlier on. Into the pit lane is car number 125, three amigos. Adam Reed, David Drinkwater and Paul Hinson. So just cycling through their pit stop. So the car was in the hands of Paul Hinson. 
have to wait and see as to who will dive into that car. Also, number 41 is in as well, which is Row Rage Motorsport, which is Alex Butler, Greg Caswell and Sam Rowe. That's a car that at the moment is outside of the top 30, so it doesn't show on the timing screen that we've got there. But I can tell you that it was Caswell that was behind the wheel of that one as it's come into the pit lane, which is Greg Caswell. And the time's at the sharp end now. It seems to have settled down a little bit. We've still got the number 111 car of Octane Junkies, fastest of all so far. Ad Smith, or Adam Smith, behind the wheel of the car. Second generation of racer. His father, Nigel Smith, of course, used to race in the British Touring Car Championship for a good number of years. And that is the car that at the moment occupies provisional pole position as it flashes its way, car number 111, over the start-finish line. It was a steady run uh, last time round, but uh, as was that one at the moment, but uh, I, you know, you're going to get the changes of drivers, then the, chain, the drivers that have just jumped in getting used to it. I love the fact that over on the exit of, uh, of clearways that we're seeing the, the blue light flashing as though <laughs> they're able to, uh, to, to work out who's there, but I guess it's just to say, look, there's a whole gaggle of you, basically. Uh, but uh, I, I'm not sure they're going to pay too much attention to that, are they, really? Uh, no. <laughs> no, in reality, no. <laughs> it's just, it is just flat out. You know, it might be an eight-hour race, eight hours and 20 minutes, but it will just be flat out all of the way. You know, you, these cars, um, they have very little power. They're, what, 80 horsepower, 80 power strokes, something like that. So you just drive flat out all of the time, absolutely all of the time. And now that they've changed to this new tyre that was introduced uh, a couple of seasons ago, um, if anything, I would say, the car is overtired. It's got more grip than it ought to have. It, ah, it doesn't really? move around as much as I think it probably ought to. And it has caused a few little um, issues where the tyre just sends it, then grip on all of a sudden you end up with a car that's pointing in the wrong direction or it ends up ultimately, sometimes, if it's a, if it's a quick corner and there's a little bit of a touch, you can end up with an incident that otherwise you might not have. But yeah, they're just good fun. They, they do exactly what you would expect them to do. At no point do these cars do something that you're not expecting. It's a really well put together package with the car, with the tyre, with the suspension that it's on, with the poly bushes as well. It, it just works. And as I say, for it, whether you're a novice or an experienced driver, give one a go because you'll absolutely come out with a smile on your face. You don't need to go quickly because everyone else is going at the same speed. Well, I saw, was it uh, a week or so ago? I think it was a couple of weeks ago. Now Damon Hill jumped into one. Yeah, I was, I was kind of there hoping that yeah. he might be on the uh, the entry list here this weekend, but uh, sadly not. But, uh, yeah, he went out and it looked like he had a whale of a time as well. Yeah, it was one of the Graves Motorsport cars that he went out right, in. Uh, okay. That was, uh, I think it was about a year ago now that he was in that, was it? I think it was out Was it? All right, they were, yeah, they're raising some awareness, weren't they, for one of the charities, I think. Uh, so uh, what, car number 125, if you're watching the stream, is what we are looking at at the moment. That is Three Amigos again. So that's the largely blue car. That's one that I hadn't managed to spot before this session. So with a Martini logo on the side. Is it Martini or is it Cartini? It really ought to be Cartini, Robert surely. Martini, Let's have a quick yeah. look as it goes by. Oh. No, it is Martini. You thought it'd say KA, wouldn't you, on the oh, side of that one? They've missed a the trick there, haven't they? Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and in the pit stop, that looks like one of, it's either 27 or 47, 37 or 47. So that is uh, Semprini Racing, who've got two cars out. Uh, and of course, we saw Semprini Racing out in their Honda, uh, yes. kind of a 37 earlier on. So, uh, and yeah. it's the same colour scheme. Same, exactly the same yeah, colour scheme yeah. as on the Honda in the Track Day Trophy, Track Day Championship. Um, in terms of times, not a great deal is happening at the sharp end. We've still got Octane Junkies quickest of all at the wheel of 111. Number 18, Axiometrics and Chris Wetherill second quickest. At third quickest is number three, Callum McDougall for turn seven. Fourth quickest is 72, Misty Racing and Adam Bonham. Fifth quickest, quickest is Chris Reed for Wolf Motorsport, the number five car. Sixth at the moment is KPR, number 40, Michael O'Brien. Then it's 736, Ferguson Motorsport, Damon Aston. 36 IP Racing Scott Parkin. Ninth is 145 Powerbell Motorsport Pristine Condition Andrew Rogerson. And 10th quickest is car number 128 Napa Racing UK. And I'm going to say Elliot Mason, but then I'm going to look down and confirm that that is the Christian name. And indeed it is. Uh, however, for Adam Bonham and the number 72 car, that's the second time that car's slowed down on the Cooper Strait. Yeah, you, you said that and you weren't sure if he was recovering from a spin, were you? But no. that, that seems to have stopped a lot, you know, virtually the end there and then getting himself going again. It's not really a control-alt-delete kind of car, is it? So no. that's a bit odd. No, no, it's, it's fairly, fairly analogue, these cars. <laughs> <laughs> Key out the ignition, <laughs> turn it back on again. But he's off again, so... And not heading into the pits either. Which is really strange, really, really strange. Car number 56 into the pit lane as well. 
more driver changes continually going on. That's hard and enthusiastic. Martin Dillman and Michael Hickey. And where are they at the moment? They are not inside the top 30 either, I don't think. So they are 37th currently. 37th currently for those cars. Presumably, you, you, I mean, obviously, everybody's trying to get up uh, the pointy end, but you don't lose too much sleep when it's an eight hours, 20 minute race if you're a bit further down. No, and, and you know, some, some people, you know, the likes of Octane Junkies, Axiometric, Turn 7, Misty, IP, Ferguson, Power Bell, all of those will want to win this race. No doubt they'll want to win it, so they'll want a good qualifying performance. But there'll be other people that they just want to have fun. You know, they're yeah. here with their mates, they're here with their friends, they're here with you know, their, their fellow racing drivers, and just wanting to have some fun and stay out of trouble and bring it home. You know, if you're one of the teams that's having their first ever race and you've got a whole batch of novice drivers, all you want to do is record a finish and that way yeah. you know of course you want a good result as good as it is but what you want to do is stay out of trouble get those two signatures two signatures not one because of the length of the race yeah. two signatures on your race license yeah how many tires will is a car likely to get through ignore punctures or anything like that i would say uh, they will probably only put um, a second set of tires on the car in eight hours so the first set easily go for Really? Yeah, easily go for. You might end up, some of them, you might end up with a bit of delamination if they're, if they're use, using them too much because you've got, you know, it's the front left that really loads up round here. So you think of where you're pushing that front left through Paddock Hill Bend, through Druids, as you're coming towards clearways, you're really working that tyre a lot harder than you are the right-hand side because it's a clockwise circuit. Yeah, yeah. So you might end up with maybe that front left having to be changed a bit more, but most, most will run four hours on some. You might even get six hours out of the ones that aren't being used as much. Okay. There's no, no limit, though, is there? No limit. No limit. No. 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 And there's no um, there's no speed in terms of pit stops have to be a minimum of. It's as quick as you can do it. It's largely all down to how quickly the fuel goes in because you don't have a dry brake system like a competition system. It's a standard uh, fueling nozzle on these cars, but the, the tough jug that you put the fuel into has a dry brake system on it, but there's no venting to that, so it takes forever. You can't vent oh, the really? fueling system, so it just takes forever to get the fuel in them. Um, presumably, though, you will feel it, it get looser when those tyres do. It, it's more the understeer that you feel more than anything because yeah. it's just got not got the front end grip anymore. And sometimes it's just because you've overworked them, they've become too hot. Back off for a couple of laps, and the tyres come back ah, to really? you. you yeah, you just get them too hot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like uh, so Adam Bonham for Misty Racing. Whatever the problem is for that car that's stopped down at the bottom of the Cooper Straight. Clearly it's gone away again because that car's just set the best lap that it's done in the session so far. Um, go figure. Um, 63.696 seconds. So it's fourth quickest at this stage, the number 72 car, despite the fact it looked as though it was going to retire a second ago. Surely it wasn't stopping to get a track space. position. Yeah, it makes you wonder, but it would be a strange, strange thing to do. I'm sure that would be frowned upon if that was the case, wouldn't it? I mean, he was out of the way, but even so, it's... Uh quite extreme and you know okay you'll probably turn around and say if that was that I was just getting out of their way they were putting their laps in but uh, yeah it's the good news is it's not an issue that's the above all it's into the pits now but after setting that lap time that's uh, put itself up into uh, fourth place uh, uh, can I pose a question at you as you've been posing lots at me uh -oh, yeah. car number 44 what is it it's not in the entry list I Even the timekeeper. Yes, is Graves that Graves Motorsport? Motorsport is it? Ah, right. So it's Graves. So why have they not got a name beside them? I don't know. I mean, it's got a. Tra it's been having a transponder issue, but they should still know that 44 right. is Graves Motorsport. Uh, it's on the original program. And, and 734, which is just showing as Bell, doesn't have a team name beside it. It should be Ferguson Motorsport, and it'll be Tom Bell that's driving it, won't it? I see. Yeah, yeah. That's bizarre. But I mean, certainly in terms of the drivers, no, because as you say, the drivers have nothing to do with the transponder either, is it? That is odd. I mean, let's, let's not uh, mess about, is that they've got an awful lot to try and uh, deal with down there in, uh, in TSL office. And I'm afraid Carmel are off and into the gravel trap. That's at Clearways Corner, where we've lost our first one into the gravel trap. So that will no doubt bring about a safety car period. And what we don't have in, in hours of darkness are any live snatches whatsoever. Hours of darkness, it's always uh, a safety right? car snatch. So uh, we will no doubt be going... One would imagine, yeah, and yeah, out comes the safety car board. So we do go safety car for this one to extract the number 88 car out of the gravel. Now, that's the car that has got six drivers in it, as Carmel. <laughs> so um, 
Um, it's, it, it's, a, it's a one in six chance that we could get this right or wrong, but it is, I'm afraid, going to be Tom Derbyshire that's gone off at the wheel of Carmel. And that car is 43rd out of the 46 cars that we've got in the order at the moment. So safety car comes out. This means, uh, in reality, Chris, we're going to end up with a very busy pit lane. So anybody that's been out there for a while, they'll now come in and do another driver change now, won't they, whilst we're under safety car and get someone else in because we're nearly halfway through the session, amazingly. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess it comes down to where they were in their uh, rotations, but there's, there's, there's no real point in staying out there unless they're hopeful. It's just going to be a quick quick one, and they're then out there and, and ready to just, to just go rather than having to do an outlap as well. Um, I mean, you take, for example, the, the current pole sitter, Triple uh, One. That's got, uh, is it Basward? Basward behind yeah. the wheel now, yeah. I think that's fairly recent that that car yeah. has changed over the drivers. So, you know, they're not going to go and change drivers no. necessarily. No, they won't again they? now. Now, at number 18, that was Chris Weatherall, is now Dominic Jackson. Number 14, that was uh, Callum McDougall, is now Mike Morace. So, we yeah, have already seen a, a few of these swapping over. Power Bell Motorsport, that was Andrew Rogerson, is now number 154, is Charlie Budd, who was racing here in the truck. Trucks um, uh, supporting the uh, uh, truck support race package in the UK Legends just a couple of weekends ago. Charlie, who also has raced the likes of Ginetta G40s and Minis in the past as well, has Charlie Budd, but he's having his first outing in KAs. And having spoken to him yesterday, he got out of the car after just a couple of laps with a huge smile on his face and again said, these are good fun. Um, so, uh, so yeah, we're having a few that are already swapping over to second and third drivers in the case of some. Uh, Marshall's working hard to try and give the number 88 Carmel car a shove. But even though they're trying to shove it, the wheels are still spinning, I'm afraid. So um, we are going to need that car extracting from the gravel trap by a telehandler which means that there is more opportunity for some of the teams to come into the pits and swap over drivers, and that is what is happening at the moment for the number 46 Automech Motorsport car of Sam May, Samuel Bryan and William Sherwood that is in the pit lane. That car was in the hands of Will Sherwood. I'll have to wait and see when it gets to the end of the pit lane as to who is going to head out there, whether it's Sammy Bryan or whether it might be uh, Sam May. I do love the uh, the sight when you look down there and see the pit lane lit up with the sort of orange, the, the, the glow of street lights that we're used to down there in the in the pit lane, and uh, you just know it's a little bit special, don't you? Uh, we've got uh, floodlights as well, just at pit exit, a couple of the key points to make sure that uh, they're able to see what's going on. But as the uh, the circuit falls into that darkness, there's several at the end of the pit lane now which are, is on red because obviously this train of cars, this rather large train of cars, Mark, is going past. They're going to be sat there for a little while yet. Um, yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Um, and it is, you know, it, when you're behind the safety car, it is so difficult to see uh, at some circuits as to when the lights go off on the safety car. It's much, much easier here at Brands Hatch because largely, you know, you're at the bottom part of the circuit you can look to the top part of the circuit if you're further down the train and know where the safety car is or you're at druids and you can see that it's down at yeah. cooper Strait or what have you other circuits you genuinely if it's a big grid of cars you genuinely have no idea whether the lights are on or not uh, and of course what of happens course, is yeah. everybody down a big long straight so someone like silverstone down the hangar straight so next car will jink out very slightly so you can see the safety car so the next one jinks out the next one jinks out the next one jinks out which means that if you're at the back you simply cannot see you just have to go off the body language of the rest of the cars as to whether you're going to go green again don't radio back to the pits then um, <laughs> in this championship you are allowed pit oh, car really? radio yeah you are in enduro ka not necessarily all of the cars will have it but you are allowed pit car radio in this oh, okay. so um, so yeah we usually do have with, with the, all the teams that i've raced with um, um we have pit car radio yeah yeah. That must be, I quite fancy that. That sounds really cool. Well, we, what we did do, because, of course, you know, I'm, I'm commentating this year. In, for the first two years, I did both commentary and then would dive downstairs and do yeah. my stint <laughs> in the car and then come back into the commentary box. Um, and the regulations at the time did allow a mobile phone to be carried. They don't at all anymore now. You would be um, breaking the rules if you carried a mobile phone in, in the car. Um, but what happened was under safety car, I'd agreed that, um, you know, as I was part of the commentary team but had been released to, to go and race that weekend, um, they could call me. So we did a inter couple of interviews whilst, whilst the safety car was out there. Whilst I was going around the track in the car, we did some interviews. Yeah, OK. That would be pretty cool. Uh, good to hear Peter Hardin out there on the, uh, the south bank this time. Uh, good to see that you're here, my friend. And uh, I can tell there's quite a few people that are enjoying this 
on the stream so welcome and obviously i hope you're going to be joining us tomorrow for the uh, the full length we kick off is it ten uh, five past ten isn't it that the uh, five past ten yeah, yeah i mean that we'll, we'll get the action underway at ten is when we can uh, start making noise here at the circuit and then it'll be five past ten race start which therefore means that it's 25 past six that the checkered flag will fall uh, which means we've got five minutes till curfew so uh, any interviews that we'll have after that will be done on the stream only because we won't be able to go out on the circuit PA for that bit uh, no that's uh, that's a real shame and what we might also be doing is um, possibly also utilizing for any uh, for the teams that are here as well we might try and boot up the um, um, the standalone speaker that they have as well uh, have to wait and see what msvr and bring us for that one or whether we're just doing it purely on the stream last so, i knew they couldn't find that a few years ago was, <laughs> it. it's gone walkies <laughs> at it right ago okay. so 25 minutes of the session still to go some of the teams will still have a raft of drivers that they need to try and cycle through as well and uh, for for some of them it, it you know it, it is a tough job when you've got six drivers and only 60 minutes to do it yeah. that's 10 minutes a driver and that doesn't account for how long it takes to get one out the car and yeah, back in less, so, less, less, so, so for the teams with six drivers literally it's going to be an out lap a couple of flying laps and back in as simple as that so Which for a driver perspective that's not really enough is don't it? get much track time no you won't get much track time so um, we'll tomorrow wait you will You'll get plenty tomorrow. <laughs> You'll get absolutely stacks tomorrow. So uh, over the start-finish line, we can see car number 172, the Misty Racing car, is about to flash its way over the start-finish line, uh, being hassled around the circuit by the purple machine that sits behind. That's the number 48 car of Purple Sector Racing, Mark Matthias and Mark Gent, Sasha Kakad and Henry Mann. Well, Sasha Kakad um, this year has been racing GT3 Mercedes, hasn't he, as well, I think, on uh, some occasions. Yeah, amongst a few things. Amongst yeah. a few other and things. And interestingly, Jamie Peters has just confirmed, it is that Michael O'Brien. Is it that Michael yeah, O'Brien? apparently so, yeah, because uh, he said, oh, uh, it, it, I think that's it, and he said, it is. He WhatsApped me to tell me, and I recognised his helmet when the cameraman went down the pit lane. All right. So, according to him, uh, it is uh, the... It's the British GT from McLaren, Michael O'Brien. Also saying hello to Damien Hurst uh, in number 28, one of Jamie Peters Ennis's friends. Uh, still good to see that the messages are coming in. Paul BBT, P BPD Turner. Uh, great to see that uh, uh, the Orange Army, I haven't even been able to see. Oh, yeah, some wonderful photos of the Orange Army by Paul Turner. Thank you for that one. Good to hear that you're here, my friend. And I know there's been quite a few of them been uh, dropping the uh, the messages in, and it's just been so busy. Uh, Gary Hill, I saw you at, uh, at the entrance as well. Sam Pierce, uh, full time as I say, he's been dropping through. Sorry, I've not been deliberately ignoring you. It's just so busy up here when we're doing the stream as well that it's difficult to uh, to keep up with it. Uh, so uh, we haven't really had a great deal of improvements. Uh, so the top top five, top six places have been set since almost the very beginning. I'm quite interested to see at the wheel of the seventh place car, number 736, what Michael Winkworth might be able to do. Because car stopped on the back there on the Cooper Strait. Because uh, Michael Winkworth has been indecently quick this year in the Mini 7 Racing Club 7S class. So really interesting to see as to how quickly Michael Winkworth can go. The car that has stopped is one of the Lawrence Davy Racing cars. I think it's the number 19 car, LDR Performance, of Lee Pierce, Clark Wells and Matt Arnold. So that's another car that's full of Mini Challenge racers. They've been racing in the Mini Challenge Trophy class this year. So he's trying to... Ooh, and also... Else. That is the MSVT car that is oh, yeah, yeah. having a very strange incident. It keeps going back. What's going on there? So that is the number six car of Will Mason, Mark Rusted and Hannah Chapman. And whilst I don't know which driver is behind the wheel until I look at the screen, Mark Rusted has got a fair chunk of racing experience. So has Hannah Chapman. Will Marsden has got very little. And it's Hannah Chapman that had the problem. Yeah, that was unusual, wasn't weird, it? Sort of like reverse down into it and then tried to desperately get out of the way, I think, was uh, the panic that was in it. That number 19 car, the lights coming on and on, was as though that was trying to get itself back going again. And it uh, looks like the headlights are on again now, but whether they're really going to be able to get that one going. I can imagine it's fairly terrifying to lose it and just all you see is headlights blaring into your eyes from, uh, from afar. Safety car back out again. Yep, so safety car coming back out. I think Hannah Chapman has been shown as being behind the wheel of that number six car since the very beginning, which would be very unusual for that Ooh. to be the case. We've also got another spin at Clearways Corner. That's for 1 2 1. So that's uh, a calamity for Calamity. Uh, so that's Marcus Beattie and Andrew Hinch that have just had that 
spin and that problem. That's another car that is outside of the top 20, uh, top 30. It was Hinch that was behind the wheel. So Andrew Hinch having the problem. And yeah, as for LDR performance tuning, that number 19 car. Driver's done the right thing, pull it right up against the barriers, which is Lee Pierce, who won the Director's Cup of the Mini Challenge Trophy category this year. And is a very busy man, is Lee Pierce, because not only has he been racing Mini Challenge Trophy, not only is he racing KA, he's also a short oval racer uh, and has done a lot of short oval racing. And even his son now is going into short ovals or grass track or something like that. So um, local man, Lee Pierce. But his car clearly has had a problem, and the clock is ticking down. We are already two thirds of the way through qualifying. I just thought, as you, just as you're about to say that, I looked at it and went, "Crikey, where's that time gone?" Uh, Axiometrics are no longer on the outside of the front row of the grid, though, because the number 36 car has just gone second quickest in this session. So a good lap time having been put in by Daniel Sylvester. So we saw uh, Scott parking out in that car at the beginning of the session. Uh, that car is back in in the hands of Daniel Sylvester. So I now think. We'll see out into that car for the final part of the session. Your friend that you were talking to earlier on at the end of Turismo X, Adam Blair, will be heading out in that car. OK. Uh, hopefully no one else has gone and got an extra 100 horsepower in this race. We don't want that, for goodness sake, with these. I think that, what would that, that would more than double it. It would more than double <laughs> what you've got. It would be quite obvious, wouldn't it? Yes, just a bit. Uh, uh, so that's, just, that's the whole point, isn't it? That this is just motor racing fans that they want to get out there and race in something else and something different. And to have what, what do we, you say, they've got up to yeah, 46 cars. I think we were hoping for about 48, but 46 of them out there on the indie circuit. It's busy. That's the point. Yeah, isn't it? it's busy. I mean, I've been on the Silverstone Grand Prix circuit when we've had 99, and that was busy. But you that's the full GP full circuit, GP though, circuit to spread them all out. So yeah. 46 on the indie circuit. Wow, it is going to be busy. And, and people people do need to be sensible with it. You know, what we have had, and there was a briefing that came out and a bulletin that came out the beginning of this week that I saw, and it was very much setting the stall out for what the expectation was with drivers in qualifying. In the past, we have had trouble in qualifying where a lot of it has been behind safety cars because a lot of cars have been having incidents and going off and paddock your uh, bend. Okay. And so it, was, you know, it wasn't, a, wasn't a telling off. It was just saying, look, this, this is what you need to consider. Let's just be... Let's be sensible about it, you know. Yeah. Um, and all of the drivers, I've got to say, you know, we, we had one spin into the crowd. But other than that, it's been a mechanical issue. That's, yeah, mechanical there, yeah, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, they've and, all, and they've all done really well. that's only two that yeah. we've had. So, yeah, yeah. so they've, they've, they've approached it in the right way. I think the message was given and has been heeded by the drivers out there. And also what does help is the fact that it's dry, Chris. You know, when we've had qualifying in the past and you get to that dew point and then it gets greasy and horrible, and it's it is very difficult. It really? is very very difficult. You know, it, you go in towards Paddock Hill Bend, and you're trying to carry as much speed as you can, and you get there on one lap, and the car does something you're not quite expecting it to do because the grip level just isn't there that it was a lap before. And of course, at Paddock Hill Bend, a very small margin of error really. You can make one small mistake at the top of the hill, and if the car then goes into the gravel and it's sideways when it hits the gravel, over it goes. Over it goes. Yeah. yeah. yeah so you yeah, end up exactly. with a big consequence for a very very small mistake. And, and I mean, presumably, you get quite a change in those grip levels naturally anyway because Very of the, so. the, the time of the day, yep. the temperature change during those days. Uh, you know, I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, saying that, I think the cloud cover has made it not too bad here. But when I left Swindon this morning, it was four degrees. Yeah, it was it was not quite frozen on the car, but it took a good old long time to demist and everything. And it was just letting me know. And, and that stayed that way until I'm trying to think I was past Reading before some cloud cover came in and the temperature just sort of rose to about eight, eight and a half degrees. And I think it's sort of been a bit north of that. But I don't think tomorrow's getting anything above nine degrees. No, it's going to be chilly tomorrow, but it's more chance of rain tomorrow. And that's the thing. If it's greasy and horrible, it's just, it's hard work. It is genuinely hard work to try and um, make sure that you just keep the car pointing in the direction that you want it to. And on occasions, it does just, does just catch you out. So we can see Purple Sector Racing in the pit lane, the number 48 car at the moment uh, that uh, Mark Matthiasen started. Uh, we're due to have Mark Gent, Sasha Kackett and Henry Mann all behind the wheel of that at some point over the course of this qualifying session. We've still got, let's just run you through the top 10 in terms of teams. Number 111, Octane Junkies, fastest. 36, IP Racing, second quickest. Third quickest is number 18, Axiometrics.com. Fourth quickest is turn seven at the moment. 
Fifth quickest is the number 72 car, that's Misty Racing. Fifth, uh, sixth quickest is number five, Wolf Motorsport. Seventh is number 40, that's KPR. Eighth place is 736, which is Ferguson Motorsport. Ninth place is 154, which is Powerbell Motorsports, joined with Pristine Condition for this weekend. And tenth quickest is going to be the number three car of Wingat Racing. So that's the order of the top 10 the way things stand at the moment where are all of our former winners well the number 111 octane junkies cars we go back to full qualifying against the safety car comes in uh, is quickest of all the number 81 car that was last year's winner is only 30th quickest at the moment only 30th quickest and the team that won in uh, 2019 which was joe tandy racing well, in reality, all of those drivers are joined up in this one in the number 128 car that's called Napa Racing UK, and that is 11th at the moment. So 1st, 11th and 30th are former winners. Just goes to show, that's, it's, that's mad, isn't it, really? And, and, and that's how we want to see it. Well, you think the 30th place, they're only one and a quarter, 1.3 seconds off pole, yeah. and you're 30th. <laughs> It is bonkers. I mean, looking down through that list is that so many of them are 0, 0.00 something is the gap one after the other. And it's just fabulous to watch. And it, it, I mean, yeah, it equally shows, Mark, you've got to presumably be very patient when you're out there. I thought safety car had come back no, in. No. Oh, has it stayed out, did it? Right, I thought safety car had come back in. Um, yeah, it's, um, you, you look at it and yeah, we got, we've got a tenth between first and second, a tenth and a half between second and third, and then it's 90 thousandths, 93 thousandths, a tenth, 51 thousandths, 62 thousandths, 13 thousandths, 33 thousandths, 19 thousandths, 4 thousandths, 5 thousandths, 12, 12, 23, 10. It is literally it's thousandths it? of a it's second. Brilliant. The biggest gap we've got between any two cars inside the top 30 is 0 0.147 of a second, and that's between second and third on the grid. <laughs> Absolutely brilliant. I mean, uh, safety car is in this time, by the way, so we're back under underway for this uh, qualifying session, so they're going to get themselves up to speed again as quickly as they possibly can. I, I guess your biggest chance for the overtakes is, is that you're trying to keep your momentum up in this car, and it's just if one of them scrubs it off the speed enough, then you're able to, to keep your pace up and, and dive past them. Uh, that, that's the, the biggest way you can make the passes. Uh, the, the most difficult thing, really, is, is uh, I mean, subject to how much radio traffic you want on the pit to car radio, is you don't really know whether the cars you're coming up against or those coming up behind you, you're fighting for position or not. Yes, of course. Because when they're coming up behind you, all you see are the headlights. When they're in front of you, yet you can get an idea as to whether it's a car that you might have lapped an hour ago or half an hour ago, or you know that it's got a ding in the corner because it's had an off and it's, it's had problems. But you genuinely just race everybody yeah, yeah. <laughs> because because you don't know. <laughs> um, uh, and, it, and, and it makes it you know hard for the marshals to try and pick out you know what what are the quick cars coming through. So you do you do have to be sensible with it and, and just try and work out you know if a car catches you really quickly you know it's a quick car if you're one of the slower drivers if it's a car that you've taken ages and ages and ages just to edge up to you're probably racing for position or mm. it's got a driver in that's of a similar pace for you so sometimes stick with them don't try and pass them you'll you'll hold yourself up more if you work together the two of you will go yeah. quicker you know it's not all about sending one up the inside it's a long race it's an eight hour race your mindset has to be different yeah yep. Yeah, with the, the length of the race and with the nature of the cars, the momentum requirement, things like that. Uh, I mean, I guess that once the race really gets going, unless it's blindingly obvious, they're not going to be able to, to throw out the blue flags all the time no. that we're used to seeing in races because there's just too many cars. And, and that's in the daylight, let alone the head, once the headlights are on. Yeah, they will do a cracking job, the marshals. They'll have a very good idea, and some of them will have TSL on their, on their, on their phones that they can... They can continually keep track of it and of course in, in some cases if they're really desperate they'll listen to the commentary um but but on the whole you know blue flags they they will they will pick them all out they do a brilliant brilliant job a brilliant job it just indeed. becomes impossible though when you're all muddled in together it yeah. doesn't become quite so clear and obvious by that point does it uh, that's endurance racing <laughs> well exactly <laughs> right yeah uh, and, and there aren't that many endurance races at a single class you know you you think about it we do have a, a few other similar series in the uk but most endurance races that you'll have or those that go into darkness are usually multi-class ones yeah so you, it's easier to work out who the quicker cars or the slower ones are either by the engine noise or by the colors of the headlamps on some of them where the headlamps Deliberate. will dictate what class yeah, it is exactly right and uh yes so it's just gonna get rather messy and you know one car that you might think is uh, is is further up the field may have just had a long pit stop because of an issue 
uh, and uh, and it can change it around. Uh, we've had Lewis Selby jump out of the number one to eight Napa racing car. Who's in it? Nick Tandy, and straight away Nick Tandy goes third quickest. So a one minute three point five zero nine for the former overall winner of Le Mans. Of course, he was a Porsche factory driver, moved away to race for Corvette for these last couple of years, and he's back with Porsche next year. He's just been confirmed as doing the IMSA programme with Porsche next year in the wheel of the new DPH car, so the hybrid era of, um, of cars out there in America. So it's great to see Nick Tandy back in Enduro KA and wonderful to see him doing so well. Um, one thing, if, if you're new to this then, you probably don't realise, um, um, so... Indy Car 500, okay. Yeah. You're on the podium of the Indy Car 500 as a race winners. You get a drink. Oh, I have heard. It's not milk. Again, it is. is it? Yeah, it, it is will. It will. Again, yeah, the it? drivers will be in traditional yeah. fashion. When you win the Indy 500, you drink milk. So it's the same in the Indy Car yeah. 500. Drivers on the podium will be drinking milk tomorrow if they win. <laughs> Love it. And we will be covering that as far as I'm aware. Up 11 places into sixth place now goes number 63 IP Racing. Uh, that uh, particular IP racing car is uh, it's, uh, Mr. Wilmot, so it is uh, Adrian Wilmot. Oliver, is it? Oliver Wilmot. Or Ollie Wilmot that's uh, at the wheel of that one. That is the one that had uh, Adam Blair was at the wheel of that a moment ago. Yeah. Although Adam Blair's also racing the 36 car. Yeah, he's yeah, in he two. Is. Yeah, he's in two. I think Scott Parkin is as well. He is, because yep. so, obviously he's uh, dark side racing uh, that with uh, Adam Blair. He's, he mentioned dark side racing earlier as well, so it's good to see them uh, together. But just in case it wasn't enough to do an eight-hour odd race, you, you double up the cars that you're driving. That's the way to do it, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> We're looking at VPEX on the stream at the moment, which has got, uh, by the look of it, who's behind the wheel of that one? It is Costa Chrysistis that's behind the wheel of the number 28 VPEX racing car. That car is well down through the order at the moment, though. It is down in 38 out of the 46 that we have got in the field. Into the pit lane, we are looking at the red and Dayglo yellow car, which was one of those that I was very late to getting the colour of if memory serves me correctly. It's only quite late on that I saw this car for the first time, and I can't recall. I think it's KPR, so I think it's the number 40 car, if we can see the number of it, I think. Um, so uh, that is going to be the car that was in the hands of Toby Patman, and will then be heading back out of the circuit. It's amazing, when you look at it through, um, through the naked eyes, we can do out of the commentary box windows, you can see absolutely nothing. When you look through the cameras, there's still a fair amount of light in the sky and some of that is just our tinted windows in the commentary box it really and does the fact that we've got the, the light on, on here because yeah. yeah. we need to so we can see our paperwork don't we really uh, it, uh, although the lights are almost more bright than we'd want them to be aren't they it would can we, can we have replace a it with a dimmer yeah, for tomorrow put a dimmer on yes. <laughs> I was uh, it was interesting because I was there where the fact that Nick Tandy's jumped into the uh, what's on the app we've got numbers all over the place but it hasn't actually changed does it um, the fact that Nick Tandy's in the 128 Napa racing car, and I was like, oh, OK, so he's managed to get himself up into third with a 63.422. Let's have a look. Where is he on the circuit to get another lap in? And you look at it and go, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, yeah. yeah. I, don't. I mean, the only thing that is quite useful, it's, it's less useful in qualifying, it's far more useful in the race, is the GPS tracking system that we have. So, at instance, at number 111, Barrett's Ward should be coming over the start finish line fairly shortly Somewhere and, and if I look out the commentary box windows and keep padding for sufficiently enough he will eventually come through but no he hasn't the GPS tracking has done the same and has questioned as to why he hasn't come through on that lap number 111 there he goes now over the start finish line because in qualifying of course the cars come into the pit lane a lot more than it will in the race and the, the GPS tracking system takes an algorithm of the average lap times of yeah. the car as it builds up yeah yeah, just to uh, add the extra edge to everybody to uh, to keep this one flying. But uh, yeah, there's, nobody's really going particularly fast. But I would imagine, Mark, the times have got to drop off now. It's pitch black, surely. Um, fastest lap time that we saw in the first ever one was in full darkness. Um, at Nick Tandy, not unsurprisingly, uh, and also Sam May at the wheel of number 46 Auto Mech uh, Motor Auto Tech Motorsport car has just gone quicker. He's the only car inside the top 30 that improved his time last time through. Uh, so he's just posted a time that puts him seventh quickest. And Michael Winkworth, I said watch out for him. I said he's gone so, so well in Mini 7S class this year. The number 736 car of Ferguson Motorsport in the hands of Michael Winkworth has just gained two places. He's gone from 11th to 9th with a time of a 1 minute 3.757. Yeah, I mean, uh, I guess there's where the, uh, the, the, the 
confusion of all of this is that we'll have certain drivers now jumping in and, uh, and doing a great job. Just seeing you seeing presumably Charlie Budd in the uh, 154. There's a lot of the mini drivers are coming over into this, aren't they? They're enjoying this. But you get them jumping into the car now, and so it does actually get an improved time to what that car's done. But you'd assume it's got to be tricky to put in, uh, you know, a truly representative time there. Nick Tandy's come in. He's brought the Napa racing car into the pits already in third, as has the Axiometrics number 18. And I remember you saying that was in second for a good chunk of time, and it's sat there in fourth now. Yeah, it's Chris Dovell that's brought that car into the pit lane. Chris Weatherall that started it. We've also seen Dominic Jackson behind the wheel, so they've had all three drivers in that car. So what they're probably going to do is stick the quickest one back in again for a couple of laps just to see if they can do what they need to do. And that's what I would imagine they will be doing in this one. Yeah, and there is the Axia Speak of the Devil, the number 18 car, just being pushed back, ready to go into the, uh, the slow lane before it going to the far left and into the fast lane. Here we go, out he goes, clear to, to pull all the way to the left, and he's now going to go all the way to pit exit and get that car back up to speed, but we are down to less than six minutes to go, Mark. Yeah, but it's enough for him to get in a couple of laps at least, a couple of three, four flying laps, uh, because um, the car will be nice and warm already, he won't have lost too much tyre temp whilst it's down there in the pit lane. So at the moment it is Octane Junkies, who were the 2020 winners of the Enduro Kaye 500-minute race here at Brands Hatch that are on pole position. The time was set by Adam Smith. Baz Ward is still showing us behind the wheel. 1 minute 3.237 is the fastest lap that we've had in qualifying. Uh, that was on lap number 14. Uh, that car has now done 41 qualification laps. I think the most we've seen from anybody is 42 qualifying laps. That's a heck of a lot, isn't it? It is, it is. I'm going to just very quickly try something. I'm going to turn the lights off. We can't keep it because we won't see paper, but I just want to see what it looks like with the okay, lights no, off. Give okay, no, okay. <laughs> Chris Dawes, we'll, we'll, switch, we'll, we'll swap it for a dimmer switch tomorrow. It won't be the only thing that can dim uh, and is dim in the commentary box. So, uh, yeah, it, you can, it's good, isn't it? Night racing, it, it's fantastic. So, uh, Octane Junkies, quickest of all. Uh, and the Axiometrics car, by the way, was taken over by Chris Weatherall. So we saw the number 18 car pushed back out of pit lane. Chris Weatherall has now taken over the car that is fourth quickest in this session and will look to try and hoist it further up through the order. And, all right, OK. We're, we're on camera. Oh, you're on camera, right? OK, I, I wondered why you were waving. I wondered why you were waving. <laughs> and there's Mark Weatherall. <laughs> I'm trying to stay out of harm's way. I've got the face for, face for radio, so I'll try and stay out of harm's way. Um, so, yeah, it's the Loctane Junkies from IP Racing, Napa Racing from Axiometrics. The second IP Racing car uh, was uh, there, but there's just been great improvement from Lee Deegan, another former mini racer. Uh, so Lee Deegan uh, uh, has just brought the number 736 Ferguson Motorsport car up from eighth to fourth on that lap as Lee Deegan. So going beautifully well indeed. Which means it wasn't weak work at the wheel then. Uh, it well, it's probably been in swapped, is it? Or they've only just notified then? Yeah. yeah so maybe with 46 cars, it must there must be a oh, lot absolutely. of a lot of traffic for TSL That's to get I through. That's why I was thinking that, yeah. that almost seems an unfair way to do it is to sort of send all that information through. Whereas, yeah. Uh, yeah. They, 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 the, the the wristband seems uh, quite fair, but probably not foolproof. Uh, Mike Morace has just gone well at the wheel of the number 14 turn seven car. He's just popped in its quickest time in the session so far. One minute three point. 535 and also the 63 car which you said was uh, Oliver Wilmot that has just also uh, improved its time for IP racing number 63 a time of 1 minute 3.533 exactly the same time as Mike Morace did literally seconds earlier but because Mike did it earlier he takes up sixth place at the moment and Ollie Wilmot's car will be seventh yeah, and the good news is, I mean, actually, interestingly, the second place car, the number 36 car, has only done 29 laps compared to everyone else in the 30s, even 40s. So that, I was about to look and say they've all done a good amount of laps, but that's fairly low. It's still circulating, apparently, but uh, not done massives. Now, Nick Tandy is still at the wheel of the Napa Racing 128 car, apparently, and that has... Uh, Made its, it made its way into the pits. It just sorted a couple of bits and pieces out, and it's back out again now. Interestingly, that 36 I mentioned in second, that has obviously been into the pits with a 213, so it's obviously sorted a few things out. We've got uh, a couple of improvements. I missed them. Morocco in the Wolf Carli Motorsport. Carlito Morocco, yeah. So uh, the ginger Italian, as he's known, at the wheel of number five, Wolf Motorsport car improves with a 1 minute 3.774. And also Purple Sector Racing, good improvement there for the number 48 car, which is going to be Mark Gent behind the wheel. 1 minute 3.888 from him. 
And also, is that Pete Dignan that's improved? No, it's the one above him. GM Performance, last year's winners, also improve as well. The number 81 car on that occasion. And that is going to be Darren Stapleton that improves. Yeah, that uh, Wharf Motorsport was just saying that uh, improved there, the number five with Morocco at the wheel. That was, uh, we've had uh, a good friend of, uh, of ours, Sam Strong, who lives literally a stone throw from this circuit. Surprised he's not out there racing, really, but uh, judging from the gloves and the top he had on, I presume he's down there helping him he's, out. He's mechanicking for Wolf, as he has been yeah. for a chunk of the year. Yeah, has Sam, he's done very little racing um, so far this season. So we've got a minute and a half to go. Octane Junkies have looked pretty secure for pole for most of it so when they say pretty secure in k8 terms they've got um, just over a tenth of a second between themselves and everybody else and actually that is the only gap that is larger than a tenth of a second in the top 30 everything else we're talking thousands of a seconds separating them the gap between first and second on the grid is 0 0.129 and that's the biggest gap inside the top 30 yeah, that's intriguing that someone could uh, could actually pull that one out. I mean, that said, 0.129 is still a tiny amount, isn't it? Uh, what, top 24 cars separated by 0.972 of a second. And at the moment, if you look to what the gap is between first and 40th, that's one and a half seconds between Just first and 40th ridiculous. on the grid. That is ridiculous, isn't it? Just unbelievable. We're down to the last 45 <laughs> seconds, unbelievably, in this one-hour qualifying session. That's gone so quick. It's gone in a flash, isn't it? It really has. It's just because it's so enthralling and unique. And they've all been, I've got to say, pretty well behaved so far. Let's hope that that continues for tomorrow as well, particularly when um, the darkness falls. As I say, it has been dry for them, so the grip levels are reasonably good. It's when it's greasy, it's not nice. Good improvement for Gary Mitchell for GM Performance. Last wow. year's winner uh, was 20th. All of a sudden, he hoiks that car up, the number 81 car, to ninth position with a 1 minute 3.641. Brilliant improvement in the closing stages. Presumably that's the boss. That is the boss, yeah. Yeah, well. He's the one that's been able to up the power on it. Then. He's two times, um, two times runner-up, I think, unfortunately, in the Focus Cup, isn't he, Gary Mitchell? I don't think he won it. Is he either two times champ or two times runner-up? They'll tell me if I'm wrong. I think it's two times runner-up uh, in the Focus Cup. Checkered flag is now out. So already Lee Deegan, who is fifth quickest, has taken it. We've also got um, uh, the number 64 car that has taken it. That is right up there. That is, I'm going to say Taylor Norton, but then I questioned it myself. So the eighth quickest car has now taken the checkered flag. Joe Ferguson. Uh, another mini race had taken the chequered flag. Callum McDougall pops a quick one in at the very last moment to go third quickest for turn seven. Car number 14 with a 1 minute 3.387. That disposes Napa Racing, which includes the likes of Lewis Selby and Nick Tandy, down to fourth on the grid at the moment. So brilliant lap put in in the closing stages by Callum McDougall. Yeah, incredible that. And, uh, you know, there's no real right to apply from the cars around that one now. So it's, uh, it's job done. Really impressive uh, from those guys. And uh, I was also just looking, I'd said about the fact the 36 IP racing car hadn't done that many laps compared to the others, or sorry, had done less than those around him. They, uh, they were back down into the 103s, equivalent to their, their fastest that put them in that second place. So they're on the front row. Yeah, the, the last lap that Adam Blair did in that number 36 car was two one thousandths of a second <laughs> slower than the best time you it had done in the session. Back, can you? No, that's <laughs> knocking on the door. That's knocking on the door for sure. So um, uh, everybody has now taken the checkered flag in this qualifying session. We might be able to bring you um, some results as to what the qualifying looks like and therefore what the grid will look like for tomorrow. We need all of the cars to take the checkered flag to do that. Which I think they've done now, so let's just have a quick look. It's Octane Junkies that will start from pole position tomorrow. IP Racing will line up alongside them. And row two of the grid will be turn seven and Napa Racing UK. The third row of the grid is the first of the Fergan Motorsport cars alongside Axiometrics, with the second of the IP Racing cars lining up in the number 63 car. Seventh on the grid alongside the first of the Autotech Motorsport cars, the number 46 car. It's another Autotech Motorsport car, but the 64 that's there in ninth with GM Performance last year's winner completing the top 10. Just outside of the top 10 in 11th place, it's the first of the Misty Racing cars, the number 72 car. Then it's KM Racing with the Wolf Motorsport car, number 5, alongside the second of the two Ferguson Motorsport cars on row number 7. Row 8, Shine Automotive and KPR with row 9 being Purple Sector Racing and Wingap Racing. And the first of the Powerbell Racing Motorsport cars lines up there in what is 19th on the grid alongside Mauricio Motorsport. When we head outside of the top 20 onto row 11, it's LDR Performance Tuning and their number 49 car that lines up alongside the second of the Misty Racing cars. Sukaru were 23rd ahead of Semprini Juniors, who were 24th. Row Rage Racing were 25th with Grave Motorsport, Burton Power, the number 26 Wolf Racing car lining up 28th, and the final two cars inside the top 30, Race Logic and KNF Racing. 
Then as we move on to 31st position, touring car uh, line up <laughs> in 31st ahead of VPAX Motorsport with the DKMS and LDL Performance tuning in 33rd. Chameleon with 34th ahead of TTL and the number 19 LDR Motorsport car, one of four that LDR have in the field for this weekend. 37th was Castrol Racing ahead of M&D. Hard and enthusiastic and completing the top 40 were Carlamity. And the final six cars that we'll have on the grid will be three Amogos, three Amigos, MSVT Racing, Semprini Racing, a little bit out of position, I would have said for them for sure, ahead of AFK Racing, Covershaw and Carmel, which was the only car that had an off into the gravel trap in what was a, a very, very busy but thoroughly enjoyable session. And Chris, and that brings our commentary in the stream to a close for the day. It does, and what a fantastic day it's been and what a great way to round it up by just whetting our appetite for this big endurance race tomorrow. These cars are going to be incredible and, of course, this will come to a close in the conditions that we're in now. It's going to be this dark for the last couple of hours, which just feels special, doesn't it? It's going to be a great day tomorrow. Yeah, remember, we go racing at five past ten in the morning. The stream will start at ten o'clock on the build-up to what will be the fourth ever running of the IndyCar 500 here at Brands Hatch. If you've been joining us at the circuit today, thanks for coming along Safe Journey Home. If you've been watching the stream, make sure you're with us tomorrow. We've got a great day ahead. From Chris Dawes, myself, and the whole team here from Alpha Live, goodbye.